Good evening, friends of the creaking door. This is your host to welcome you into the inner sanctum. Come in. Come on in. Well, let me tell you about the uh, loot we picked up in our family. Mother got a new broom. Yeah, she needed it ever since she wrecked the old one in the forced landing on the roof last month. <laughs> Uncle William got a fur-lined straitjacket. And dear, darling little Aunt Matilda got a new hat pin. Yes, her last one got stuck in the skull of her fourth husband. <laughs> All right. Turn your lights slow and your radio up. And remember that all the actors getting killed on this program are being well paid for it. The winter winds moaned around the gabled house like a wandering band of wailing women. As Caroline Giles, puzzled and frightened by something she's seen in the gathering dusk, makes her way into the living room. This is young Mrs. Giles' first night at the family mansion built by her husband's grandfather. Only this morning, the attractive bride arrived after a honeymoon trip in Europe. When she enters the huge, shadow-filled room, she notices the servant girl at the window. She's a young girl, the only other person in the house. And Caroline can see that she's scarcely able to control the terror she feels. Mary? Yes, ma'am. What's going on out there? Uh, Nothing. Uh, When will Mr. Giles be home? He should be here within an hour. Why are those cars stopping out there? Cars, Mrs. Giles? Really, Mary, you must see them as well as I do. Three of them stopped within a few minutes. Look, there's another one. Uh, Maybe that's Mr. Giles. No, the car isn't coming into the driveway. It's stopping outside. Who are these people, Mary? I I, I don't know. Why should they stop outside? What did they want? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, Mary, you don't know. You don't know. There's no reason to become hysterical. Mrs. Giles, come away from the window. But why? You don't know them, but... Oh, please come away from the window. Mary, why? Now, oh, I've warned you. They're throwing rocks through the window. Get down, Mrs. Giles. Get down on the floor. You'll be hurt. But Mary... Oh, please. Mrs. Giles, just pray that they don't come in here. Just pray that they don't. Wait a minute, Mary. I hear sirens. It's the police. Oh, the police. Oh, oh thank heaven. They'll make them go away. Mrs. Giles, I'm Richard Croyton, the mayor of this town. I'm sorry we had to come here under these circumstances. How do you do? Uh, This is John Dent, our local chief of police. Mrs. Giles, I am very sorry about what happened tonight. The crowd is gone now. I'll do my best to see that it never happens again. I've also come to offer what apologies I can. Must have been a frightful experience for you on your first day here. Our people may appear civilized enough, but in many ways we're a very primitive community. I uh, suppose your husband told you that. No, he didn't. But David told me about you, Mr. Croydon. He said you were the oldest friend he had. I believe you lived down the road? Yes, yes, that's right. That's how I happened to see those cars coming, and I phoned Chief Dent. But why did those cars come, Mr. Croydon? Why? Well, yes. Why should those people who hardly know me do a thing like this? Well, didn't David tell you? Tell me what? Uh, Where is David now? He went to town. I expect him any minute. Well, uh, perhaps he'll tell you what you want to know when he returns. Why can't you tell me? I'm not sure that I care to. Mr. Dent, perhaps you'll be kind enough to explain this. Uh, Well, them people weren't after you, ma'am. They were after the man you married. Dent? What? Dent, uh, if if Mr. Giles hasn't told her, I I don't think it's your place to do so. Well, the woman has a right to know. The reason them folks are trying to kill Mr. Giles is because they think he's a a murderer. Some call him even worse than that. What do you mean? Mrs. Giles, uh, two years ago, a series of killings began in this here county. Girls, young girls... Four of them were found on lonely roads, stabbed to death. Homicidal maniac, or that's what the state police officer said. And my husband... Well, your husband was arrested for them crimes. He was tried right here, but they let him go. We didn't have enough evidence. David, can't believe it. Why should they suspect him? Well, he knew one of them girls, and, uh... Well, he had been sent away, ma'am. Sent away? 
What are you talking about? Well, everyone knows there was something wrong with him. He had to go to an asylum for a while. Yeah, that's quite enough, Dan. Uh, Mrs. Giles, I must tell you this. David was discharged from the rest home, completely cured. It, it was nothing more than a nervous breakdown. Uh, Dan, you have no right to frighten her like this. I'm not frightened. And I'm very grateful to Mr. Dent for telling me what he did. I just want to know one thing. My husband was acquitted. Why should they still believe he's guilty? Because since he left town six months ago, there ain't been none of these murders. Not a single one. Now that he's back, they'll start again. That's what you believe, Mr. Dent? Oh, no, ma'am, but that's what the folks are saying. Thank you. And now, if you don't mind, I'd like to be alone. Uh, Mrs. Giles, if there's anything I can no, do... I... No, thank you. There's, there's nothing. Good night, Mr. Corden. Good night, sir. Come along, then. Good night, ma'am. Good night. Hello? Operator? Will you give me the number of the railroad station, please? I... No. Never mind, operator. Don't bother. Are you going to leave, Carolyn? David. You heard? Yes. And I heard everything else my very old friend, Mr. Dent, told you. I was behind the other door. Then why didn't you come in? Why ruin their fun? Besides, I was curious to see just what your reaction would be. David, why did they have to tell me? Why couldn't you? You think this was an easy thing to tell to a newly married bride? I would have found out sooner or later. I did plan to tell you, Carolyn, in due time. That's why I ordered Mary not to say anything. Darling, it isn't true. This is all an insane dream, a nightmare. No, Carolyn, it's not a dream, but in many ways it is a nightmare. Were you going to run away from me, Carolyn? Is that why you phoned the station? Yes. Carolyn, if you want to leave me, I can't blame you. I realize it may be asking a little too much of any woman to be my wife and to live here. Why did you come back here, Dave? Because I want to prove to them that I'm not what they think I am. And I was hoping you'd help me. I thought maybe you loved me enough for that. Carolyn, I'm terribly sorry it must end this way. I'm not going to leave, David. Carolyn, I hope you understand what you're saying. You may be risking your life by remaining here. I love you, David. I'll risk it. I want you to be certain. Because in the end, I may fail and be put to death. To death? Yes, there are going to be other murders. Other murders? Don't ask me how I know this, but I'm almost positive that sometime tonight, a girl uh, in or near this community will be killed. Brutally stabbed to death. I'll have to go out tonight and see if I can prevent it. Do you still want to remain? Why are you telling me this? Because I want to know if you really love me or if you said what you did to placate a madman. To quiet a homicidal maniac who may still murder you. Are you going to stay, Carolyn? Yes. I'm going to stay, David. Mrs. Giles! Mrs. Giles, are you coming here? Coming, Mary. Mrs. Giles. There, there, Mary. Now, just try to calm down. I saw them. I saw them. Mary, there. try to pull yourself together. Tell me what you saw. There was a man out there. A man moving around. Are you sure of it, Mary? I don't see anyone. Well, maybe you can't see him from here, but I saw him from the window of my room. All right. Let's look out the window of your room. I, I don't want you to think I, I'm seeing things. I, I'm not the kind of girl who sees things. I didn't say you were, Mary, but I... Well, I don't notice anything unusual from your window either. You... You don't see anything? Just the lawn, the tree. Mary, I know we've all been under a strain today. I... I guess we're a little jumpy, aren't we? I... I guess so. But I wish Mr. Giles were here. I... I don't like us two being alone. I, I know, Mary. But it can't be helped. Now, come, dear. I think you'd better go back to bed. But I'm afraid to be alone in here. They can get in through the window. Then we'll close the shutters. Help me, Mary. Uh, all right, ma'am. There we are. The outside doors are all closed. Yes, I, I locked them myself, but... Well, still, this is a very old house. They can get in. Well, there's a lock on your door that works quite well. You can lock the door from the inside, and then you'll be as safe as you can possibly be. All right, I... 
I'll do that when you go. Very well, Mary. I'll go back to my room. I'm, I'm sure you'll sleep now. Good night. I... I hope so. Good night, Mrs. Giles. Did you lock the door, Mary? Yes, I, I just did. I'm turning out the light now. I'm sorry I troubled you, Mrs. Giles. Good night. Good night. Oh, she's right. I... Oh, I must be hearing things. Mrs. <gasps> Giles! There's someone in here. Who am I? I... Oh, oh you my hand. Mrs. Giles. He was locked in here with me. Help me, Mrs. Giles. Again. You ready to go on with our story of married bliss? I mean, bliss. You know, if Caroline had only listened to this program, she'd have realized that it's always a mistake to marry a man who has a weakness for murdering the domestic help. It uh, not only makes house cleaning difficult, but creates a terrible servant problem. <laughs> That there is one compensation in marrying a homicidal maniac. When you'd call your mate crazy, you'd be so right. <laughs> well, let's get on with our story. As you remember, Caroline couldn't break into Mary's room. And now she rushes to the telephone and dials the operator. Hello? Get me the police. Hurry, please. Hello? This is Mrs. Carolyn Giles. Would you please send someone right away? I think there's been a murder. Hang up, Carolyn. <laughs> Hang up that phone. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Why didn't you do as I told you? I don't want the police to know about this until we're ready. That, that room. You just came out of Mary's room. Yes, I saw her. Saw her? You were in there all the time. You were locked in the room with a killed her. Carolyn. You murdered her. They're right about her. You murdered her. Carolyn, you're oh, no, 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 no. Stop it now. Stop it. Sorry, I had to do that. Now, you must get a grip on yourself. Yes, David, I'll, I'll be all right. I'm all right now. How did you get into her room? I heard screams when I parked the car. The window to her room was open and I climbed through. I saw her on the bed and then I unlocked the door and came in here. You found the window open? Mm. But I locked it myself. I bolted the shutters. Well, it's open now. When did you bolt the window? A little while ago. The murderer must have been in the room hiding, but she locked herself in. I guess he escaped through the window. Yes. Perhaps that's what happened. You still think I killed her? I don't know what to think anymore. The way you came from her room. I explained that. Yes, I suppose you did. Carolyn, now listen to me. If I killed her, do you think I'd be talking to you now? Here, look. Son. Hmm. If I'd murdered Mary, the next step would be to kill you. And you see how easy it is for me to do it. Now, Carolyn, you believed in me before. I'm asking you to believe in me again. I don't want the police to know I left this house tonight. Dan's like the rest of them. He hates me. He'd be glad to accuse me of this crime. Now, Carolyn, I want you to say I was home all night with you. And if I don't? I've got this gun, Carolyn. If you let me down, nothing much will matter then. <laughs> Now, that might be the police, Carolyn. I'm going to open the door. Um, good evening, Mr. Giles. Good evening, Dent. You got here quickly. Maybe that's because I was kind of expecting to come. Oh, have you been watching my house? I ain't saying. When I got that radio call, I didn't lose any time. Oh, Mrs. Giles, you phoned in something about a murder? Yes, uh, our girl, Mary. She's in there. Oh. Mr. Giles, are you accusing me of this too, Dent? Well, it's mighty funny, right here in your own home. This time, I can easily prove that I had nothing to do with it. My wife and I were together all night. Is, uh, is this right, Mrs. Giles? That, that's right, Mr. Dent. Hello, David. <laughs> 
Okay. Come in. Uh, I understand that Dent questioned you again this morning. Yes, but he didn't get anywhere. I think even he's beginning to get the idea that I'm not a murderer. I see. Oh, Carolyn, dear. Oh, hello there. David, why didn't you warn me your friend was coming tonight? Well, I phoned Richard only a few minutes ago. You see, Carolyn, I have to go out. Go out? Yeah. I didn't want to leave you alone after everything that's happened. I, I know, but... Well, couldn't we come with you, David? No, I'm afraid not. Why not? Well, it might be dangerous. David, where are you going? I'm sorry, dear, but I can't tell you. It won't be a long trip. It's only about 20 miles or so. That's all the information I can give you. Ha has this something to do with these murders? Perhaps. Now, David, I wouldn't advise you to take matters into your own hands. I'm afraid I have to, Richard. You see, the police haven't gotten very far, and my life is at stake. Your life? Isn't it obvious? The people are stirred up about these crimes. Who can tell when one of them may take it into his head to murder me? It's becoming a matter of the killer's life or my own. Furthermore, there's another reason why I must solve this. A reason I can't divulge right now. Why not? Darling, please don't ask me. I think that after tonight, all this will be over. Bye, Richard. Goodbye, Carolyn. Bye. Richard? Yes? What did he mean by another reason? Well, Carolyn, if he's right about the murderer, then the next logical victim will be a girl, an attractive girl who's very close to him. So that people will suspect him even more. And the most likely person is yourself. <laughs> Ten o'clock. Did he tell you how long we'd stay away, Richard? Uh, no, no, he didn't. Uh, shall I deal another round? Oh, that must be David. Hello? David? Are you all right, darling? Well, when will you be home? All right, I'll, I'll tell Richard. Goodbye. David's on his way home. He'll be here in an hour. Where did he call from? A town called Waverley. He says he knows who the killer is. That's impossible. How do you know? Because if he knew, he'd never have made that call. I don't understand. It was a perfect signal to the murderer. Murderer? It told him that he was safe. That he had all the time he needs. A full hour. Richard. You... Please. I must warn you not to do anything foolish. It will only make matters worse for yourself. What do you have in your hand? A knife. You see, I simply press this button and it snaps open. <laughs> try to control yourself, Carolyn. Don't try to fight the inevitable. Take my advice and submit to what will come. It will be less painful. Let go of me. You see how futile it is to struggle. I have the knife at your throat now. I have only to move my arm. And it's all over. Why don't you? Why are you waiting? There's no rush. For once, I have a little time. Time? Time seems to extend the experience. I must warn you not to scream. The moment you do it will all come to an end, suddenly, violently. Screams are dangerous. One can never tell who hears them. Take the knife away. No. Please. Fear seems to do something to your features, Carolyn. You look extraordinarily beautiful. And I must compliment you on your self-control. You still haven't even raised your voice. You, you, you can't get away with this, Richard. David will come home to find you. That's not quite how it will happen. David will come home and find you. I shall have the rare pleasure of seeing his reaction. And then it will be his turn. You're going to kill him? Yes, it will be a new experience. I've never murdered a man before. <laughs> it can't possibly work. You'll be caught. I plan to be. But I shall plead self-defense. Everyone will believe me because I'll tell them he murdered you. 
It's very difficult not to scream, isn't it, Carolyn? They, they won't believe you. They'll never believe you. Oh, yes, they will. My police commissioner hates David because he was freed after Dent arrested him. And his position also depends upon me. Oh, I admire you, Carolyn. None of the others held out this long. And you must almost be insane with fear and terror, aren't you? And yet... I won't scream, Richard. I won't. In the end, you will. I won't. You must. I won't. You really are extraordinary, Carolyn. I won't. <laughs> Carolyn. I don't understand. You were here. Almost all evening. I phoned from a neighbor's house to make him force his hand. I got back just in time. Oh. Still alive. Yes. Richard. David. Did you know? You, you couldn't have been that clever. I suspected you, Richard, but I wasn't certain until tonight. It, it, it was a trap. And Carolyn the bait. All a trick. I'm afraid that's what it was, Richard. Why did you make them think it was me? Why? Because you were a Giles. Always a little too clever. Never quite one of us. But you'll die for this, David. You'll be blamed for this and the other murders. I've left letters accusing you of the crimes. And Dent will believe them. Even over your wife's testimony. You, you'll die for this. They'll kill, kill you. Dead. David, is it true what he said about the letter? Probably. Dent will never believe me. Good evening, Mr. Giles. Dent. Yeah. Been out there all night. When I heard the shots, I came running in. So you killed him? Yes, but I had to, Dent. He was going to murder my wife. That's true. He's the homicidal maniac you've been looking for. You've got to believe that, Mr. Dent. Of course I believe it, ma'am been suspecting him for a long time. Ever since he spread them stories to folks about Mr. Giles. And I heard what he said before he died. You've got nothing to fear now, Mrs. Giles. You and your husband can live here and we'll be proud to have you. And some folks will be mighty ashamed about what they've been saying and doing. Um, I reckon I'd better call in. Get them to take this... this man away. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you thought David was crazy when he fooled you, didn't he? As the squirrel said to the walnut tree, you're still not as nutty as people. <laughs> and that brings us to the moral of this story, which is taken from a retired witch who once said, Why slice your husband's head off? But it's so easy to nag him to death. <laughs> oh, here's a, a little thought to take to bed. Never murder your enemies, because then you'll have no one to hate but yourself. <laughs> Inner Sanctum has been brought to you through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Sometimes the radio playwright wanted to have a bit of fun. So long before the Japanese movies had a giant cockroach come out of the sea to eat up Kyoto, or was it South Chicago, I wrote two plays that theoretically destroyed everything. One was a story about a growing chicken heart that covered the world, and the other was the one you're about to hear. Lights out. Everybody. It is later.
better than you think. This is Art Jobler. Someone has said that the two main springs which drive the world are hunger and the will to power. I think we'll all agree about the hunger, but as to the will to power, well, sometimes I think it's not quite as strenuous as that. There are some people in this world who don't want to run anything. They just want to be liked. And that's the main spring of our story tonight, oxychloride eggs. So uh, I says to him, I says, well, sir, I'd like to be obliging, but I really haven't got the time. And he says to me, he says, well, Mr. Jackson, after all, we're making this proposition only to a few outstanding student representatives on the campus. And uh, we do feel that you should be interested in our proposition. Well, so, what did you say? Well, I said, mister, I can't be bothered. Just can't be bothered. And I gets in my car and off I go. But, Bob, free clothes just for wearing them around the campus. Listen, Stan, my boy, why I want to be a clothes horse for any old haberdashery? My old pappy's got more money than he knows what to do with. Now, what for, I ask? Well, I guess you've got something there. Hmm. Say, uh, who are you going to take to the dance Saturday night? Hmm, oh, haven't made up my mind. How about that new number over at the Roto House? Uh, no, thank you, brother. What's the matter? Well, did you ever take a look at her feet? <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> Never got below her chin. <laughs> Yeah? A race do it to see you, Stan. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, send him on up. Ray Stewart, who's he? Well, we're still short one pledge, aren't we? Oh, yeah, I know, but Ray Stewart, who is he? Oh, I met him over in chemistry. Got a mind like a textbook. Oh, but who is he? We can't pledge a man just because he's a grind. Well, we could use a few grinds around here. Exams come around, there's nothing like a few of those brainy boys pull it through. But who is he? Where is he from? Who's his family? Who's his father? Oh, oh. Morning, Ray. Oh, thank you. Oh, it was good of you to bother to come over tonight. It was good of you to ask me. Oh, not at all. Ray, I want you to meet the president of our house, Bob Jackson. Mr. Jackson, Mr. Stewart. Uh, I'm certainly glad to make your acquaintance. I, I might as well admit this is the first time I've ever been in a fraternity house. Really? Uh, sit down, Ray. Makes up at home. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, tell me, Ray, uh, uh, do you ever go in for any sports back in your prep days? Oh, no. I never had much time for that sort of thing. No? No, I think that sports should be put into their proper place. After all, I'm sure you agree they aren't particularly important. No? Huh? And what might I ask is important in your estimation, Mr. Uh, uh, Stewart? Doing things. Being someone. What? Doing things man's never done before. Taking the elements and transmuting them into things which never existed until you thought of them. That, that's important. That's, that's being almost godlike, isn't it? Master, how you talk. Oh, sorry, I, I get sort of carried away. Yeah. Well, that's all right. Uh, Bob, uh, this boy sure knows his chemistry. Huh? Oh, I really don't know so much. Say, I ought to know better. You pulled me over some tough spots in this course. I, I'm very glad to help you whenever I can. If... If I lived here, I could help you all the time. I could help you too, Mr. Jackson. If I need help, I know where to get it. Oh, I, I didn't mean to it's, offend you. Uh, it's all right, Stuart. Uh, now, uh, tell me, you're uh, you're from around Chicago way, aren't you? Oh, no, Milwaukee. Lived there for years. Uh, don't tell me I'm one of those brewing families. <laughs> oh, no. We're not wealthy people at all. Uh, My father runs a small business. It, it isn't much, but we get along. Oh. I don't think money's important anyway if a person's ambitious. Do you, Mr. Jackson? Oh, no, no. <laughs> What's money? You fellas may think this funny, but... Well, I always thought it's more important what a fella does than what he has. I mean, well, I've always had the feeling that... Someday, somehow... I'm going to do something really important. Maybe even miraculous. Well, now, what do you expect to do? Discover the missing link? Uh, yes, Stuart. Uh, what is this miracle you expect to perform? Well, I... I don't know exactly... Ever since I've been just a kid, I, I've been interested in chemistry, and I, I've had a feeling that someday I'd, well, perform an experiment, mix certain chemicals together, and something would happen that never happened before. Now you hear that, Stan? A miracle man. Amazing, my dear Bob. Simply amazing. I know it sounds silly, but the things I dream about always seem to work out. Well, would you mind telling us the last miracle that worked out? Well, this. This? Well, what do you mean? Well, as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to belong to a fraternity, and 
Here I am. I mean, you invited me. Uh, just a minute there, fellow. Mr. Stewart, it's been awfully nice of you to come over and visit with us. And someday we'll have you back again. Uh, but now we've got some studying to do, so if you don't mind... Oh, no, no, not at all. It was nice of you to invite me over. Well, good night, fellas. Good night. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> all this girly crackpot. <laughs> yeah. Did you see the look in his eye when he was talking about miracles? Yeah. <laughs> well, it'll be a miracle if he ever gets back into this house again, I'll tell you that. <laughs> What in the world ever made you ask him over here? Well, I didn't know. How was I to know he's a crackpot? <laughs> Pledge him to our fraternity. <laughs> Pledge him to the, the booby hatch. Mr. Stewart, if you please. Mr. Stewart? Uh, yes, Professor? Mr. Stewart, might I ask if you're anxious to sever your relationship with this university? No, sir. Then might I ask why in creation you persist in ignoring my warnings? In this laboratory, you're to perform the experiments given you to perform. Understand? Given you to perform. Yes, sir. Then might I ask why you persist in your, shall I call it, original experiments? Perhaps it's your intention to blow up the university. Or just the laboratory. I'm sorry. You'll be more than sorry if I find you doing this sort of thing again. Now, take down this apparatus and continue with the work in your textbook. Yes, sir. This is my last warning, so bear it in mind. Oh, hello, Stuart. Uh, how about loan him your notebook for a few hours? Hmm? Uh, oh, hello, Jackson. You, uh, haven't been to lab much, have you? Oh, no, no, I haven't, but I can make it up. Well, uh, we've been pretty busy over the house. Initiations and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, Jackson. Yeah? You, uh, never invited me back. I... I thought maybe you forgot. Oh, well, you know how those things are. I... I wrote my mother that I was joining your fraternity... It, well, that was a sap thing to do. Was it? Well, we hadn't pledged you. Stan simply invited you over so I could talk to you. But you said you wanted me to come back. Oh, now, look here, fellow. Don't be stupid about this. We didn't pledge you, so that's that. And you're not going to pledge me? Certainly not. But why? I don't have to tell you why. But you've got to tell me. Oh, quit pawing me, will you? All right, you're asking for it, so here it is. We didn't pledge you because we think you're a crackpot. A what? A crackpot. You talk about miracles. You spend every minute of your time here in the lab monkeying around with things you don't know anything about. Getting yourself in all kinds of trouble. Yeah, and you look like a first-class screwball. But, but I'm just trying I to... I don't care whatever it is you're trying. It isn't normal. Oh, that you never had a glass of beer in your life. And if a girl ever looked at you, you'd fall over in a faint. Then you're not going to pledge me? You're not going no, to pledge No, we're not going to pledge you. So if your mom expects you to be in a fraternity, you better start cooking up one of those miracles, fella. A first-class miracle. Sleep. It's so late. Sleep. I've got to sleep. Not gonna pledge. That's what he said. Not gonna pledge me. Why do I keep thinking about it? If I could only sleep... Well, you think you're a crackpot. Oh, I gotta stop thinking about these things. It's not healthy to think what I'm thinking. Crackpot. Not gonna pledge. Crackpot. What's the matter not with my head? Crackpot. I've been talking in it crackpot. over and over and over crackpot. again. Crackpot. I'm not crazy. Crackpot. I'm not. Crackpot. I'm as good as you are. Crackpot. I'm as good as both of you put together. Crackpot. Stop crackpot. saying that. Stop crackpot. saying it. Crackpot. I'll show you. I'll show you both. Crackpot. I'm better than you are. I'm better than anybody. I'll show you. Oh, Julia, talk about miracles. I'll give you miracles. The lab. I've got to get into it. I'll give you miracles. It's dark in there. I've got to get in. Oh, blasted door. I've got to get in. Window. I'll show you. It's so dark in here. I've got to find a lab table. I've got to make a miracle. Who's there? Who's there, I say? Watchman. Come on now, who's there? Talk up. You don't have to get so excited. I, I'm a student. Student, eh? Let's have a look at you. That flashlight, you, you're blinding me. I've got to see who you are, don't I? Yeah, I know you. Seen you on the campus. I told you I'm a student. Well, that don't give you no right to be here after hours. How'd you get in here? Oh, broke a window now, did you? Huh? I didn't break the window. But I heard the glass. So did I, and I followed the man in here. Man, what are you talking about? Give me your flashlight and I'll show you. All right. Here. Now look behind you. Uh, no. no one will stop me. No one. Miracle. 
got to make one. Got to. Got to. Got to. Barium. 5 cc selenium oxychloride. Oh, good, good. You're working out just as I planned. Who's there? Who's that working there? Professor. Oh, oh, it's you, Stuart. And after all my warnings. You're just in time, Professor. Yes, just in time to have you thrown out of the university. What are you doing there? What is this mess of equipment? It's my miracle. Miracle? What are you talking about? My miracle. Are you insane? Take it apart, all of it, at once. Hmm. Listen to it bubbling. Beautiful sound, isn't it, Professor? Take it apart, I tell you. Empty out the retort. No. No, I've got to wait. Are you mad? Turn out the burners. No, all right, I'll turn them off for you. No, stay where you are. Stay where? Put down that acid. I'll smash the bottle on your head if you touch anything no. on the table. No, don't throw it. Put the bottle of acid down, Stuart. Please. My experiment. My miracle. Bubbling and boiling and stewing. It will work, Professor. It's got to work. But, but what is it? I told them I'd create something that no other man has. I told them. And I will, Professor. You hear me? I will. But, but what? A solvent. A solvent more powerful than anything the world has ever known. What do you mean? What are you talking about? Listen to it, Bubble. You said solvent. Explain yourself. Yes, solvent. Solvent that will dissolve steel like a hot flame. What do you say? You heard me say it. A solvent that will dissolve steel faster than a razor cutting through paper. Do you know what that means? Okay. Run a line of this liquid across a steel girder. The girder will crumple like a falling tree. Pour some of my solvent into a glass shell and bomb the cities. Tell you it'll make war too horrible for men to endure. Uh, uh, you, you crazy boy, you. You know what you're talking about? I'm talking about that. That liquid there. Listen to it. Listen to it sing. Why, no such solvent exists. Selenium oxychloride, perhaps, but to do the impossible things you talked about would require a quantity so... Oh, the beaker. It cracked. No, do something. That liquid's flying all over my bench. My laboratory. The stone of the bench. It's eating through the stone. Well, stop it. The liquid. It's eating through the stone bench. No. No, it can't be. It's eating through the slate of the floor. The hole's getting bigger and bigger. Run. Run. Oh, I've done it. I've created something no other man has done. A solvent that dissolves anything. 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 Something's going wrong in the lab. The fireman won't let us in. Something burning? I don't know. Can't get near enough to find out. I can't see any fire. There's plenty of smoke going. Plenty of excitement. Read about it tomorrow's paper, I'll bet you. Hey, what's in that sound? Yeah, it sounds like water. Gosh, what is it? Hey, everybody back! Hey. The building! It's going to crash! Run! Hey, run! I did it. I did it. A solvent that dissolves anything. Anything. Hey, Chief, Chief, look at this. Hmm? What's the matter, Murph? Somebody have sex doublers? Get a load of this, Chief. Came in over the news wires. Read it. Yeah. Additional on Whitmore University. Mysterious cavity on campus growing larger hourly. More followers. Huh. Mysterious cavity. Hey, what is this, a dentist's advertisement? Oh, don't you remember, Chief? A couple hours ago, that flash about something eating a hole so big, a building fell in it. This is the follow-up. The thing's getting bigger. What do you want to do about it? Forget it. What? Don't you see through a gag when it hits you in the face? Somebody's just having fun on the wires. Ha! Mysterious cavity growing bigger. Well, when it's as big as a hole in your head, that'll be news, Murph. That'll be news. Anything. It dissolves anything. And I did it. I discovered it. I discovered Yes, 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 yes. Hello. What is it? Yes, yes, this is Dr. Whitmore. Who is this? Who? National News Service. Now, look here, my good man. It's four o'clock in the morning, and I'm supposed to be resting. My vacation, you know. What? My university. Building collapsed. But, but are you sure? Yes, yes, I'll call them long distance at once. No, no, I can't give you any sort of statement. Now, hang up, man. I've got to get the operator. 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 Give me long distance. Give me... What? Long distance is calling? Well, put them on. Put them on. Hello. 
Hello. Yes, this is he. Rogers? Yes, Rogers. What? Did? That's impossible. Larger? But how could it grow larger? Chemicals? Are you drunk men? Insane? It's impossible. Impossible. But you must do something, something. Listen, mister, I'm a fireman, not a magician. But that pole, it's 20 feet wider than it was 10 minutes ago. Mister, I don't know what it's all about. No fire and the ground's burning right away. We have $5 million worth of property on this ground. If that won't spend... For Pete's sake, leave me alone, will you? We've been throwing water on the edges of the thing ever since the building fell in, but it don't do no good. It don't do no good. This is a nice paper. The latest news on the Whitmore University mystery. What at first was treated lightly by all newspapers as either a hoax or a shifting of earth stratum has now developed into an authentic yet unbelievable situation. The hole which began at the side of the chemical laboratory building is now 300 feet in diameter and spreading with unbelievable rapidity. Fire departments and fire experts from all neighboring communities within a radius of 100 miles have been called in, but have been helpless to combat the rapidly spreading pit. Many conflicting theories have been propounded as to the cause of the cave-in, but at last reports, nothing definite had been determined. That's the, enough, the... Professor Parker. What about the salt? Yes. Yes. About... Unbelievable, unexplainable as it is. It is apparently self-regenerating and oxidizing anything it comes in contact with so quickly that we see no fire but only the rapidly growing cavity where the earth is being consumed. But, but Professor Parker, what is this solvent? Surely you don't expect us to believe that this student you were telling us about... I mean cost... exactly that. All preposterous. It's a fault in the structure of the earth. There is no such thing as a self-regenerating solvent. Simple cave-in, that's all it is. Yes, all this time. Gentlemen, gentlemen, if you please, what I know, I know. Oh, it's preposterous. Gentlemen, if you please... If my professional reputation is not enough to substantiate what I've said, then at least you'll listen to the boy himself. He's here. Listen to him. Well, why should we? Yes, gentlemen, if you'll listen, I'll tell you. You'd better listen to me. Gentlemen, please. What Professor Parker said is true. It is a solvent. It dissolves anything it touches quickly, furiously. And the byproduct of that dissolution give it new strength and movement. And I discovered it, gentlemen. I, I, I know, but what will happen? What can we do? We can wait. Wait? Wait? How can we wait? Look out there. The hole's within two feet of another building already. We've got to stop it. At once. If you don't... The building. The foundations are the mine. Crashing. Mother in heaven. Harris Hall. Cave right in the hole. Professor Parker. You boy, Listen. Which chemicals did you use? We've got to fight it with chemicals. Spread them around the edge. Neutralize the salt. Yes, yes, that's it. Chemicals will neutralize the reaction. No, gentlemen. Listen. Listen. You may neutralize the reaction at the edges of the hole. But you forget one thing. What? What are you talking about? The solvent is eating downward at many times the rate it's eating outward. You may neutralize the reaction at the edges of the hole. But have you forgotten? It's eaten the hole a quarter of a mile deep already. And it's eating into the earth faster and faster. <laughs> How are you going to stop that? How are you going to stop that? Faster, faster and faster at an ever-increasing rate, this strange cancer on the surface is eating away. It is now approximately 14 hours since the phenomenon began, and already it has eaten outward a distance approximately one mile in diameter, with a resulting damage of over a million and a half in property. Truly, the most astounding factor in this catastrophe is the fact that the hole is increasing in depth at an unbelievable rate. At our last reports, approximately ten minutes ago, the pit had reached a depth of approximately three miles, and experts apparently refuse to predict how much further this earth cancer will go. What only a handful of hours ago was a quiet section of the country in which stood the Whitmore University is now a great gaping pit in the surface of the earth out of which rise strange noxious gases as that burning something eats deeper and deeper and deeper into the bowels of the earth. The latest sonic recordings indicate that the shaft has now reached a depth of 11 miles, 2,342 feet. I'm right on the scene and will continue to send reports as quickly as I get. 
sure is a crowd here. Yeah, half million, they say. Yeah, watching it and waiting. And for what? Ain't it ever going to stop, Stan? Don't ask me. I don't know. It's going deeper and deeper every minute. There ain't no stopping it. Listen to it. Scared, ain't they? Every one of them. Well, aren't you? Yeah, sure. That hole going deeper and deeper into the ground and nobody can stop it. And what happens when it gets all the way through, nobody knows. Sure, I'm scared. Scared plenty. Siberia to Cape Town to San Francisco and around the world again. I tell you, the earth's ripping apart. And I tell you, it's that hole in the ground that's done it. It's affected the rotation of the earth. Unbalanced things. Yes, and it's biting deeper every minute. What'll happen when it eats through to the other side? The ocean pouring through. We'll die. We'll all die. Who's the blame? Who's the blame? Who's the blame? It's that kid who's the blame. Yeah, we read it in the papers. A crazy yeah. college kid. There, there he is. Yeah. That's him. That's him. Yeah, that's him. Yeah, that's him. No, no, let me go. You fools, you. I've done a great thing, a wonderful thing. Created something no one ever thought of. No, let me down. Let me down. Let me down, you fools. I started the song, but I didn't know this would happen. You can't blame me for a miracle. in the hole. No. Yes, no. in the hole. He made it. No, don't throw me down in there. There's no bottom to it. No, no. Here. They put him down here on the grass. Dan? Yes. Boy, oh boy, will this be a sensation on the campus. But, Watchman, how did it happen? Well, me, I'm making my rounds of the grounds as usual, and all at once in the moonlight I see this fellow walking across the grass. So I go up to him and I see the fellow's walking in his sleep. In his sleep, sleep yeah. yeah. Just when I start to grab him easy-like... He pulls loose, yells something about, don't throw me in, don't throw me in. And then he runs across the campus and dives head first down into the swimming pool. And it's empty. When I pull him out, he's, he's like he is now. Busted neck. Well, oh, is, but who is he? Anyone recognize him? Yeah. Yeah, I know him. Stewart's his name. Ray Stewart. Kind of a screwy little crackpot. Always talking about creating miracles with chemicals. I wonder what he thought was happening to him diving down that hole. Quiet, please. Features Ernest Chappell. Quiet Please for tonight is called Clarissa. No. He was dead before the fire started. I've told you that a dozen times. No, I can't prove it, of course not. You'll just have to believe me. Take my word for it. I can't prove he was dead. You can't prove he wasn't. And... Anyway, what difference does it make now? I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you very well. Yes. Well, all right. It was an old black shell of a house. A house that has lived too long. A house where the floors groaned in pain at night, where the windows shuddered at the gentlest touch of the wind. Where door latches suddenly gave up their grip and let the night come snipping into the house to paw at your eyes and wake you to the other silences that lay around you. It was never warm there. In the winter, old Heinz kept a fire going in the fireplace in the old sitting room, but the, the logs were scrawny 
and the draft was bad, and uh, the flames seemed to grudge us their warmth so that we shivered all through the day. We're glad when night came and we could escape to the meager comfort of the drafty bedrooms. And in the summer, there was a dampness about the place, an unhealthy clamminess drifted from the walls and stirred uneasily among the ancient smells of decay that clung to the place. Well, I suppose you could call old Heinz a, a character. You said you didn't know him? An immigrant from the Rhineland sometime in the early 70s. Uh, that would make him, uh, let me see, how old? Ich war im Rheinland geboren. In der Jahrzeit 1862. That's right, uh, 1862. He was an old man, but he never appeared old. You might have taken him for a vigorous man of 60. His hair and his scraggly mustache were jet black. I suspect he dyed them regularly. And his blue eyes seemed as keen as those of a boy of 18. And he'd never been away from the house for a single night, he used to say, from the day he bought it and moved into it in 1888. And it was an old house then. Yes, I spent some very dreary days and nights in that house. Huh? I couldn't afford a better place to live. Oh, no, people don't go to live in a haunted house if they can find another place, you know. Fabulous. 
those shadows on the peeling wallpaper. Seeing the ancient plush-covered rocking chair nodding away at me as I entered the room, as if a startled occupant had suddenly deserted it at the sound of my footsteps on the stairs. And the cold spring rain drenching the window panes. And the murmured complaints of the beams and rafters of the old house. The pleasant, musty fumes of the wine I had drunk kept sleep away for a while when I'd blown out the lamp. The melody of that children's song flowed again across my mind as I lay there. My thoughts wandered to the lonely child that dwelt in the haunted house with the old man and the newcomb student. I smiled to myself as I thought. <laughs> now that settles the question of the house being haunted, doesn't it? People have heard the little girl singing to herself in the night. They've not known that a little girl lived here too. And, yeah, that's the ghost. And I smiled again at superstitions. And another idle thought struck me. I wondered at the child's age. Ten or twelve years old by the sound of her voice. And somewhere in the back of my drowsy mind, I seem to remember that Heinz had told me that Lena, his wife, had died. Well, was it the year of the San Francisco earthquake? Well, that would be 1906. That would be 42 years ago. And this was a child of 10 or 12. I must have been mistaken. I was getting sleepy. The wine, the rain. The dark. such apparent erudition, I must not be disturbed. 
I might stay in my room day and night with my slide rules and my profile paper and my broken flower pot full of sharpened pencils. I was not to be disturbed. But how many times I wished for the happy sound of my little sister Miriam's gay laughter. I found myself listening for the lilt of the little girl song that she used to sing. And that Clarissa knew, too. Heinz mentioned Clarissa occasionally. I sometimes wish that I could have sent Clarissa to school, Jesse. Well, it's too bad you didn't. Mm, always there was never enough money. Why, oh, there are schools. Public schools, Heinz. No, not for Clarissa's free schools. You know, I wonder... Wanda? Well, you know... Uh, Children are supposed to go to school. I'm surprised that the school authorities haven't been to see you about sending her. The police? Oh, no, not the police. But there are laws about schools. I mean, you might find yourself in trouble if they discover you have a daughter of school age. They will come here. Well, if they find out. Jesse, you will not tell. Well, now, look here, Heinz. Uh, you're not being fair to the child. But yes, yes. No, I... really, I mean it. Uh, hasn't she ever been to school? Well, I... I teach her a little... Well, I, uh, it's none of my business, but you're doing her a very serious harm. No, no, listen, Jesse. You don't tell anybody about her. Well, I don't know, Heinz. If they come and ask me... Jesse, listen. I tell you something. Well? Clarissa can't go to school. Well, why not? I, I told you it doesn't cost anything. It is not that. Well, then, she's... She's not there. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, Heinz. Uh, look, uh, would you like it if I gave her a little of my time and, and taught her some of the elementary... No, no, please, don't. Well, I'd be glad to. No. Well, have it your way, Heinz. I don't mean to run too on your affairs, but after all, a, a child... I'm sorry, Jesse. I thank you, but... No. All right. Forget it. But I couldn't forget it. A kindly old man. Yes, he was kindly. And a sick child who had never seen the inside of a schoolroom who was growing up to become... Well, what? In an ancient, moldering house. A house that had lived too long. Alone with a father born... Six years ago. I lay at night in the darkness with the house, grumbling and complaining around me. I thought about the plight of the child. Sometimes I could hear her song far away somewhere in the dank recesses of that crumbling house. And my thoughts revolved again about this mystery. Heinz said she was not well. Heinz would not allow her to appear. Was Clarissa some misshapen monster child that she must be pent up and never see the sun? Was she... I detest mysteries of that kind. I love the good, clean mysteries of abscissa and ordinate, the logarithm and anti-logarithm of the calculus and the grand old theorems devised by the ancients. But the fascinating mysteries of the human mind and of human behavior are alien to me, in my hate. And my thoughts crept further and further away from the ten numbers as doubt and speculation about the child laid hold of my mind. <laughs> Every night, how often I heard her sobs, I thought, sometimes close outside my door. And yet when I opened the door, there was nothing. And old Heinz grew more and more taciturn. He never spoke of his daughter. He seemed to avoid me by day and to disappear by night. But the summer came then, and the fall, and winter. My book was going badly. And my thoughts wandered. I must leave this place, I thought, or find out this mystery. And again I asked the old man if there was not something I might do for this pathetic child, this invisible, haunting voice. No, Jesse. There is nothing you could do. But Christmas is coming, Heinz. Uh, what can I get her for Christmas? No, why not, Jesse? What? 
My Helene. She died on the eve of Christmas. Well, uh, but I... Throw it to the child. No. Let, let us not speak of it again. But to me, the thought of Christmas passing by this child was unspeakable. I determined that if the old man would do nothing about it, I would. You know, I had little money. And there was so little I could do. But I did come into the town here, and I found a toy for her. I, I found one I could afford. A little woolly lamb. A little woolly white lamb with black buttons for eyes and a, a blue silk ribbon about its neck and a gay little blue flower in its mouth. Well, I hung a little card about its neck that said, Merry Christmas to Clarissa. And on Christmas Eve, Hanks and I shared the last bottle of Ben Costa Doctor before the miserly little fire. And I gave him one of the handkerchiefs my little sister Miriam had sent me, and he gave me an old stone Krug with a heavy pewter top that he said came from Heidelberg. And we regretted that there was no creamy Pilsner Urquell to drink from it. Wished each other a happy Christmas. And then, in the night, I was awakened by a tiny sound. And I lay awake silently for a moment. And there was another sound. A hesitant little footstep. And a rustling at the dresser across the room from me. And I lay quietly and listened. <laughs> Is that you, Clarissa? Is that you, Clarissa? Do you like it? Good. Happy Christmas. I'm I'm sorry, that's all I could get you. But I hope you like it. And I felt the touch of a tiny hand on my shoulder. And lips brushed my cheek. And the door closed. And the sound of her voice in the little song was happier now than I'd ever heard it. Stepped out again toward the hallway. 
Holmes confronted me. What's my hand say, Jesse? Why can't you hear her, Holmes? Something's wrong, she said. No, go back by your room, Jesse. Oh, but hi, don't beat there, Jesse. Go back. Now, Heinz, listen to me. Something's awfully wrong with that child, and I will take care of her, Jesse. Please, Mark. In your room. Now, see here. I, I take care of my own man, huh? Heinz. before he died. He died there in my room, yes. What? Oh, yes. In the little half-light, I found the kerosene lamp and I lit it. I took the key from the floor where he dropped it. No. I found the room very easily. It was at the far end of the hall. I called... Dry as 
dust draperies and the fragile old oaken boards on the floor. I turned and went out of the house. Well, what else was there to do? The house had lived too long. And so had the father and daughter who dwelt there. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre, presented by Camel Cigarettes. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two kinds of stories. Those you can take to bed with you and they relax you and put your mind at ease. And then... Then there's the other kind. And our story tonight is the other kind. I still do not know whether it was the shadow of the madness to which the author himself so tragically succumbed, or whether there really was a, an evil something that could not be seen or described, or why don't you decide for yourself? Uh, I'm simply going to tell you the facts in a case as set forth by Guy de Maupassant in his immortal story, The Horror. Each week at this hour, Peter Lorre brings us the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual, of dark and compelling masterpieces culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, The Horla by de Maupassant. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre, brought to you by Camel Cigarette. in front of my house, the house in which I was born and grew up. Oh, it's a wonderful house, and I love it. From my windows, I can see our great river, the Seine, which flows along the side of my garden, yes, the great wide Seine, which goes to Rouen and Le Havre and, 
and is covered by boats passing to and fro. Yes, down to the left lies Rouen, and a whole city dominated by the spire of the cathedral and, and full of bells which sound through the air on fine days, even as far as my home. Oh, <laughs> what a wonderful morning. I was almost sorry when Marie, she's my housemaid, you know, when, when she interrupted me. Your luncheon is ready, monsieur. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Marie, but... You know, it seems a pity to go in a house. Say, do you like it here, Marie? Oh, yes, sir. I like it very much. Yes. I love to watch the boats go by on the same. Well, you do, huh? So do I. See that one? That big schooner, and, and it's being pulled by... Look, what a little tug. Oh, <laughs> look, it's no bigger oh, than a fly. Isn't it beautiful? Mm. So clean and white and yes, shiny. And all white, yes, and she's a three-master, you know. Brazilian, I think. Yes, I... Yes, I can see the flag. It is Brazilian. Oh, she's had a long journey from South America to pass my house. You love this place very much, don't you, monsieur? <laughs> yes, Maria. I love it. I can feel those deep roots which attach a man to the soil on, on which his ancestors were born and died, and and to the villages, yes, to, to, to the atmosphere itself. <laughs> you don't know what I'm talking about, do you, Marie? No, sir. No. But I do know that if you don't come into the house soon, your luncheon will be cold. All right, all right, Marie, I'll come in. For some reason, I, I've had a slight feverish attack the last few days, and I feel low-spirited and ill. I, I have continually a horrible feeling of, of impending danger, an apprehension of, of some coming misfortune or, or of approaching death. Uh, I've never experienced anything like this before. If it continues, I, I think I'll have to see my doctor. Look, I've told you, your pulse is rapid and your eyes yes, are slightly yeah. dilated. Otherwise, you're in splendid condition. But, Doctor, then then why is it when evening comes on, a, a feeling of oppression seizes me, just, just as if night concealed something horrible? Why is that? Probably just a slight attack of indigestion. Yes, yes, indigestion. Yesterday, when I was walking in a forest of Rumar, why did it suddenly seem to me that I was being followed and, and that someone was walking at my heels close, quite close to me? He was near enough to touch me, and yet, yet when I turned around, I saw nothing. Nothing behind me but the path between the tall trees. Horribly empty. Uh, can you explain that by indigestion, can you, huh? Well, here's a bromide. Mm. If you'll take it in several cold showers daily, I'm sure your fears will vanish. Yes, I'm and sure. And you'll be able to sleep without any further trouble. All right, Doctor. Thank you very much. Who is there? It's I, Marie. Oh, oh, just a moment. Just a moment. Yes? Are you all right? What You're is it, You're screaming Marie? and calling out. I'm sorry, I... Wake the I'm servants. I'm up in here having a nightmare, Marie. Look, Who's if you dreamed that someone was looking at you and touching you and, and taking your neck in his hands and squeezing it, squeezing with all his might in order to strangle you, don't you think you would cry out too, huh? Oh. Yes, sir, I'm sure well, I should. you see, all right. Just tell the other servants I shall try to be more quiet. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night. Hey, look. Look, Marie. My, my water carafe. My water carafe, monsieur? Yes, it, it was full. I, I know it was full when I went to bed. Yes, sir, I filled it last night. Yes, and now it's empty. I haven't touched it, and, and it's empty. Yes, sir. Somebody has drunk the, the water. Some, somebody has... Has been in his room. Somebody, something, drank that water. I don't know who could have, sir, unless perhaps you yourself in your sleep. Yes, yes, I myself in my sleep, of course, that's it. I, I must have done it myself, Marie. Marie, tell him to pack my things. I, I'm going to Paris. I, I'm leaving the first thing in the morning. <laughs> Oh, 
July 12, Paris. <laughs> Paris, I, I must have lost my head during the last few weeks. And at home, my mental state bordered a madness, for, for I had believed, yes, I, I had believed that, that an invisible being lived beneath my roof. <laughs> How stupid, how perfectly ridiculous it all seems now, yes. Twenty-four hours in Paris have completely restored my equilibrium, and and tonight I, I'm going to dine at the house of my cousin, Madame Sablé, and, oh, Dr. Parent is going to be there. He's the famous specialist for nervous disorders, and, and I shall ask him, and I'm sure he, he can finally put my mind at rest about this silly hallucination. <laughs> Well, Dr. Palantine, I've been wanting to ask you, have, have you ever known of a case where a person feels that he is, um, how shall I put it, an, an, not entirely in, in command of his soul? It is curious that you should ask me that. Why is it curious? Because now, only now in 1889, yes. after all these years, we are on the verge of discovering one of the most important secrets of nature. What is that? Ever since man has thought... He has felt himself close to a mystery which has been impenetrable to his gross and imperfect senses. Yes. Whatever are you talking about, Dr. Parent? <laughs> Apparitions, my dear Madame Sablé. Invisible spirits. Yes. Oh, <laughs> you doctor. You're always being mysterious. Oh, not at all. For more than a century now, men seem to have had a presentiment of something new. Yes. Uh, Mesmer and some others have put us on an unexpected track, and we have arrived at really surprising results. Oh, you're just trying to frighten us. Not at all. If you think so, would you like me to try to send you to sleep, madame? It would be a novel experience. <laughs> if you can do it. <laughs> and if I can, it will answer your cousin's question. Yes, it certainly would. And now, madame, if you would just sit in this easy chair. So, ah. now, you must let your mind go completely blank and look fixedly into my eyes. Yes, that's right. Now, you are going to sleep. To sleep. You're going to sleep. 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 You see, her eyes are becoming heavy. Her mouth is twitching. Yes, incredible. Sleep. You have nothing but Doctor, sleep. Doctor, I don't like this. Mind. It frightens me. Sleep. Sleep. Here, yeah, now she is asleep. An easy subject, I must say. Somebody. Now, if you will stand directly behind her chair, I will proceed with the experiment. Now, hmm. I hand her an ordinary pasteboard visiting card. So. Now, Madame Sable, you hold in your hand a looking glass. Yes. I am holding a looking glass. What do you see in it? I see my cousin standing behind my chair. Doctor, what is he doing? He is twisting his ear. But, Doctor, she cannot see me behind her by, by looking at a piece of cardboard. No, of course she can't. She sees you through her mind. Or someone's mind. This troubles you, doesn't it? Yes, it, it troubles me. But it answers your question. No. No, it does not. That's common knowledge, Doctor. It's an axiom that, that human beings can be dominated by human beings. But what if a human being is, is dominated by something? By, by something else, I mean. Something not human. What then, Doctor? August 6. I'm back at home. Yes, now I know it's useless to struggle. Useless. Somebody possesses my soul and, and dominates it. Somebody orders all my acts, all my thoughts. I'm, I'm nothing except his slave and a terrified spectator of all I do. Yes, but, but who is he, this, this invisible being that, that rules me, this, this unknowable spirit, this, this rover of a supernatural race, he, he must have a name. I, I know he has. A, I feel it. I, I can feel it. And, oh, someday, someday it will come to me. Oh, if, if I only could leave my house and go away and escape and, and never, never return. But, but it's impossible. This... It being, I cannot call by name. He, he will not let me. I'm helpless. 
What can I do? What can I do? Back to de Maupassant's terrifying story of a man obsessed by the idea that he is dominated by an invisible being. Fear is ruining his life. The suspicion that he is no longer master of his own actions, even of his own soul, is rapidly becoming a certainty. It's only two o'clock, and the whole night is before me. Oh, how, how still it is. And the stars, how bright they are. Who inhabits those faraway regions, and, and what do they know that we do not know? Will not one of them someday appear on our earth to conquer it? We are so weak, so, so defenseless, and what was that? I heard the rustle of paper, yet there's no wind Absolutely no wind. There. It's that book, yes. The, the one on the table under the lamp. It's incredible. The, the page has turned. The page lifted itself up and fell down upon the others as if a finger had turned it over. My armchair appears empty, but, but no, it isn't. No, no he is there. I know he is, sitting in my place. He's reading. I can't stand it any longer. I'll, I'll grasp him and... He ran away. He ran away before I could reach him. He, he ran away and, and the window closed after him. <laughs> He's afraid of me. He's afraid of me. <coughs> what, what do you call yourself, you you evil shade? Whatever it is, whatever it is, someday, someday I'll catch you and, and crush you. Here, come in here. What? What? We heard the noise and we wondered. Another nightmare, monsieur. No, it's not a nightmare. I, I was awake. Tell me. Tell me, Marie. Do you believe in... In invisible things? Invisible? Yes, invisible beings that, that dominate you. Well, uh, I read an article about that an in article? the paper what, today. What did it say? That somewhere in Brazil, I think, Brazil. people are frightened, leaving their houses, Brazil. saying they're pursued by invisible beings which feed on their life while they're asleep. Yeah? Like vampires, you know? Marie. Marie, that, that is where he came from. Oh, monsieur. Don't you remember that? The day we saw that little tug pulling that, that big Brazilian schooner up the river? Yes. Remember, she, she looked so white, all white, and, and he, he was on board. Yes, he, he came from there where his race originated, and, and he saw me, and, and he saw my white house, and, and he sprang from the ship. Oh, <laughs> no, no, I understand. Don't you? Don't you? No, monsieur, I don't. No. No, you couldn't. It, it's all right, Marie. Go to bed. Uh, there's nothing wrong. Don't worry anymore. Go back to sleep. Go back. Yes, now I know. How, how can I help but knowing it's obvious? Yes, the... The rule of man is over, and, and he has come. He has arrived. But, but what is his name? What do you call yourself? What's that? I, no, I, I know he's... He's shouting it out. Yes, yes, I listen. Huh? Hola. That's it, yes. The hola. Yes, the hola. He, he haunts me. He... He is within me. He's becoming my soul. I, I shall kill him. There, 
there, monsieur. Why? The iron shutters on the windows and door complete. All right. Know why anybody wants half-inch iron shutters in their bedroom is more than I can see. Well, at least it'll keep everything out. I don't want to keep things out. I want to keep something in. Hmm? Never mind, never mind. If you're finished, you take your tools and go. My housekeeper will pay you. Yes, monsieur. Good day, monsieur. Good day. Now I'm ready. Yes, tonight he'll come. But tonight I'm ready for him. I, I'm ready for him. <laughs> He's here, yes. I, I feel it. At last, he's here, but... Oh, I don't want to alarm him. I, I'll casually close the iron shutter so... So casually as... As if I'm preparing for bed and... Now I'll start to close the iron doors. As if I'm shutting myself in for the night, but... But instead of shutting myself in, I'll... I'll shut myself out! Yes, yes, it's Donny. He's inside. He, he cannot escape. Downstairs, downstairs, yes. As fast as I can run. Oh, good, good. The lamp is still burning. <laughs> yes, fire. Fire, that'll dispose of him. Fire. Oh, <laughs> See, the house is dry as tinder. Won't take long. See, the, the flames are reaching the ceiling already. <laughs> I'd, I'd better get out before I burn myself up, too. Here, here, see, here I, can, I can watch from here. How slow, how slow the house is burning. Don't you suppose? No. No, there, yes. A tongue of flame licking out on the top of the window. And another, and, and another. See it burn. My house, my, my beautiful house. And, oh, but it's, it's more beautiful. And it's now in flames because, because he's inside. And, and he'll burn too, yes. And, and I'll be free, free, free of the horror, forever. Fire! 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 The house is on fire! Get some water, come on! Yes, it's burning, let it burn. Oh, now the whole place is in flames. Nothing, nothing can stop it. That's Marie, the servant in the garret. They'll be killed. Uh, Here, stand back, uh, all of you. The roof's going to cave in. Look. Oh, the poor oh. devils, we've got to get some help. Yes. Get them out of there. It's lighting up the whole countryside. A monstrous, beautiful, fuel pile. And he's burning, too. <laughs> My prisoner, that, that new being, that, that new master, the horror. The roof has fallen in. The roof has fallen in. Spirit would never fear premature destruction. Only we fear it. All our human terror springs from that, and... Well, then, after man... What? The horror, yes. After us, who can die any day by any accident, comes he who can die only at his own proper hour. Because he has touched the limits of his existence. No, he's not dead. What, what can I do? What, what can I do? Oh, there's one thing I can do. I, I can destroy myself. Yes. 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 I, I must destroy myself. I'm going to destroy. Destroy myself. 
Yes! Why? Yes! I... Let me go! Yes! I, I know I'm Peter Lorre! I know! I know it's a story! I know it's by the Maupassant! Yes! I know it's Thursday night! And we are on the air, but... But it's a horror! Let... Oh, I... I beg your pardon, I... I'm sorry I got so excited, but I... I warned you at the beginning, it... It's a very uncomfortable story. Mystery in the Air, starring Mr. Peter Lorre, brings you Beyond Good and Evil by Ben Hecht, with a special musical score composed and conducted by Paul Barron. Listen again next week at this same time when the makers of Camel Cigarettes present Mr. Peter Lorre in Mystery in the Air. Next week's play will be Beyond Good and Evil by Ben Heck. The artists supporting Mr. Lorre tonight were Henry Morgan as the voice of mystery, Peggy Weber as Marie, Loreen Tuttle as Madame Sable, Ken Christie as the doctor, Ben Wright as Dr. Parent, Howard Culver and Jack Edwards, Jr. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you a pleasant good night for Camel. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Diary of Fate. Fate plays no favorites. It could happen to you. Book 93. Page 861. In the Diary of Fate. Yes, here it is. The name, Tyler White. Occupation, confidence man. Yes, Tyler, yours is the infamous profession of swindling people of wealth and social position by first gaining their attention, then their admiration... And finally, their confidence. And you are well suited to your work. You have always been a success. But you have always been dishonest. And now I, fate, move. And because of two little things. A stray dog. And a forgotten cigarette lighter. You, Tyler White, will soon be executed for a murder... You did not commit. But only you and I know that. Take heed, you who listen, lest you think fate is unjust, unmindful of mortal rights. In a moment, I will make a further entry under the name Tyler White. And when I have written, I will read from his record in The Diary of Fate. of Tyler White now lies open before me. And for a brief moment, I, fate, look ahead to a single instant of decision. I got it all figured out now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gordon, can you fix an alibi for yourself from 8 to 10 tonight? Sure, sure I can. My boys will square up and down for me. Good. Now look, here's the setup. We'll establish separate alibis first, and then we'll get together. And... Take care of Mr. Burke? Right. We're going to take 
good care of Mr. Johnny Burke. Yes, in the life of Tyler White, the decision to murder was made. But in the last analysis, it was something small. Something beyond the control of this man, or any other mortal, which determined the inevitable outcome. It is ever thus, little things. Yes. Yet these are the tools which I, fate, use. I have no choice. For it is all part of a plan. And once set in motion, nothing... Not even I, fate, can alter the course already ordained. Remember, Tyler White, you and your latest victim, the extremely wealthy Mrs. Estelle Courtney, were driving to lunch. You were about to close a deal. And so you see, Mrs. Courtney, one man's dream is more than just a good play. Why, it's got everything. It's tender, it's real, dynamic... Believe me, you're going to own a Broadway hit. Well, I hope you're right, Tyler. $100,000 is a lot of money, especially for something by an unknown author. Why, none of my friends have ever heard of this Keith, uh, uh, Keith, what's his name? Keith Kennedy. Of course they've never heard of him. This is his first play, and that's the beauty of it. His work is fresh, his outlook is clean. In short, Mrs. Courtney, it's youth talking. Why, Tyler, those were my exact words to young Jim Olsen when I hired him this morning. He's from Kansas City, you know, and he's yes. never had any experience of the theater in a big way, like the New York stage, I mean. Mm. But I assured him that a director's job was the same any place, that he had youth you and a new... You hired this uh, Olsen to direct our play? Uh, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. In fact, he left Kansas City this morning. Oh, look, Tyler, Central Park. Isn't it lovely today? Uh, but, Mrs. Courtney, my partner has already picked a director. You can't Oh, goodness, we're almost at the That's plaza it. now. Look at me. Oh, lip blues worn off. No, shiny. Oh, please drive, Sully, while I freshen up a bit. Oh, where is that lip? Well, if your mind's made up, I don't suppose there's anything I can do. Oh, uh, Tyler, do you like the shade? It's called Carnation Red. A really different lip. Oh, Tyler, fell at that dog. Look out. <laughs> Oh, Tyler, my lipstick, it's smeared all over my dress. Yes, Tyler. At just the right moment, I, fate, intervened. A stray dog darted from the curb, and as you stepped on the brakes, Mrs. Courtney smeared lipstick on her dress. A half hour later, as you left a cleaning shop where the stain had been removed, you were surprised to hear someone call your name as you stepped to the sidewalk. Say, Tyler, Tyler White. Huh? Oh, hello, Burke. Well, well, I haven't seen you in a long time. How are things going? Can't complain. Uh, we'd better hurry, Mrs. Courtney. It's after one already. Oh, is it ready? Well, goodness, how the day slips by. Well, so long, Burke. See you around. I uh, don't believe I've had the pleasure. What? Oh, yes, yes, of course, Uh uh, Mrs. Courtney and Mr. Burke. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Burke? Why, oh, Mrs. Courtney, Mrs. Estelle Courtney. Uh, why, yes. Well, this is a pleasant surprise. Why, I've seen your picture. I'm and, sorry, uh, fellow. We're in a hurry. The car's over here, Mrs. Courtney. See you, Burke. Yes, I think you will, Tyler. Goodbye, Mrs. Courtney. <laughs> yes, Tyler. A little thing caused you to stop at a cleaning shop. And as a result, you met Johnny Burke, a man you thoroughly disliked. But you forgot about him an hour later, when Mrs. Courtney finally agreed to sign a contract the next day, awarding you a hundred thousand dollars for the production of One Man's Dream, a play you could stage for twenty thousand dollars. When you returned to your office and Gordon came late that afternoon, you were elated as you lied to your partner. Well, Gordon, we're all set. We've hooked our angel. Are the contract signed yet? No, no, tomorrow. But the $50,000 is as good as ours. 50000 Well, I thought you'd be good for twice that. Listen, Mrs. Courtney isn't the easy mark I figured. As a matter of fact, we're going to lose a few bucks in that deal you arranged with Dwight Reese. 
You mean she's hired another director? Yeah, some dear boy she met in Kansas City. I'll get it. White and Kane Productions. Tyler White speaking. Hello, Mr. White. This is Johnny Burke. What do you want, Burke? No reason to be so cold, Tyler. After all, we're old friends. Listen, Burke. I think you're a cheap crook and our friendship ends there. Now, what do you want? Exactly $20,000. What? Are you crazy? Yeah, like a fox. Now, get this, White. I'm in hot water with a couple of the big boys. They signed a marker for twenty grand, and it's due and payable tonight. You won't get any sympathy out of me, Burke. I'm not looking for sympathy, Tyler. I'm after cash. You're the softest touch I know. What do you mean by that crack? If you don't have the money out here at my place in Cedarville by 9 o'clock tonight, I may have to call Mrs. Courtney. This is a staff, Courtney. And tell her a few things I know about you and the late Mrs. Goodall. You'll do I what? I tell you once, Tyler. I'm in a tight spot. I know how you please Mrs. Goodall. And Mr. White, I've got the letter she wrote to you that prove it. Now, can I expect you at nine? Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there at nine o'clock sharp. <laughs> Seven o'clock. Tyler, we've been sitting here for three hours. I tell you, we've got to... Shut up, Gordon. I've got it all figured out now. Can you fix that pat alibi for yourself from eight to ten tonight? Sure, sure I can. My boys will swear up and down for me. Good. Now, look, here's the setup. We'll establish separate alibis first, and then we'll get together. And take care of Mr. Burke? Right. We'll take good care of Mr. Johnny Burke. And no one will suspect us, Gordon, and even if they do... with it. Me? Uh, I was with my boys playing cards all day. <laughs> sure. And I was up at a movie. I can prove it. And furthermore, let me tell you... Uh, hello? I'd like to talk to Mr. White, please. It's for you, Tyler. This is Mr. White. My name is Jim Olson, Mr. White. Mrs. Courtney engaged me to direct the play she's backing. Oh, I see. I just got into town. I'd like to get together with you and Mr. Kane. Why, sure, but it's... It's after seven already, Mr. Olson. And, well, then, uh, uh, how about dinner? Dinner? No, I'm afraid that's impossible. I'm going to be busy tonight. Very busy. No, Tyler. You had no time for dinner with Jim Olson that night. You and your partner had no time for anything except the murder of Johnny Burke. Shortly before 8 o'clock, you left Gordon in the office, where he was calling the right people to establish his alibi. And you went to the Fairfield, a moving picture theater you had visited the night before. You were careful to be conspicuous. You talked to the girl in the box office. Uh, in other words, if I go in now, I'll just catch the start of the feature. Is that it, honey? That's right. The name isn't Honey, if you don't mind. <laughs> it should be. Look, mister, the whole show is on the inside. The feature starts at 8, 6 and breaks at 10, 30. Now, how many, please? One. I, uh, I'm sorry about that honey business. Didn't mean to be fresh. Honest. Well, forget it. But the name's June. White, my name's June. Tyler White. I'm glad to know you. Yes, you were glad to know her, Tyler, because it strengthened your alibi. And as you went to the theater, you joked with the man who took your ticket. Then you talked to the manager who stood nearby. And finally, I nusher seated you. A moment later, unnoticed, you quietly moved to a side exit and left. And even as you stepped into the darkened alley and walk quickly toward the rendezvous that you and your partner had arranged, Gordon King left the office. Everything was timed perfectly, Tyler. But then I, fate, moved again. And unknown to you, another little thing happened. As Gordon King reached the end of the corridor, he took out a cigarette, then discovered that he had forgotten his life. Quickly, he walked back to the office. Hello? Kane? 
Kane speaking. Oh, Mr. Kane, this is Mrs. Courtney. It's Mr. Whitedale. Why, no, he's not. Can I help you, Mrs. Courtney? Well, I suppose so. It's about the contract I'm going to sign tomorrow. Uh, tell me, is that $100,000 going to be in a dump sum? What? Why, I, I don't know, Mrs. Courtney. I'll have to ask Mr. Tyler. Yes. A forgotten cigarette lighter. And Gordon King learned that you, Tyler, had lied to him. Soon now you will meet your partner. And soon I, fate, will make a further entry under your name. When I have written, I will read from the record in... The Diary of Faith. Because of a little thing, a stray dog that darted from the curb, you, Tyler White, became the victim of a blackmailer, a man as evil as yourself. And because of another little thing, a forgotten cigarette lighter, your partner, Gordon Kane, learned that you were even dishonest with him. But he said nothing when you met and drove to Cedarville, where Johnny Burke lived. The house was dimly lighted and on a deserted street. And you, Tyler, were uncomfortable as you rang the doorbell and waited. But there was no answer. You were surprised when you tried the door and found it unlocked. Easy, Tyler. We may be walking into a trap. That doesn't add up. Burke needs money, remember? Burke! Burke, are you home? I don't like this, Tyler. Let's get out of here. Relax, Gordon. Relax. Sit down. Burke probably stepped out for a minute. Well, maybe you're right. Tyler, look. Under that cushion, it's a gun. Yeah. Yeah, thirty-eight. What are you going to do with it, Tyler? I think I'll put it in the desk here, just in case Johnny Burke has any fancy ideas. Hey, where are you going? This place has a back door. I want to know, but... Tyler. Yeah? Tyler, come here. What? What's the matter, Gordon? What is it? Mr. Burke is home, after all. Look. What? He's dead. Yes, Tyler. The man you and Gordon Kane had intended to murder was already dead. For a moment, you stared in cold fascination at the body sprawled face down at your feet. Then you noticed the letters. The ones you wanted. So badly. Look, Gordon. On the desk. The letters. Yeah, I guess he was going through them when he was killed. Who do you figure did it? Any one of a dozen. Burke was a dirty blackmailer and a stool pigeon. And believe me, he murdered more than once. Tyler. Yeah, yeah, come on. Grab those letters, Gordon. Let's go. The back door. Come on. But can't you go any faster, Tyler? My foot's on the floor now. Now quit worrying. In another half hour, we'll be back in town. And you'll be playing cards, and I'll be a trailer. But, man, look out! Put out your lights. He's over here in this ditch. He's dead, Gordon. Not yet. It's bleeding bad. I guess he was fixing a flat when you hit him. What do we do? Let's get out of here. We'll leave him. But Tyler, Close we can't. your head, Gordon. If we report this and get an ambulance, we're spotted in Cedarville. Come on, let's go. You better let me out here, Tyler. It's only a block to my place. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Be too careful now. Well, so far, so good. I'll see you in the morning, Tyler, at the office. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Those letters. Let me have them. 
No, Tyler. I don't think I will. What? Is this your idea about joke, Gordon? Yeah, it's a joke, Tyler. Like the one about you getting only $50,000 from Mrs. Courtney. What? What are you talking about? Uh, skip the act, Tyler. Mrs. Courtney called at the office tonight and wanted to know if the $100,000 was to be in a lump sum. Listen, Gordon. You're getting just what you're worth. Now give me those letters. Give them to me. Get your hands off me. Tyler, put down that wrench. Now I'll have those letters, Gordon. Gordon! Gordon! Now, Tyler, you had murdered. At first the thought horrified you, and your mind reeled in utter confusion. But in a moment you gained control of yourself and realized that now both Burke and Gordon were out of the way. And you had your precious letters. Quickly you stripped Gordon of his wallet, his watch, a ring. Then, unnoticed, you drove hurriedly to the Fairfield Theater. At half past ten, you stepped from the shadows of a nearby shop and approached the girl in the box office. Confident that your alibi was still unshatterable. That's right, sir. The last picture goes on in ten minutes. You're welcome. How many, please? Uh, two dozen, honey. All on the aisle. Two dozen? Oh, oh, oh. oh, it's you again. Hello. <laughs> the name's still Tyler White, uh, June. Oh, I haven't forgotten. The fact is, I was just thinking about you. Wondering if I were going to stop by on my way out? Whoa, sort of. <laughs> you see, I'm through here in a half hour. Look, you and I have uh, got to get home for a minute. Uh, business call. But how about me picking you up when you're through, hmm? Well, I, I shouldn't, but just... Uh, well, all right, it's a date. Fine, then I'll uh, see you around 11, hmm? <laughs> I was perfect, Tyler. You had been in the theater from 8 o'clock until half past 10. You had talked to the ticket taker, to the manager. You had even made a date with a girl who would not forget your name. And on your way home, you stopped on a nearly deserted bridge and got rid of the things you had taken from Gordon's body. Now, as you approached your house, you were relieved. Until a voice from the darkness called your name. Hey, Mr. White. Huh? Oh, who's there? Who is it? My name is Barton. Lieutenant Barton, homicide. Homicide? What? Yeah. What? Well, what's the trouble, Lieutenant? Hey, here's your thing. Somebody's dead. Mind if I come in? No, 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 of course not. Good. It's chilly tonight. But, uh... What do you want with me? Who's dead? Your partner. Gordon Kane. Gordon? Gordon Kane is dead? I, yeah. I can't believe it. Yeah. Must be a shock to you, all right. Tell me, where you been tonight? Me? Why, I've been at a movie huh? at the Fairfield. Been there since uh, 8 o'clock. Yeah. Can you prove it? Of course I can. Wait a minute, though. Surely you don't think I killed Gordon Kane? No, Mr. White, I don't. That looks like a run-of-the-mill stick I've slain. Well, then, uh, why this questioning? Huh? Because you're under arrest for murder, White. For the murder of Johnny Burke. What? Burke? Yeah. Johnny Burke's dead, too? Uh huh. Shot through the head with a thirty-eight. Hmm. We found a gun in the desk drawer in the living room. And there's a fingerprints on it of yours. You're through, White. You're a but... dead duck. But... Why would I kill Burke? That's easy. Blackmail. You see, we found a letter written to you by a Mrs. Goodall. It was under Burke's body. But I I told you I was at the Fairfield Theater from 8 until 10 o'clock tonight. Uh-huh. Maybe you was. But Johnny Burke was killed at 7 o'clock. Where was you then, Mr. White? At 7? Are you... Well, I, I was in my office. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I was with Gordon Kane. We were, we were talking business. Oh, Gordon Kane's dead, remember? 
Says your alibi. No, 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 no. Wait. Huh? I can prove I was there. I had I, I had a call from uh, Jim Olson, a director who just got into town. Huh? He called me. Yeah. Yeah, I can prove that, Lieutenant. I'm sure I can. Yes, you were safe, Tyler. You had an alibi. A witness who could break the chain of circumstances that was closing tightly about you. A chain that could hold you for a murder you did not commit. But soon, Tyler White, you will learn that the supreme law of justice is as constant as the rise and fall of the tides. For soon, I will write the final entry under your name in The Diary of Fate. afraid as you stood before Lieutenant Barton, an officer who had convincing circumstantial evidence that you had murdered Johnny Burke, a crime of which you were innocent. Your confidence gradually returned as you called Mrs. Courtney and heard her say where you could locate Jim Olson, the one man who could keep you from arrest and trial for murder. Drexel 27331. Thank you, Mrs. Courtney. Thank you very much. Well, Lieutenant, Jim Olson is at the Royal Arms Hotel. The number is Drexel 27331. Okay. I'll call him. I just speak to Mr. Olson, Mr. Jim Olson. I'm sorry, sir, but Mr. Olson. Hey, look, this is the police. Lieutenant Barton, homicide. Now, is Mr. Olson there? No, Lieutenant, he's not. You see, Mr. Olson was killed tonight. Huh? What? What's that? He was killed. He was struck by a hit and run driver. It happened just outside of Cedarville. Yes. The man Tyler hit in the road and left to die was the only man who could prove he was not guilty of the murder of Johnny Burke. And now as Tyler White sits in prison and awaits his execution for a crime he did not commit, he realizes that justice will be served. And now it is time to close the book. Another entry has been carefully noted on the pages of eternity. In the case of Tyler White, as in the cases of all mortals, I, fate, am but an instrument of the plan, and the little things at my command are the tools with which I work. Because of a stray dog, Tyler White, a dishonest man, was led to his death after he had killed the one man who could have saved him. Ponder well the moral, you who listen, and remember, there is a page for you in The Diary of Faith. The cast included Herbert Lytton, Ruth Parrott, Herbert Rawlinson, Bob Lowry, Tyler McVeigh, Ray Erlenborn, Ivan Dittmars, and Hal Sawyer. Diary of Fate is a Larry Finley transcription, brought to you from Hollywood.
Friday the 13th. And the 13th dark fantasy story by Scott Fisher. Golly, am I glad to see you. Well, Jim Howard, welcome to Cape Howell. You're just the medicine the doctor ordered. <laughs> and you're the doctor. How are you, Bill? Never better. Say, am I glad to shake hands with you again. You're the same old Jim. Five years haven't changed you a single bit. Well, I'm sorry. I can't say the same thing about you. You look tired. Almost sick. I say you aren't ill, are you? Ill? Oh, no. No, I've just been working hard. Not much sleep lately. Come on, I, I've got a wagon waiting right over here. Wagon? Sure, nothing fancy about us. We'll take the wagon to the boat landing, and then we'll row over to my island. Uh, it, uh, say, now, wait a minute, Bill. Are you trying to rib me? What, what do you mean, your island? Oh, didn't I tell you? I, I haven't lived in Cape Howe for three years. I, well, I, I find it more pleasant and comfortable out on the island. But what island? Folks around here have another name for it. But don't mind them if you hear it. I call it a chape. Hmm. Uh, uh, say that again, Bill. A chape. Uh, well, what's that? Scandinavian or Esperanto? French. Come on. Here's the wagon over here. Young John's waiting on the boat landing. Oh, I say, how is young John? Jim, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm worried about him. He's having trouble with his studies. Doesn't seem to like books and hates company. Well, I, I'd say he's more lonesome than anything else. It's more than lonesomeness, Bill. Ever since Bill Jr. died, he, he hasn't been the same. Angela and I were sorry to hear about Bill Jr. Pretty sudden, wasn't it? Yes, pretty sudden. That's the way it is in this country, though. So much fever, so few conveniences. Oh, by the way, you say Angela and the child will be along in a few days? Oh, yes. You got my wire? Got it yesterday. I didn't know your sister lived at Lowston. Oh, yes, she has for years. Angela wants to visit about a week, and then she'll come on down here to Cape Howe by steamer. Oh, incidentally, old man, do you think this country's all right for the baby? Had her shots, has she? Oh, yes. Yes, I did everything you suggested in your letter. You know, that letter you wrote almost scared Angela out of coming. <laughs> she said if it's that dangerous here, she doesn't think we should risk the child's life by bringing her here. Well, there's no danger at all if the child's been inoculated against the three diseases I mentioned. Well, I took care of that all right. You're sure there's... No other danger. I've taken care of any other danger there might be. Hmm? What do you mean? Just that. There's nothing in the world for you or Angela to worry about. Please believe me, Jane. All right, old man, all right. Huh. Angela and I are on the first vacation we've had since we've been married. And believe you me, we're here to make the best of it. <laughs> Good, that's fine. Come on, the, the wagon's waiting, see? Right over there. Fine country, eh, what, Jim? Oh, marvelous. We've enjoyed the whole trip so far. Didn't even get seasick on the way across. Not even the baby. And she only a year old. And say, I'm anxious to see that girl. How come you named her Sandra? Oh, that's one of Angela's favorite names. Pretty name, I like it. Mm. Oh, this is the blamedest means of transportation I've ever had to endure. I thought you would at least have your own limousine. No, Jim... I haven't been doing so well lately. I hope you'll be able to put up with what I have to offer you on the island. Rough and rugged, is it? Quite. I built the cabin myself. It's not much, but it's comfortable. Oh, by the way, did you bring the books I wrote you about? Books? Oh, yes, they're in the trunk. Oh, good. I must say, that's the strangest collection of books I've ever heard of. What kind of experimenting are you doing on that island anyway? It's pretty serious, Jim, I assure you. Well, it must be. I read your books on the way across. You you did? Yes, indeed. Dr. Helgen Woodward's book on lycanthropy and 
Henry Joseph McClure's pamphlet on the disease Lumpus vulgaris and Guy Ender's story, Werewolf of Paris, and two other books on werewolves. Can't for the life of me imagine, Andrews, what you want with books like that out here in this wilderness. All right, Jim, here we are. Oh, John, here's Jim Howard. You remember Mr. Howard, don't you, Johnny? Well, sure he does. How are you, John, old boy? All right. Glad to see you, sir. Say, what was that old smile I used to see? Here, let me shake your hand. No, sir. I don't want to shake hands. Oh, come on now. We're old friends, aren't we? No, Mr. Howard. Oh, I say. Now. Jim, just a minute. Let go, Mr. Howard. There. Jim. Oh, there now. Shake just like old friends. Let go. Let go my hands. Let go. Jim. Please. I say. The boy's handbill. Come on, Jim. Into the boat with you. Come along, Johnny. Johnny, get into the boat, son. Yes, sir. Come along, Jim. All right, I'm... I'm shoving off. All right, Johnny. You want to take the oars for the exercise, or you want me to row? Well, son? I told him not to shake my hand. I told him, didn't I? Johnny. Can I help it? Is it my fault if my hand's off? Johnny! You want to row or not? Yes, sir. I'll row. Okay, son. Hop to it. Johnny. uh, Sonny. If I did something... Come on. Down to the other end of the boat, will you? Here. Sit here. I see, Andrews. That boy's hand. Quiet. He's he's upset enough. But Bill, the palm of Johnny's hand... Good Lord, man. It's all covered with a thick rope of hair. Okay, Jim. This is your room. Hmm. Say, this is fine. You say you built this yourself, Bill? Yep. Every bit of it. How do you like my island? Well, I think it's perfect, but uh, pretty inconvenient. Oh, I don't mind. Sorry we had to arrive here so late. I'll show you around in the morning. Yes, I'm anxious to see the rest of your place, Bill. I want to talk to you more about your work. Yes, of course. Tomorrow. It's pretty late now. Yes, it is late. <laughs> so I'm, I'm afraid I rather bored you, old man, with my chatter at the dinner table. Oh, Jim, you heathen. <laughs> You've never bored me a minute in all the time I've known you. (laughs) Oh, that man Rayfield of yours is certainly an excellent cook. Yes. He's an excellent tutor for young Johnny, too. You'll find him quite helpful if you want anything. Fine. Oh, by the way, the people in this spot are a superstitious lot, Jim. Don't let them bother you with any of their nonsense. Nonsense? Yeah. A silly rot about, well, uh, things in the night. What things? Oh, there's nothing, of course. But they take all sorts of means to ward off, well, the evil spirits. Oh, oh, I see. Here, I'll I'll set this charm here on your desk. You won't be using the desk. Charm? What charm? Oh, it's just a simple thing that the people hereabouts always insist on putting in the room in which a person sleeps. Here, these three bits of green twigs. Two of them standing upright like this. There we have it. Hey, what is this? One cross piece on the uprights like this. Then a lakeshore pebble. This little bit of charred wood. There you are. <laughs> now you're you're fully protected. Protected <laughs> against what? Why, those evil spirits I was telling you about. And now just forget about them, Jim. I just put the charm here in case Raphael comes in. He's very superstitious, and he'll never rest until he's made a charm for you himself. (laughs) (laughs) Well, all right, but I still... Now, just forget all about it. Just a whim of Raphael's. Good night, Jim. Night, old man. See you in the morning. Right. Right and early. If you need a spare blanket, there's one in the closet there. Right, Bill. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Hmm. A whim of Raphael's, huh? 
three bits of green twig, a lakeshore pebble, and a piece of charred wood. Hmm. That's a strange combination. To ward off evil spirits, so Bill claims. But what evil spirit? Great horn toads, what's that? What in the world is that? Bill! Bill, I say, Bill, what's that howling? It is nothing, Mr. Al. Huh? Oh, you, Raphael. Nothing but a wild animal. Howling in the night. But that sounded like a wolf. <clears throat> wolf, Mr. Al. Yes. It couldn't have been a wolf. There are no such animals in this country, you know. I know that, but... There. You hear it? It, it, it will be all right, sir. Did Mr. Andrews give you the charm? Charm? Oh, yes, the charm. It will protect you, sir, from anything. Wait a minute, Raphael. Don't go. Just what is this? thing I'm being protected from. Oh, nothing. Nothing, sir. Nothing at all. People around these parts are curious about this all. Superstitious, you know, and all that sort of thing. So we humor them by always keeping a charm in the sleeping rooms of our robes. Yes, but I don't see why you should worry about humoring anybody. Way out here, alone like this, on this island. Well, sir, it is just the habit of Mr. Andrews' arrival. But he said it was you he was satisfying by placing the charm in my bedroom. Yes, sir. That is, well, what what I mean, sir, I'll best be going. Young John isn't feeling so well tonight. I hope you sleep good, Mr. Howard. And don't worry about the howling. Nothing will harm you. Hmm. Don't worry about the howling. That's strange. That howl's coming from the east wing of this cabin. Right over there. Why, George, I'm going to skirt this place and have a look. Uh, Quiet now. The sound. But a light just went on in that room the sound's coming from. That window's heavily barred. And the window glass is frosted and curtained so no one can see inside. The howl is coming from inside that room. Here's the door to the place. Oh, Bill. Bill, are you in there? Bill. Some animal in there, all right. Bill. Andrews, are you in there? Whatever it is, it's trying to get out. Bill! Bill, are you all right? Are you in there, old man? Bill, are you in there? Bill! Yes, Jim? What is it? I... I just wondered if you were all right. I heard that animal howling, and I thought that... Animal? What animal, Jim? Don't tell me you didn't hear it. You weren't by any chance dreaming already, were you, old boy? But the howling came from inside that room. Say, you have been hearing things. I certainly have. (laughs) Just before you opened the door, I heard an animal sniffing and whining and scratching at the door. Oh, now, Jim. A joke's a joke. But I'm not joking. Well, come on inside and look for yourself, then. Does anybody use this room? Certainly, it's young Johnny's. He and Bill Jr. had the room together before... before we lost Bill Jr. Bill? I'd swear there was an animal in here a moment ago. <laughs> Normally, Jim, I'd be a little confused by what you're saying. Well, the long trip, the worry about your baby daughter... Look, and... look, there on the door. Long, deep scratches, like an animal's nails would make. Oh, oh those. Jim, those marks are ancient. The boys used to own a collie dog. We don't have him anymore. We used to shut him up in here sometimes, and he'd scratch on the door for someone to let him out. Now what's this? Bill, what is this? A long, heavy chain, securely fastened to the metal bedpost. And a huge leather collar on the other end. Yes, that was the collar's chain and collar. We, well, 
We've never removed it from the bed. We'd chain the dog here at night to protect the boys. But look here. Fresh blood stains on the collar. And little wisps of grayish fur. Jim, forget it. Those stains aren't fresh. That dog hair has probably been there for ages. Yeah. yeah I suppose so. But why the bars on the windows, Andrew? Just a protection for the children. Come on the living room, old man, and let me get you a drink. Call it a night, shall we? Yes. So I suppose we'd better. Maybe a little sleep will do everybody a lot of good. Angela, I can't tell you how happy I am to have you and Jim here to visit me. Oh, we've looked forward to this for six months, Bill. I envy Jim for having a week's head start on me. <laughs> oh, we really like it here, Bill. Uh, baby asleep, dear? Yes. And it's time we had some rest, too. And that's my hint to clear out. Oh, no. no. <laughs> oh, I forgot. I'm going over to the mainland. I'll be back by morning. Anything wrong, Bill? Oh, no, not a thing. Jim, may I ask a favor? Certainly. That watch charm you're wearing. Solid silver, isn't it? Why, well, yes, it is. Do you think you could give it to me? Give it to you? <laughs> Why, of course. I have a very special reason for wanting it. I wouldn't ask for it if I didn't have. Here you are. Thanks, old man. I... I hope I can return it to you. Well, good night. See you tomorrow. Good night, Bill. Jim, why does Bill act so strangely? I... I don't know, dear. Hmm. I wonder why he wanted that silver watch charm. Odd. Oh, oh by the way, you said you had that wire for me. Oh, yes. It's here in my purse. I'll get it for you. Would you cover Sandra, dear? She's kicked her blanket off. Oh, sure. Here you are, darling. Thanks. Hmm. I say, Angela. Yes, dear? Listen. In answer to your cable... I have been able to learn that the grandfather of William J. Andrews was shot in France almost half a century ago by an angered mob. His grave was recently opened, and instead of the remains of a man, investigators found the almost perfectly intact body of a strange beast, somewhat resembling a wolf. Jim! No. Just a oh, 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 Jim, what's that? Something's wrong. Come on, hurry. Oh, look. Look down the doorway of that room with the bars at the windows. Some animal running out there near the edge. Jim. I hit that creature three times. I couldn't have missed him. And yet the bullets didn't even slow him down. Oh, Jim. There's the doorway. It's Rafael. Look at him. Oh, his throat. <laughs> Only an animal could have done a thing like that. Where's well, John eh? Look, Jim. That heavy chain hanging from the bedpost. The collar's gone. Chain snapped right in two. Angela. You and I have a job to do. I... I hate to ask you to do this, but... I think you've got the courage. To do what, dear? Come along with me. You will see. You about ready to get the lid off the box now? Oh. Steady, Angela. Steady. Oh, this thing's terrible. Desecrating Bill Jr.'s grave like this. Digging up the casket... If I'm wrong about this, well, we see. Hand me that bar. That's it. Now, 
I'll hold the light over here now, Angela. Just another nail or two. Uh, Gee, I'm... Just exactly what I thought. That's not a boy's body in that casket. It... It's what was Bill Jr. But look. Woolly fur all over it. And that head and face. Like a dog's. Like a wolf's. <gasps> oh, Jim. Young Bill Jr. died a wolf. His great-grandfather before him had the same disease. That's why Bill Jr. died so mysteriously. That's why Andrews had to leave the mainland to move out here. And all the while, he's been studying, trying to effect a cure. The hair on the palms of young Johnny's hands not wanting me to shake hands with him. Now I see why Bill was so insistent about the charm of twigs, stone, charcoal. My watch charm. A silver bullet. Jim! That howl again. That, that's coming from our room, Jim. Come on, hurry. Hurry. Look. There's no light in the room. We left it on, didn't we? Oh, yes, we did. Oh, Jim, hurry. There. The light went on. Look out, dear. Let me in there. Oh, locked. This door's locked. Who's in there? Open this door. Open up. Oh, Jim. Jim. Open up this door. Open up, I said. Everything's finished now. Young Johnny is dead. Friday the 13th, and you have heard Scott Bishop's 13th original tale of dark fantasy. W is for werewolf. Ben Morris was heard tonight as Jim Howard. Garland Moss was Bill Andrews. Eleanor Naylor Corrin took the part of Angela Howard. Fred Wayne was Raphael. And Don Stoltz played young Johnny. Next Friday night at the same time, listen to the 14th in this series of dark fantasy dramas. An intriguing, exciting story called A Delicate Case of Murder, written by Scott Bishop. A strange, weird tale of a spiritualistic medium who suddenly finds herself in the midst of a vicious and well-planned murder plot with herself the victim. Murder and fantasy combined to produce one of the most eerie adventures you have ever heard in a delicate case of murder. Tom Paxton speaking. Dark Fantasy comes to you each Friday night from WKY, Oklahoma City. Sealed book. (laughs) 
Once again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault, wherein is kept a great sealed book, in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book, I would know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly, the great book opens. One by one, the keeper of the book turns the pages and stops. Ah, the strange and terrible story of a man who returned to his birthplace and found himself treated as though he were truly a ghost. A tale called Welcome Home. Here is the tale, Welcome Home, as it is written on the pages of the sealed book. The story begins deep in the heart and vast, eerie swampland of Louisiana. It is late in the evening and the moon is bright, but an automobile containing a man and a woman stops in a weed-grown driveway before a great lonely old mansion, crumbling now into ruins. Well, Florence, my dear, here we are at our destination. Let me introduce you to Pirate's Rest, my boyhood home. Leonard, no. This isn't your home, this lonely old place here in the heart of the swamps. Well, you must be joking. Of course I'm not joking. This is Pirate's Rest, where my family has lived for a hundred years. I'm the last living male Lejean, so Pirate's Rest belongs to me now. Leonard, it frightens me. That, that little white building over there through the trees down by the water looks like something in a cemetery. As a matter of fact, it is. That white building is the family mausoleum. Oh. Most of my ancestors are buried there, including my notorious great-grandfather, Paul. He was a pirate, you see. Hence the name Pirate's Rest. You never told me this before, Leonard. Well, the truth is, my dear, I left home under a cloud and was forbidden by my father ever to return again alive. <laughs> Oh, you'd have enjoyed, dear father. He had the odd notion that someday he would be buried alive. <laughs> you, you mean he was crazy? Not at all. You see, his father, my grandfather, was, was buried alive. Oh, Leonard, you're just making this up. Oh, it's quite true. Grandfather died, or at least everybody thought so, of acute alcoholism. So the family buried him down there in our private burial vault. Next day, my father became worried and opened the coffin. He found that Grandfather had changed his position in it. Oh, no. Consequently, my father had an extension telephone installed in the burial vault, just in case the same thing happened again. A, a telephone in the burial vault? Yes, so he could call for help if necessary. You see, he wasn't crazy at all. Just logical. Leonard, you, you've got to take me away from here at once. But that's impossible, my dear. Besides, you won't have to meet any of the family, except Aunt Emily. Is, is she all right? Oh, yes. Except she thinks she can talk to ghosts. <laughs> all the others are dead, so come on now. It's time we made our presence known. Well, all right, Leonard, but I'm not staying one minute longer than necessary. Oh. You understand? Of course not. As soon as I've sold the place and raised a little money, we'll be leaving. Well, here we are. I should warn you in advance. Dear Aunt Emily hates me. Hates you? Why? Oh, it's a long story. I... 
Oh. Who there? What you want? Why, it's old Martha. Open the door wider, Martha. That's it. And we'll come in. Why, it's Mr. Leonard. Miss Emily, Mr. Leonard, he's come back. Leonard? Oh, it can't be. Leonard's dead. Last year, Tom said he'd heard Leonard was killed in a holdup. I'm happy to say he was wrong. Aunt Emily, let me present Florence, my wife. How do you do? <laughs> Birds of a feather, I see. What do you mean by that? Be quiet, Florence. Well, Leonard, if you are alive as you claim to be, why have you come back to Pirate's Rest? I've come back to get my inheritance, of course. So you know your brother Tom is dead, then? Yes, I know. Every time a Lejean has died, I've known it. And now they're all dead, you dare show your face again. But you'll get nothing here, you understand? Everything was left to me. Everything. Indeed? Well, we can discuss that tomorrow. Flo and I have come quite a ways, and we're tired. Will you have Martha show us to a room? And at least make us think we're welcome home? <laughs> Coffee, Leonard? Here you are. You know, Flo, I'm a little disappointed. The house is badly run down. I doubt if I can sell it. But there must be cash around someplace, plenty of it. Leonard, why does your Aunt Emily hate you so? <laughs> oh, I incurred Emily's hatred when I was 12. That was the day of my grandfather's funeral. The one who was later found with turned over in his coffin. Oh, Leonard, please. Emily was the last to leave the vault. For a prank, I closed the door on her. Oh. <laughs> and it was next day before the family found her. Oh, Leonard, <laughs> how could you? During the night, she heard Grandfather calling to her, asking her to let him out. But of course she didn't, since she knew perfectly well he was dead. Her belief that she could talk to ghosts is dated from that night. Oh, Leonard. Oh, but never mind the past. Suppose we look around the house. It'll give you a chance to see Pirate's Rest by daylight, and uh, we might stumble on the money. <laughs> And uh, this is the ball. Those chandeliers were imported by my great grandfather from Italy. So dusty now. Cobwebs. Carpet stained. And these are the ancestral portraits. Here is father, the one who so logically had a telephone installed. I asked you not to talk about it anymore. <laughs> well, that reminds me. Father's safe used to be behind his picture. Hmm. I wonder if the combination has been changed. If it hasn't, three, 17, 21. It's open. So it is. Well, let's see what's in here. Hmm. Lots of papers. But I don't see any cash. Hmm. Leonard. Leonard, why have you opened the safe? To see what's inside, of course, Aunt Emily. You won't find anything in it to steal this time, Leonard. Steal? I hardly think taking one's own property would be stealing. You have no property. Not according to your brother Tom's will. Oh, yes, his will. I've been meaning to speak about that. Aunt Emily, where have you been all morning? I've been down to the graveyard, talking to your brother Tom. Talking to Tom? Tom's dead, and you know it. Yes, Leonard. But I can still talk to him. You know, they don't leave right away. And until they go... Oh, let it make us talk. Don't pay any attention to her. I talked to your grandfather while he was waiting. And I talked to your father, too. And today I was talking to Tom. Maybe someday I'll talk to you, Leonard. Then you'll see. Oh, make her stop. Aunt Emily, you've talked enough nonsense. Now I want some straight answers. Here's a very interesting document that says Tom received 300000 in cash for some property only six months ago. $300,000? That money is someplace around the house, isn't it, Aunt Emily? If there's money in this house, Leonard, why don't you look for it? I'm sure if it's here, you're clever enough to smell it out. You always have been. All right, I will. But if I don't find it, Aunt Emily, then you and I are going to have a little heart-to-heart -heart talk. <laughs>
Now to continue the story, as it is written in the sealed book. It is evening now. For many hours, Leonard and Florence have been searching the old house. With an axe, Leonard has even ripped open the walls of several rooms, but he has found nothing. During their search, a thunderstorm has sprung up, with pouring rain and crashing thunder, which is making Florence even more nervous. Oh, Leonard! Stop jumping every time it thunders. It's just a storm. They come up suddenly down here. Yes, but look out the window. The water in the bayou is rising so fast we'll be flooded. The bayou overflows a couple of times a year regularly. It's nothing to worry about. The water may cover the low ground where the burial vault is, but that's as far as it ever comes. Find anything, Leonard? No. No, I suppose there's no use chopping any more holes in these walls. They're all too solid to have any hidden openings in them. And we've searched all the other rooms. Maybe there really isn't any money. There is, and I know it. Hmm. We haven't tried the kitchen yet. But nobody would hide money in a kitchen. Aunt Emily might. Come on, we'll take a look there. Then if we don't find it, we'll have our little talk with Aunt Emily. What is it, Leonard? Why are you stopping out here in the hall? Martha's in the kitchen. She's up to some mischief. What? Well, she's playing with a little doll. Putting it into a box. She's up to one of her conjure tricks. But I'll put a stop to them. Men go into grave. Doll go into Martha, coffin. what do you think you're doing? Mr. Leonard. Give me that box. No, you stay away from me. Give it to me, I say. Oh. There. Now, let's see what you're up to. That's a doll. Dressed just like you are. And it's got adhesive tape over its nose and mouth. It's supposed to be dead. And the box is supposed to be a coffin. Well, we'll fix that. There. That takes care of the box and the doll. You too late, Mr. Leonard. You, you already start the work. Can't stop it now. Doll go into coffin, man into me life. They'll all be quiet, Martha. Doll go into coffin, man Stop it, I say. sure to You can't die. try any voodoo tricks on me, you hear? Doll go into coffin. I said to stop it. Man, no stop it, you one hear? can say. Stop it. Doll stop go it. into coffin. Hell, this will man. stop you. Ah! She's dead. The eggs. Oh, you killed her. I told her to stop. She asked for it. Leonard, what are we going to do? Nothing. I'm master here. Nobody's going to tell the police. If Emily tries if to... If Emily oh. tries to what, Leonard? Aunt Emily. What are you doing here in the kitchen, Leonard? Where's Martha? Martha. Stay away from her. She's dead, isn't she? Yes, of course she's dead. So you killed her, Leonard. Yes, Aunt Emily, I killed her. Leonard, what are you doing? Just gathering up these towels, Flo, my dear. Now you and I and Aunt Emily are going into the living room. I'm going to tie Aunt Emily to a chair. Then I'm going to persuade her to tell us where that money is hidden. Emily, I think those towels will hold you nicely. Now, I'll give you one more minute to tell me what I want to know. Uh, I'll tell you where the money is. It's in your coffin. My coffin? <laughs> Out in the burial vault, where no thief could ever find it. In the burial vault? Of course, of course, I should have guessed it. Not in the upper vault, Leonard. Down in the secret lower one, where there still is one empty coffin left. For you. Oh, no. Three hundred thousand dollars in my own coffin. If you're going to get it now, you'd better hurry. The bayou's rising fast. It's already flooding the cemetery. Yeah, she's right. By morning, all the ground down there will be under three feet of water. Oh, no, Leonard, please. Please, let's wait. The lower vault isn't waterproof either anymore. But we can't go out there tonight in this storm. It's go now or wait for a week. So we're going now. There's a lantern in the kitchen. Come on, Flo. Or would you rather stay here in the house? Oh, no, no. I'm coming with you, Leonard. I'm coming with you. A few minutes later, Leonard and Florence, with a lantern to show the way, stumbled through the darkness toward the old mausoleum, 
wading through water a foot deep to reach it. Then Leonard unlocked the heavy iron door and they entered a dim, cold room, heavy with the musty atmosphere of death. Then as Florence held the lantern high, Leonard found a great iron ring in the floor and pulled on it, so that a heavy marble slab slowly rose, revealing a narrow flight of steps leading down into the burial vault beneath. Leonard sent Florence ahead of him down these steps with the lantern, then followed, pausing to lower the marble slab back into place. Oh, Leonard, there's water down here. It's over my ankles. It won't hurt you. Leonard, I'm frightened. Aren't you coming down? Just as soon as I let the slab down. There. There, now, let's find that money. Leonard, the water's rising. I can feel it. Wet feet won't hurt us. Just make sure the lantern doesn't get wet. Oh, please, Leonard, hurry. All right, all right. Hold the lantern over here so I can see. All right. I, uh, here we are. Here's great-grandfather Paul's coffin in its niche. And grandfather's. And father's. And Tom's. And here's... And here's mine. Oh. With my name on the nameplate. Leonard Lejean. Born May 17th, 1890. Died March 12th, 1930. Leonard, that's today. Yes, the last part has been scratched in with a knife. Oh, that's some of Aunt Emily's nonsense. Oh. oh, but it doesn't matter. This is the coffin she said the money was hidden in. I have a screwdriver here. I'll get this lid off. It isn't screwed on. Oh. And look, it's here. The money. She was telling the truth. Three hundred thousand dollars. At least, maybe more. There's a dozen big packages of bills here. Oh. Uh, now do you feel better? Yes, but please let's take it and go. The water's still rising. All right, all right, I know. Hold the gunny sack open and... <gasps> What's the matter now? I think I heard somebody up above us. Oh, nonsense. You're just imagining things. No, no, I heard footsteps and, and a sliding noise. Maybe it was your Aunt Emily. She's safely tied up in the house. Oh, but those towels, she wasn't tied very tight. Pull that sack open, I tell you. Oh, all right, Leonard. There. Six. Eight. Uh, ten. Twelve. Uh, yeah, that's all of it. Now we can get out of here. You hold the lantern. I'll carry the money and go up first. Uh, I'll get the marble slab up. Then you can follow me and... to continue the story, as it is written in the sealed book. Having descended into the underground mausoleum, in which the water is rising due to the storm, Flo and Leonard found the old ant's hidden treasure. But as they tried to get out, they found the great slab that covered the entrance was stuck. It won't open. We're trapped down here. Oh, Leonard, we're never going to get out. Be quiet. Put the ladder on the steps and come up here beside me. All right. Between us, we can get it open. All right. Come on up. There, that's it. Now stand here. Yeah. I'll get your shoulder here beside mine. That's right. Now. Help me lift. It won't open. It won't open. It's stuck fast. What am I going to do? What are we going to do? Oh, Leonard? be quiet and let me think. Oh, she did it, Leonard. Your aunt, she's put something over the slab so we can't get it open. She couldn't. She was tied up, I tell you. Oh, she got loose. It's just what she would do. She hates you, Leonard. The devil. The old she-devil. But I'll beat her. I'll beat her yet. There must be some way out. There must be some way. There must be. <laughs> yes, yes, that's it. That's it. She didn't think of that. What, Leonard? What? My father. My father. 
I told you he had a mortal fear of being buried alive. So he had a telephone installed here in the burial vault. Leonard! A telephone! All connected up and ready to work in case he was buried alive. Now we're buried alive, and we'll use it. We'll use it. Let it work. Of course work. it'll work. Now, now where is it? Where is it? Now, let's see. That's for you. Yes. Here. Here in this niche in the corner. It must be in this watertight box. Come on now. Uh, Hold the line in while I open oh, it. Oh, yes. Yes, let it. There. <laughs> Look, I was right. I was right. A telephone all in working order. Uh, Father never thought when he drove me out of the house that someday he'd save my oh, life. Use it, Leonard. Use it and get us out of here. Oh, yes. I'll have to call the sheriff in the village. Have him come rescue us. I'll tell him a story, some kind of a story. It won't matter. Hello. Hello. Operator. Operator. Hello. Operator. Operator. Hello? Oh. Operator, give me the sheriff, quickly. Oh, thank heaven to work. The sheriff? Why do you want the sheriff? That telephone you're using only connects with the house, Leonard. <coughs> Emily. Okay. Emily. <laughs> of course. How does it feel to be dead, nephew? Hey, Emily, listen to me. I'm not dead, do you hear? Oh. And you've got to come let us out of here. Of of course you're dead, Leonard. That's why I had to fix it so you couldn't get out again. Because the dead have to stay where they belong. Oh, no, no. Aunt Emily, listen to me. Come let us out of here and I'll let you keep the money. I won't bother you again. I'll go away. You'll never see me again, only come let us out. <laughs> I know it. Hard to get used to the idea of being oh, dead, boy. Leonard. <laughs> Tom found it hard, too. And so did your father. But you'll get used oh, to no, it. No, no. And your wife will get used to it. No. <laughs> and I'll come talk to you, Leonard, every day. Just as I talk to them. No, no, no. <laughs> because now no. that you're dead, you're both welcome back. And the family's all together oh, again. No. So, welcome home, Leonard. Welcome home. Oh, no, no, no. And Emily, and Emily, and Emily. That is the tale of Leonard and Florence Lejean's homecoming, as it is written in the sealed book. The next day, old Emily was found unconscious by neighbors who had no knowledge of Leonard's arrival with his wife. <laughs> they took Emily to the hospital, where it was several weeks before she could speak coherently. Then they decided to uh, keep her there, to look after her. But the doctors observed that Emily carried on long conversations with a nephew named Leonard and his wife, Florence, whom no one else could see. <laughs> Since that day, the old Lejeune mansion has crumbled into ruin, and no living soul has ever entered the old mausoleum again. Its secrets are forever hidden from the world, save only here, where they are written down in the sealed book. And now, keeper of the book, before you close the great volume, show us the tale we tell next time. This one. Ah, yes. The story of a strange plot by which a man and a woman schemed to be rid of an individual who stood in the way of their happiness and of the terrible fate to which their scheme brought them. A tale titled, I'll Die Laughing. Be sure to be with us again next time. 
and the sound of the great gong herald another strange and exciting tale from The Sealed Book. The Sealed Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. the stillness of this moment, for this is a time of mystery, a time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is The Haunting Hour. Listen, those are bells tolling in requiem for a man who has died. How did he die, you ask? Ah, listen to what happened to a girl who knew and whose mind was clouded dark with the fear of knowing. Listen to a tale of murder. It is late afternoon. Lee House is set strangely on a cliff beside the rolling sea. Autumn leaves fall, and with them the threads of night. And in a car, parked a little distance from the house at a pillared gate, sits a girl behind the wheel. Beside her stands an old man with sad and beguiling eyes. It's a bad night, Miss Anna, to be driving the sea road. I know, Jenkins, but I must go, I must. How could I spend another night in that house? What could be keeping him? This young man, Miss Anna, is he... He's a good driver, Jameson. I'll be perfectly safe. I do hope you will be, ma'am. Listen, you can hear the surf from here. How Mr. Jonathan loved the sea. Jameson, don't. Oh, there's rain behind that wind, I bet. In my mind, memory of him, I can still see him. Like that night a few weeks before he died. I mustn't think of it. Not now. Not now. You can't forget me, Annabelle. Even when I'm dead, I'll live in your mind. I'll feed on your fear of my ghost. I'd rather be dead. Jonathan... Let me out of this house. Let me go. My dear, you're too lovely for others to see. So I've no choice but to keep you within these walls. Within this prison, you mean? Even that chauffeur is a spy. There isn't a moment of the day when I don't feel a pair of eyes watching everything I do. They even pry into my thoughts. Jonathan, if you have any kindness in your heart... Look here. Here at the window. The ocean is white capped, far as you can see. Why do you torture me? How can you hate me so much? I don't, my Annabelle. And this pleading, it's no use. You'll never forget me. I'll never let you go. I'll never let you go. Miss Anna, why so pensive? Oh, I. I was thinking. Remembering. Jameson, are you sure you want to be caretaker at Lee House? You won't be lonesome? I wouldn't leave it, Miss Anna. It'd be like leaving my little girl, my my daughter Amy. You loved her very much, didn't you? That I did. And the morning we found her at the bottom of the cliff down there in the cove was almost more than my heart could bear. But that was long ago. Look. Look there. 
Reckon that's the young man coming now. Oh, yes, it is. Goodbye, Jameson. You've been a good friend. Thank you for that. Goodbye. Good luck, Miss Anna, wherever you go. Jim! Oh, Jim, I thought you'd never come. Hello, Anna. Sorry. Here, climb in here. Take the wheel. Okay. A few last things to do at the Hendersons. You know how it is. Jim. Jim, hold me close. I was so worried. I was afraid you might think I wasn't coming. And all the time running over that hill, my heart kept pounding, saying, Simpleton Jim Brandt, even late for his elopement. Well, ready to start, Mrs. Brandt? Just you wait and see what a swell honeymoon trip I've got planned for us, Mrs. Brandt. Oh, it's so wonderful. But is it real, Jim? What do you mean, real? Of course it's real. Well, it seems like a, a good dream. After the last three months since he died, I've, I've lived in a nightmare since then. Oh, but it's over now. Over and done with. Jim, don't think me silly, but they don't exist any longer, do they? Hmm? I mean, people who are dead. <laughs> My heavens, no. Except in somebody's mind, maybe. Somebody who was close. A wife or a daughter like you, maybe. Especially a good-looking daughter like you. Yes. I... I want to tell you something, Jim. My, my, don't you sound serious, though. I don't want to be serious. All I want to do is be close beside you. Say, there's a, there's a road somewhere ahead that cuts off about ten miles. Country road. We'll have to watch for it. Remember the first day we met, Jim? That little country road? Mm-hmm. Wasn't far from Lee House. You just walked down that road from the Hendersons and... When I came along, you were poking at some rocks with a long stick, and I couldn't imagine what you were doing. Oh, hey there, young lady. Would you like to see something? See what? Well, come here and find out. A whole nest of them, down in this crevice in the rocks. Nest of what? Well, come and see. They won't bite you. Oh, no, you tell me. I'd, I'd rather not look. That rattling... Yeah, that does give them away. Well, it's a mama snake and, oh, I don't know how many chillin in the nicest snake house you ever saw. Big fellas, too. Oh. Then you let them alone before they come out. Oh, oh, they'd be as scared of you as you'd be of them. Well, say, uh, you live around here somewhere? Yes, but uh, I must go now. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. I, I'm Jim Brandt, architect over at the Henderson's place. Been adding that new wing and rebuilding the stable. I heard about it. Where do you live? At the Lee House. I've been on lots of walks around here, but I've never seen you before. How come? I don't often go out. Say, you must be Mr. Lee's daughter, huh? Or has he got a daughter? I really can't talk with you, Mr. Brandt. I, I've got to hurry home. Oh. Goodbye. Oh, hey, Miss Lee. Maybe I'll see you around here again sometime. First time we met. Remember? Ah, you know, you were mighty strange that day. I was afraid. Afraid? Afraid of what? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I guess because all the days were so full of him... Like the day he disappeared. What do you mean, Anna? He went sailing alone that day. Then suddenly the squall blew up, the wind and the waves, and nobody ever saw him again. Annabelle! Yes, Jim? Annabelle, Lee! Huh? I didn't hear what you said. I didn't. But you did. You, you said my name. <laughs> oh, you were just half asleep, that's all. Hey, what's that? Oh. Uh... Doggone it, Anna. We got a flat tire. Don't stop, Jim. Don't stop here. We have to. I can't ride the rim. But there's nothing to fix it with, Jim. Let's go on, please. I, I don't care about the tire. Anna, what's the matter? You think I'm going to ruin a perfectly good... Hey, look. There's a little house up there. I'll bet he's got a jack. Hey! Hey, up there! Oh, now, darling, don't look like that. What's the matter? Hello! Sorry to bother you. Have you got a jack I can borrow? Flat tire. Sure. Hey, son, go get the jack out of the car. Hey, uh, you see, Anna, we'll have it fixed in no time. Oh, darling, don't look peeved. You people headed for the turnpike? Mm-hmm, that's right. And you're going the wrong way. Shortcut's back about a mile. Oh, you mean we're past it? Well, well, how do there, ma'am? Didn't see you at first. How'd you do? I don't guess you remember me. I come over and helped your husband's man, Jameson, fix the gardens this spring. Jim. 
It's too bad he's lost in that squall, Miss Lee. He's a fine gentleman, Mr. Jonathan was. You grieved us all to see your husband go like that. Jim, you turn back. You're, you're taking me home. You were Jonathan's wife, Anna. Don't take me back. I didn't lie to you, Jim. I, I was going to tell you. When? After we got married? After... Oh, no, I was going to tell you tonight. That second time I saw you after Jonathan disappeared, you asked my name. Even then you thought I was his daughter and something wouldn't let me say I was his wife. You were so much older, Jim. Nearly 20 years. How long were you married? Four years. Four dreadful years. I never loved him. Anna. I can't help it. He kept me like a prisoner in that gloomy house, watching me every minute. Oh, Jim, I, I do love you. Don't take me back. It's all right, Anna. Let's don't get upset. Just be quiet for a few minutes. What's the matter? What are you looking back for? Something's following us. I can feel it, Jim. On this lonely road? You're sorry you ever came. Oh, Anna, stop it. Say you're not sorry. Say you forgive me for deceiving you. I do. I do forgive you. Then everything's all right, Jim. Don't hate oh, me. Oh, Anna, no, no. Let's not talk about it. Not now. Yes. Yes, let's forget. Let's talk of something else. Look, it's... It's beginning to rain. Night's come. Yes. Listen to it on the roof. Seems to be saying your name. There's a poem written about you. You know that? Yes. Pose. I used to know it by heart. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by, by the, the sea, sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know. That's it. By the name of Annabel Lee. And this maid, she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. Say, hey, you know it too. I've heard it a million times. I know it all, every syllable. Uh, Jim, listen. What? It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea. Jim, look. What? What is it? On the road in the lightning. A man in the rain. Well, Anna, it's, it's not anybody. But you don't know. He was in the house from that first day he disappeared. I could hear him even before that. Out at sea, calling my name. Oh, Anna. Anna, you've got to stop this. But, Jim... You're just imagining it, I tell you. You're... Jim, I've got to tell you. I can't go on without telling you the truth. What truth? I killed him. Anna. I killed Jonathan. I killed my husband. What are you saying? Now you know. Now you can take me back to Lee House. You can take me back home. Back to him. <laughs> Jonathan Lee is dead. And our story begins one night a few months later when Anna, a young woman who has lived in seclusion for four years at Lee House, is to be married to Jim Brandt, a young architect. Jameson, the old caretaker, sees her off in the station wagon. And as Anna and Jim drive along, she confesses that she was Jonathan's wife, that she herself murdered him. Her mind is distraught with a terrible fear that the dead man is somehow among the undead that he is waiting for her. Oh, Anna, Anna, I don't believe you. What are you saying? That I killed him. I planned to kill him. No, no, you couldn't have. I had to tell you. Because Jim, somehow he's not dead. You said the, the dead only live in somebody's mind. And they do. But they also live beyond the mind. Oh, Anna, please. That's why I couldn't wait to tell you. Calmly and sanely in the light of day. Jonathan's waiting somewhere for Listen. me. Now, Anna, listen. Don't you see, Jim? I thought I could run away from him. I thought I could send him out to sea and he'd never come back again. Here, I'm going to stop the car. Oh, no. Jim, please, no. If you loved me, take me on. Tell me why. Why on earth did you do this? I... I had to. Tell me why. That poem you mentioned. He used to say it to me. He used to love it. I'll hear him till I die. His voice droning out the words. Sometimes, Jim, he'd lie awake and I'd hear him whispering it over and over. I could see, mournful and sad. When I started working in the village at the library, five years ago that was, he used to come in and ask for Bo. At first I thought he was just a lonely old man 
lonely because his wife was dead. That day, late in October, he asked me if I'd take the job of cataloging his library. It was right after my mother died. I was alone. He used to come in that big, dark room and ask to help. He used to say, You're working too hard, Annabelle. Come for a sail with me. I went once or twice. He'd look at me with a strange kind of laughter in his eyes. Then he asked me to marry him. He asked me a dozen times. At last I did. And then... Four years in that house with the sea always pounding. The wind crying in the cold. But what did he do, Anna? What could have made you... He was going to kill me. Just as he killed the first Mrs. Lee. What? He murdered her? Oh, Jim... I had to do it. From the day I married him, I wasn't allowed out of that house. Except when he went along. That afternoon I met you. He'd gone for a sail and I planned to run away. Yes, you you did have a suitcase, I remember. But when I met you, I was sure you were one of his spies, so I had to go back again. That night, I went to his room. He was sitting in the huge chair by the fire. He looked up and smiled that grim smile. Did you want something, Annabelle? Jonathan, you loved me once. I had pity for you once, if not love. Oh, listen to me, please. But you said it all before, hundreds of times. I couldn't say it enough, Jonathan. Please, please let me go. I'll do anything you say if you'll only let me go. But, my dear, when I met you, didn't my money please your eye? Isn't it enough to have that? It wasn't your money, Jonathan. It was pity for you. Only pity. I I thought it was love. Where is your pity now? No, Annabelle. I couldn't let you go. You'd find pity for another man and grow to believe that you loved him, too. How could I bear such a thing to happen? No. You see, your pity, as you call it, is only for me. Until the day you die. What do you mean? Jonathan, what do you mean? Soon, I'll let you go, Annabelle. Some day soon, you must go for a sail with me. screamed and ran from him. My mind was sick with terror. What was I to do? The house was like a prison, and everywhere I turned were shadows and gloom, and Jonathan was part of it all. But I had one friend, and he'd come to me when I needed him most. Miss Hannah, don't turn on the light. Jameson, where are you? Here, here beside you. I've been waiting in your room because I had to see you without him knowing it. Oh, Jameson, you've, you've got to help me. I've got to get out of here. No, no, Miss Anna. That's what he wants you to do. And that's why I came to, to stop you from going. Why? He'd follow you. He'd find you. You heard what he said? I've heard it before. The other Miss Lee. She begged him to let her go. Time and again she begged him. And one day, she took a boat from the cove. He said... She was lost in the sea. Yes, Miss Anna. But Mr. Jonathan followed in a skiff, and then she never came back. He murdered her. Jameson. It's the truth. I believe you are. I do. Then wait and plan. I'll help. But he mustn't know about it. Tomorrow, we'll talk tomorrow. If he goes sailing again. Sailing. You're right, Jameson. I won't run away. I know now what I have to do. I know now what I must do. So that night, I, I made my plan. The next day, he did go sailing. And that was when I caught them. With a little cord noose I made myself. I lay on the rocks for a long time, looking down, waiting till I could get the cord over their heads. Caught what? The rattlesnakes you showed me that day. Yeah. I caught them and took them down to the cove in a box. And that night, I put them in his boat in a coil of rope. I left them there. Oh, Anna, how 
terrible. The next day he went sailing again. He didn't see them at first. The motion of the boat and then a sharp sting on his leg. And waiting in the dark, I could picture him. Fighting, drawing back, turning loose of the boom, climbing out of the pit. And the squall came. And he was gone. Well, Anna, what are we going to do? But I had to, Jim. And it wasn't because of me. Well, I'd only seen you once. I didn't know you weren't somebody he'd hired to watch me till I saw you again and again after he was dead. Oh, Jim. Anna, look out. Hold on. It's a cliff. We're hanging over the edge, Anna. Get out, quick. Here, take my hand. This side, Anna, this side. That was close. Are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. Look, we nearly went over into the sea. Golly, we'd both have been killed. Jim! Jim! What, Anna? We're we're back where we started. There's the house and the cliff. What? You brought me back. Anna, you know I didn't. Jim, look! Who is it, Jim? Yonder on the road. I don't know. It's Jonathan. He's walked up from the sea. Oh, let me go, Jim. Let me go. It's only some man. Anna, come back here. Come back. Hey, down there. What's the trouble? Quick, man. Help me stop her. Uh, Oh, where'd she go? I'm Jameson. We had an accident, Jameson. She's gotten some crazy notion in her head about a ghost. Look, she's running across the lawn. Down to the sea path. Hurry. Miss Anna. Miss Anna. It's me, Jameson. Oh, Jameson. It's you. It's you. Anna, where were you running to? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, my darling. You frightened us nearly to death. It was only me on the road, ma'am. I thought it was... I thought I... She's shivering, sir. Here, here, take my coat, Miss Anna. It's Providence that brought you back tonight. Why, Jameson? There's nothing to say, Jameson. Jim, take me to the house. But when Jonathan sailed away that day, the snakes weren't in the boat. I took them out. You see, he could have heard their rattles. And anyway, sir, I couldn't have Miss Anna do such a thing. James, you mean... I couldn't have her do it, sir, when rightly the job was mine. What you're trying to say... With my daughter Amy, I was thinking of how Mr. Jonathan drove her to love him like she did. And how he would smile at her in that laughing way so that she jumped from the rocks here down to the sea. Then that was why... So, that day, before he went for his last sail, I cut the rigging ropes. And when the wind took the canvas strong, as it does when you ride the swells, they snapped. And I stood here on the cliff and watched the boom fly free, and down he went beneath it. Oh, Jim. How could I watch him murder you, Miss Anna, as he'd murdered my Amy... Oh, you're free of it, Anna, now. Don't you see? It was only the fear in your mind. Uh, I've got a fire going in the library, Miss Anna. I'll take her in, Jameson. I'll I'll go see if if I can get your car off the cliff. Oh, no, Jameson. Let it alone. We don't care about the car. Oh, but you two can be on your way again when the rain blows over. Come along in, Anna. You're cold now. Here, pull the coat around you. He did it for me, Jim. Are you all right now? Now I am. Jim... Look, what's Jameson doing? He's climbing in the car. Stop him, Jim. What? He started the motor. But the car's hanging over the edge of the rocks. Jim, stop him. It's toppling. It's toppling over the cliff. Oh, Jim, how awful. It went over the cliff. Down to the sea in the cold. He did it all for me. And for me too, darling. But he's made everything all right, Anna. He's made everything all right. From shadows and stillness... Mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory. In the haunting hour.
by old Nancy, the witch of Salem, and Satan, her wise black cat. They're waiting, waiting for you, now. Today, yes, sir, a hundred and three year old. <laughs> well, Satan, me and you better plan to spin these folks up a little yarn tonight. <laughs> Douse all them lights. That's it. Make it nice and dark and cheerful when you hear our bedtime stories. <laughs> now. Draw it up to the fire and gaze into the embers. Gaze into them deep. And soon you'll see the dining room of a fine old house in England. And there, on the evening of the 13th of May, begins our yarn about the devil's number. <laughs> the devil's number. Serve coffee and liqueurs in the East Room, Peters. You'll be more comfortable there. Yes, sir. Permit me to lead the way, Mrs. Oliver. Certainly. What a wonderfully huge place you have here, Mr. Rockwell. Harry, don't you wish that our home had so many rooms that we'd be compelled to designate them by point of the compass? I'm not sure that I do when I think of Mr. Rockwell's yearly cost for upkeep. <laughs> when my original ancestor built the place in 1512, another ancestor later enlarged it. They had a very poor regard for a 20th century descendant who'd have to bear its expense in depreciated currency. Here we are. Take this chair, Mrs. Oliver. Thank you. This house was built in 1512, you say? My, it's over 400 years ago. Yes, its lack of modern convenience is a test to that. You know, I'm offering you very poor hospitality in exchange for the jolly entertainment you afforded me at this time last year. Poor hospitality? After that dinner? Well, anyone can feed his friends. You fed me in such a delightfully original manner. Original? Don't you remember? By a coincidence, today's day and date are precisely similar, except for the month. You were at my anti superstition party. Yes, with 13 at table, and you compelled everyone to break a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> and a spill saw. And to enter the dining room, I had to walk under a ladder. <laughs> of course you were at that mad affair. I shall never forget it. I've gone about knocking on wood ever since. <laughs> well, I'm only joking about being superstitious, of course. Although it's bred in my British bones. There's a coffee and the cure, sir. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, will there be something else now, Mr. Rockwell? Uh, not for the present. I'll ring at home, would you? Uh, yes, sir. You know, it's a darn funny thing that we should visit your place for the first time on Friday the 13th, as you first visited us. The coincidence never occurred to me until you mentioned it. I thought of it when I drove you down from London. If we hadn't been detained in Liverpool, we'd have begun our visit yesterday, as we planned. <laughs> Perhaps the hoodoos I made you attempt last year arranged the coincidence. <laughs> I scarcely think the hoodoos will harm us after this long time. Well, perhaps we should light a bonfire to keep them at a distance. Light a bonfire? Yes. Evil spirits are afraid of fire. If you look out that window, you'll see several fires which my tenants have lighted for their protection. Your tenants? Modern English farmers believe seriously in your fortune of this day? Whether they believe seriously or not, they take no chances. Do you know the basis for its ill fame? Why? Because Friday was the day of crucifixion. Yes, when evil triumphed over good, and the devil over God. Thirteen is the devil's number, because he was the chief of each convene of witches and wizards, which always numbered twelve in addition to himself. Now, you've been holding out on us, Bert. We never dreamed that you were an authority on folklore. Oh, dear me, I'm not. I'm the merest dabbler. But it is an interesting subject, don't you think? Most interesting, particularly for today. Would you like to see a concrete example of the thirteen superstition? A concrete example? Yes. But first, you must assure me that you're not at all squeamish. <laughs> not I. Then come this way. Oh, Peters. Peter? Yes, sir. Fetch me a lamp or a lantern, will you? Yes, sir. Now, I'm taking you to the unused portion of the house. Uh, are you sure you won't mind looking at human bones, Mrs. Oliver? Human bones? The very old ones. They've been in the house for nearly three centuries. You keep bones in the house? Well, they belong to an ancestor of mine. He was such a wicked old chap, the church wouldn't permit his remains to be buried in consecrated ground, so we had to find a resting place for them somewhere. Besides, he wanted them to be here. Here's a lantern, sir. Oh, thank you, Peters. You're, you're going into the old part, sir? 
That's where we're headed. Not to towards the North Tower, sir. Yes. To the crypt of old Eric. Oh, please don't bring that. Uh, not tonight, uh, Mr. Arthur. <laughs> the old wizard starts any trouble, Peter. We'll shout and let uh, you know. But, Mr. Arthur... Come along, you two, who want to learn about superstition. Uh, Mr. Arthur, wait. Wait. Take this. Oh, must I carry that prodigious weapon with me? You promised me you always will when you go in there, sir. Please. Oh, very well. I'll take it now. Come on, open the door. Yes, sir. Give me your hand, dear. It's pretty dark in here. Well, I'll leave the door open, sir, and stand here waiting, if you need me. All right, Peter. Your butler doesn't approve of this expedition, apparently. No, he doesn't like the North Tower and old Eric. Why did he insist you carry that huge revolver? Well, he always does when I visit the old pub. He has it loaded with dum-dum bullets. Dum-dum? Yes, they're ordinary lead or steel-jacketed bullets crisscrossed with a knife across the nose to make them spread on impact. Someday I shall tell him that only silver bullets are of any use against ghosts. Ghosts? Or disciples of witchcraft. Now, what on earth are you taking us to see? Merely some old bones. Uh, watch your step. The floor's on very sound in here. There's rubbish to fall over. Now, you're working up to some sort of a practical joke leading us into this darkness. Oh, upon my word, I'm not. No, 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 really. Although I do owe your wife some retaliation for having made me walk under ladders and break mirrors. I've never been in such a spooky place. No, I... These old halls beat any haunted castle I've ever read about in books. The shadow cast upon them by Mr. Rockwell's rubbing lantern are giving me the shivers. Me too. You're getting your revenge for Judith's superstition party, Bert. <laughs> but tell us about this ancestor of yours whose bones we're going to see. Uh, wait till we reach his resting place. Tell me more effective then. Ah, here we are. Uh, his remains were enclosed in that little iron chest. The religion that wall? Yes. I'll open his tiny cough. Oh. Here, you see all that is still earthly of Eric Rockwell, my many times great-grandfather who was burnt at the stake by order of King James I. For witchcraft. Burnt at the stake? For witchcraft, yes. Members of the family bribed the official executioners and were allowed to reclaim these bones from the ashes. They sifted so diligently that only the bones of a single foot escaped their pious search. Otherwise, the skeleton of the old scoundrel lies intact within this iron box. Why do you keep him here? Well, I've already explained that the church refused to allocate hallowed ground to his remnants. That Eric's bones were not consumed together with his flesh was considered extremely unfortunate at the time, for it was commonly believed that they would enable him to live again. People believe such rot as that? People still believe it. Oh, wait till you hear all the story. Gather round me, my children, and listen. The old gentleman whose skull and assorted bones lie before us in these pretty shadows had great supernatural power. According to incontestable records, he was born in the year of 1514. He was executed... In 1623. When he was over a hundred years old. When he was a hundred and nine years old. But when he was led to the stake, he didn't look a day over forty. Bert, are you making all this up? Not a word of it. Oh, let's hear the rest of Eric's history. At his trial, it was proven that he murdered... No less than eight young girls. He murdered? Yes. For their blood, which he used as ingredients for a rejuvenating elixir, which enabled him to defy old age. Well, that's crazy. I know it is, but according to the records, it worked. But how? Well, that the judges didn't learn. Uh, they learned he had lured young women to this house so that they might later become his victims, however. It seems he, in some way, managed to secure 13 drops of their blood, after which they became his slaves and did whatever he wished. 13 drops of blood? The devil's number. The number which makes people fear this day, even in a so-called enlightened age. After Eric had secured that small amount of blood, the girl would become his creature. Then he would drain her arteries at leisure in his laboratory, which still exists as he left it. 
As a matter of fact, the old villain was probably merely a first-class hypnotist with a wide sadistic streak. And he makes a good story of a Friday the 13th, doesn't he? Yes. But why do you keep his awful bones in your home? A matter of tradition. We Britons are governed always by that, you know. Uh, the old boy is said to have remarked before his death that if his bones weren't collected and kept in Rockwell Manor, and that if his laboratory and implements weren't preserved intact, that the house would be destroyed. The foolish believe that he had a purpose in that command, some idea of resurrecting himself from the dead. Bad story, isn't it? Yeah. Now close that ghastly chest and let's go back to where it's light. I'm for that. I brought you here for the ghostly thrill. I've given myself the shivers. <laughs> Don't close the chest yet. Hold that lantern so I can look. Judith, I never knew before that you possessed a morbid streak. I didn't either. But those bones, that grinning skull, they fascinate me. You're bearing out the legend, Mrs. Oliver. Old Eric was noted for fascinating women. But I'll close the chest now, if you don't mind. And we'll go back. Yes, dear. I'm ready for another glass of burnt brandy. Wait. Wait, please. Let me close the chest. If you wish. Dear, but what's wrong? Oh, I cut my finger on that rusty iron. Hey, hold that lantern here, Bert. I see your fingers bleeding. Hey, I'll bind it with my handkerchief. Don't bother. It's just a scratch. Good oh. oh, Lord. What's the matter? Her blood has fallen on that skull. Well, why should that? Count those drops, Harry. I make 13. The devil's number. 13 drops of blood on the wizard's skull. Honestly, Harry, if we hadn't known Mr. Rockwell for so long as the steadiest sort of person, I'd think he's a little mad. Quiet, dear. His room's next to ours. He might hear you. He certainly became upset about that blood, didn't he? His face was whiter than a sheep when we came out of that darkness into the lighted hall. And so was his butler's when he heard what had happened. It was strange, though, that you should cut your finger and that just 13 drops of blood should fall upon those bones after what Bert had told us. Yes. There were just 13 drops. Exactly. I counted them. They all fell on top of the skull, and it absorbed them like blotting paper. Coincidence, wasn't it? Yes. If there was any superstition in my makeup, I'd have been more shaky about it than Bert. Why? <laughs> Would you think my blood could restore the old wizard to life? Oh, that's ridiculous. Why did you want to close that closet, Judith? I don't know. Just a mood, I guess. Well, I'm tired. Let's go to bed. All right. I'd better remove the handkerchief you bound around my finger and wash it thoroughly before I take off my dress. I don't want blood stains on this new gown. No, I'll put some iron on that cut. Harry. Huh? This is funny. What? There's no blood on either my finger or the handkerchief. No? Yet the cut was bleeding profusely when you bound it. Let's see. Look. That is funny. The wound seems to have closed after... after those 13 drops. Evidently. Another coincidence, isn't it? The... Well, the cut's a tiny one. It's not remarkable that so little blood flowed from it. Harry, there's still another coincidence that I haven't mentioned to you. What do you mean? When, when I reached out to close the lid of that chest, it, it fell upon my hand before I touched it. Before you touched it? Yes, it, it seemed to leap at me. Now look here, Judith. You're not letting Rockwell's story of that old sardest affect your good sense. You're not beginning to believe there's anything supernatural between this trifling accident. No, no, of course not. I'll take off my dress and we'll go to bed. We'd better. Bird servants will be calling us for breakfast at seven. Look out this window. The farmers are still keeping their bonfires to drive the evil things away. Yeah, the idiots. For hundreds of years, they've believed the powers of hell are strong on this day of the devil's number. Dear, what's the matter with you? Oh, this huge spooky old house, I guess, and this old country. I'm being silly. Unhook my dress, please. I should say you are being silly. Now hold still. What's that? What? Outside in the hall. Listen. Sounds like footsteps. Footsteps of a lame man. Yes. It stopped outside. 
outside our door. Well, I wonder who... Well, I haven't seen any lame servants about the place. Now the steps are passing on. Oh, well, why should they have stopped here? I'm going to see. No, no. Don't open that door. Judith, let me go. Don't open that door. What's the matter with you? Those steps came from where we saw that chest of bones from which a foot is missing. Hey! in this hall. Yes. They stopped outside this door and then went on. I didn't imagine it, and I didn't. Oh, what's wrong with you? Wasn't it one of your servants out there? Anything with a single foot? Did it sound to you like a living human? No, no. No, it didn't. Have you both gone crazy? I think I have. For ever since your wife's blood fell on those ghastly bones, I'd be like a timid child in the dark. And since those footsteps came and went, I'm making terrified. Sure. Don't call me a fool. A coward, a man, but I can't help it. I've got to see what walking in this hall. Bert, come back here. He's running towards that tower. Your man's out of his mind. You've got to stop him. It was from there those footsteps came. Oh, the footsteps won't hurt him, but he's liable to fall through a hole in those rotten floors without a light. I'll get him. Harry, don't leave me. Nothing's going to hurt you. Call the servant. Tell him to bring Landon. I'll never be able to find Bert in this infernal blackness. Bert! Bert! Yes, yes, I'll call. I'll call. Peter! Peter! Come here, please! Don't scream. Gaze into my eyes and obey whatever I tell thee. You, you have no eyes. I see only a grinning skull, an awful skeleton that walks. You will see what my will demands. You will see the man I was in life. You, you are a man. I see that now. A man who wears a strange, ancient cloak. A man who has lost a foot. <laughs> Thou shalt act as my will demands. Thou shalt help me to become indeed a living man, you see. No. Yes. No. For the devil my master hath given thee to me. Come, come, I leave. Ye follow. I follow. Follow me and learn my master's power. Follow me and learn the magic of Drops of <laughs> Those bones are missing from their chest, Harry. They're gone. They're gone. Oh, someone's playing a practical joke. Those bones are gone because the legend's true. Because your wife's blood has brought that monster back to life. Oh, stop that, or you'll make me as crazy as you are. Now, leave me out of this darkness. I've got to see Judy. I've got to know that she's all right. Wait, did you hear that? What? I heard a door close. Back in the old North Tower. Why, I thought I did, too. That's where Eric had his laboratory, where he went to still their magic. Well, if we did hear a door, I'll not believe a dead hand closed it. What a fool I was to leave Judy. Oh, she'll be all right. Don't pay any heed to my imbecile his dear old man. Go on, here's the passage that leads to the lighted hall. You can see your door from here. Yeah. It's standing open where I left it. Judith probably has the servants with her now. Judith! Judy, dear! I found Bert and brought him back. Judith, why don't you answer me? Judith! Judith! She's not here. The room's empty. Good Lord! What are you staring at, Bert? What? Look, impressed in this carpet. This, this is the footprint of a skeleton. Of a single bony foot. That door we heard closed. Judith! Quick to the tower, man! The tower! To waste, my dear. Soon thy husband and the present master of this house will note thy absence and seek thee in this laboratory. But there is time enough. <laughs> there is time enough for that which thou wilt do. What must I do? First, first thou must prepare an altar to my master. <laughs> for fear of the curse, they have left this chamber quite unchanged. <laughs> in the scroll work of yonder bridge on the road, thou will find a carbon serpent. Oh, press, press it, head. I press. Uh, yes. A pillar opens. Put thy hand inside and draw forth two black candles. Black. <laughs> black for the worship of my master. Now, place, place them here. Place them here. They are placed. Now, now from the sacred cupboard, take the tinder box and light them. Oh, my hands. 
Oh, Satan! It's still useless for thy work. They are hands of the dead, and have no strength, no power. But thou hast restored my will, hast given me the means for my hands. Soon, by her death, <laughs> thou shalt give me back my life, old Satan. The I candles shall... are lighted. Bring forth yon earthen basin now, and the flask, the flask that lies beside it. <laughs> Unst up the flask and pour its contents in the bowl. It's the holy oil of hell. <laughs> oil from fat of newborn faith. <laughs> now, I sit here. I sit here between the candles. Now, now from the cupboard, take yon teenage knife and with it in thy hand, recline upon the altar. Now, now what? To be the sacrifice. Why <laughs> thy husband comes, but he will be too late. Hey, the door's locked. Why one side there do it? Don't do it. I'm not. Lie thou on the altar. I do as you command. Uh, I heard a voice. <laughs> the clock. The dead is in there too. The dead shall soon be alive. Warm blood shall enter his bones and the flesh again. Get on that. Break down the door. Break it. Oh, it's open. <laughs> Raise thy knife, woman, and strike it to thy heart. Oh, no, do no, no. uh, Raise not his voice. Obey it, sir. Obey it. Oh, no, 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 Give me from this woman. Make her give me all that flame within her veins. No! Oh, whatever! I call on hell! Right, woman! Right! I, I open you. Hold it! The door right. open! The door open! Right! I... I... Stop her! Right. Woman! Turn thy blade on them! Who I can't hold it in all the strength of hell! Of him! Right! Right! Oh, right. she's happy! Burn her knife with my arm! Ah, I have thy blood. Thou too will be in my power. Don't let those bony hands touch that arm. You'll be under his spell this year. I can't. Oh, my blood. My blood. Just not enough. And the toy at me. I've got a knife. I've got it. Now, look out. I've not the like of candle in this oil. Ah. Ah. The oil is spreading things all around the room. I am the only way to stop this monster. The one way to destroy him. Not this he escaped. Ah. He's not the blade. He's out the door. The dumb dumb bullets in that pistol were made by cutting a cross upon the notebook. A cross? Yes, a cross. The sign of heaven. We must get out of here and rouse the servants. Those flames can't be stopped now. And soon this house will fall as old Eric prophesied. Wait. Listen. The clock is striking. Midnight. The devil's day is over.
We bring you Creep by Night. dramatic explorations into the vast and unknown darkness of the human mind. Tonight, in the absence of Boris Karloff, who has been your host on this program of mystery, we take the opportunity to introduce the man who henceforth will serve as your guide and companion along the dark and often terrifying pathway of the unexplored. He will come to you only as a voice, since for reasons best known to himself, he prefers to remain anonymous. He stands before me now, ready to lead you into the dim and distant world beyond the realm of human understanding. Creep by night presents its master of mystery, Dr. X. I have been asked to serve as your master of mystery on these weekly pilgrimages into the unknown. To choose for you stories that peer deep into the tortured souls of men and draw aside the shadowy curtain of the mind. For the time being, I shall have to be known only as Dr. X. My identity cloaked in the very darkness of which we speak. Perhaps some of you will recognize my voice. If you do, I pledge you to secrecy. It will be my duty on this program to select for you stories that have been drawn from the mystery of life itself. From time to time, I will invite leading actors, men like Peter Laura, Bela Lugosi, Edmund Gwen, Basil Rathbun, and others, to participate in our dramatic explorations. But enough of talk. Join with me now as we see unfolded before us the weird chronicle of the walking dead. <laughs> take you to the Black Island of Haiti, deep in the Caribbean, to a coffee plantation some 40 miles from the city of Port-au-Prince. It is long after dark, and the night is hot and sultry, deadly quiet, save for the rhythmic beating of native drums off in the distance. At long intervals, a human voice cries out, rising above the drums like the dismal wailing of a lost soul. On the porch of the cottage adjoining the plantation office, a man stares out into the darkness, obviously waiting for something. Suddenly a car swings into the open gate, its headlights blazing. It pulls up before the cottage, and the gray-haired man, carrying a black bag, steps out. He mounts the steps, and the man waiting on the porch greets him. Dr. Nelson? Yes. I'm Walter Craig, manager of the plantation. Glad to know you, Mr. Craig. Sorry about being so late, but your call to the public health office somehow got lost in the shuffle. You've been under terrific pressure these last few days. Is it Doctor. Too late, eh? One of your foremen, wasn't it? Yes. He's still alive, but I don't think there's much you can do for him. Well, I'll try. Where is he? Across the road in that hut. But before you see him, I think I'd better tell you something about this. Go ahead. The man's name is LaRue. He's a Frenchman. He was released from the penal colony last April on probation. He came to me for a job, and I took him on because I needed help badly. I see. I put him in charge of a crew of native pickers, and he seemed to work out fine. He drove them hard, but he brought the crop in, and that's what counts. Uh-huh. Ten days ago, one of his crew was found dead in the field. Someone had hit the poor beggar over the head with a bailing hook and split his skull. Hmm. I questioned a couple of them, but, well, you know how they are. tight it. All I could learn was that LaRue had had an argument with the man just before the body was found. LaRue, of course, denied killing him. But that night, the Rada drums started a beat. They've been beating every night since. Why? The natives are certain the room murdered that beggar. They've been trying to put the hex on him. You hear that? It's the death whale. They know he's dying. They know it because they're killing him. Oh, now, hold on, Craig. It's all right to talk about native customs and black magic, but you can't kill people by beating drums and wailing. Doctor, how long have you been in Haiti? Six months. But what difference does that make? I've been on the island for 15 years, and I've learned one thing. 
There's a great deal that goes on down here that we know nothing about. That we can't explain. Oh, now, we... You can call it voodoo or black magic or anything you wish. But it's there. Let me tell you what happened. Go ahead. But the more they beat those drums at night, the more LaRue drove the devils during the day. I warned him to lay off, but he laughed. The night before last, I caught two of them sprinkling graveyard dirt around his hut. What's graveyard dirt? They believe that dirt dug from around a corpse can maim and kill. That's rubbish. Maybe it is. But remember this. These natives are experts on poison. They use dogwood root and bamboo dust, both deadly and with no known antidote. They use dried and powdered lizards and some stuff they get out of the gallbladders of alligators. Maybe there is something in graveyard dirt. I don't know. I doubt it very much. Well, at any rate, after I caught those two, I told Lou he'd better get off the island if he knew what was good for him. He said he'd think it over. But they didn't give him a chance. This morning, he couldn't get out of bed. His legs were paralyzed. I watched him all day, and the paralysis kept creeping up his body. He can scarcely breathe now, and he can't talk. All he does is mumble. That's strange. Let's get a look at him. I'd better tell Miss Carlyle you're here. She'll probably want to come along. Incidentally, she doesn't know anything about this except that LaRue is sick. Who's Miss Carla? Her father owns this plantation. He died back in the States last month. She came down a week ago to look things over. She's inside the cottage. I'd rather not have a woman present when I examine him, Craig, if it can be helped. Well, all right. Follow me. Wait a minute. What's the matter? The drums. They've stopped. That's fine. They were beginning to get on my nerves. Come on. No, wait. Do you hear anything? Low voices and the shuffling of feet? No. I do. I'd better get a flashlight. Good Lord. What's that? I thought something was wrong. They surrounded the little hut. That's Miss Carlyle. Excuse me a minute. I'm out here on the porch. What's happening? All of a sudden, those drums and that chanting... Oh, there's someone with you. It's Dr. Nelson of the public health office in Port of Prince. How do you do, Miss Carla? Oh, I'm so glad you're here, Doctor. What's going on out there, Mr. Craig? The natives have surrounded LaRue's hut. Why? I don't know. We'd better get to him, Craig, before they do some damage. That racket certainly can't have a dying man. It's too late now. Too late? What do you mean? There's only one way to get along with the natives down here, Miss Carlisle. Don't interfere with them. Leave them alone. That's all well and good, Craig, but you say a man's dying in that hut. I may be able to do something for him. Of course, it's ridiculous. Order them back to their cabins, Mr. Craig. They won't take orders now. They're wild with religious fervor. That chanting you hear goes back a thousand years to when there were savages in the jungle. Do you mean to say that you're going to stand Just by... Just a minute, Miss Carlisle. I'll send the houseboy over to see what's going on. See inside? Yes. Bravo! What's not? I don't quite understand why you can't order them away, Mr. Craig. You'll understand if you're down here for any length of time. Here comes the houseboy. You call him, Mr. Yes, Bravo. Go over to LaRue's hut and see what's happening. No, mister, no. No can go. Him make book or chant. LaRue, le more. Book or make le more. What's he saying? He says LaRue's dead. That's the book or chant we're hearing. They're going to take his body away. They're going to turn him into a zombie. Oui, mister. Zombie. Of all the ridiculous nonsense. What's a zombie? What are you talking about? A zombie, Miss Carlyle, is a corpse that's been brought back to life. Down here, they call them the walking dead. Do you mean to stand there and tell me that you believe that? I don't believe or disbelieve, Miss Carlyle. All I know is that for centuries, the natives of Haiti have conducted weird rites. Sober here, I'll tell you. Some of their ceremonies that make your hair stand on end. Is that any reason for letting a man die with savage drums beating in his ears? He's already dead. How do we know? They never used a folk or chant except over a corpse. Now, look, Mr. Craig, I own this plantation and you're employed by me. And I insist that you order those natives away from their house. Don't lose your temper, Miss Carl. I'm not losing my temper, Listen but I... Listen to me a moment. I've had 15 years of Haiti. 15 years of learning how to get along with native help. You're not in the United States now. This isn't Georgia, Alabama. It's the West Indies. You're a foreigner in a strange land. Land where the roots of voodoo and black magic grow deep and strong. We know all that, Craig, but the fact still is... Just a minute, Doctor. I've seen men disappear on this island. Vanish off the face of the earth. They were men who laughed at native superstition just the way you're laughing at it. Don't be stupid, Mr. Craig. Nobody's laughing. We're trying to save a man's life. Why did you call Dr. Nelson from port of prince if you didn't intend him to examine the roots? Yes. Forty miles is a long way to come to listen to native drums. Neither of you can understand what I'm driving at, can you? All I know is that a human being is lying in that hut, deathly sick. 
when I saw him this afternoon, he was in pitiful condition. Oh, Buddy's denying that, Miss Carlyle. Now you say he's dead. Just because you hear some chanting and some drum beating. And you refuse to order those natives away so the doctor can examine them. It isn't that I refuse. It's simply Never mind. That... If you won't order them away, I will. Miss Carlyle, come back. Miss Carlyle. Please, don't let her go over there alone. Quick, doctor, after her. We'll never find her this way, Craig. We'd better go back to the house and phone for help. We've got to find her. I don't trust those devils tonight. I never saw anything like it. She ran across the road toward the hut, and before we could get to her, they swallowed her up like an avenging cloud. And then they were gone. That's how they work. Did they take LaRue's body with them? Yes. Come on. We'll take a chance and bust in on that ceremony. I may be able to keep them in check. Are you sure it's safe? I'm not sure about anything. Keep that flashlight off. I don't want them to know we're coming. Let's go. You know, it's always been a mystery to me why the authorities haven't stepped in to control these natives. They've tried, but it doesn't work. This stuff is a religion with them. That's no excuse for killing and kidnapping. They only kill when someone has done them harm. A rule had it coming to him. What about Miss Carla? She tried to interfere in one of their sacred ceremonies. Hold up a minute. Huh? I can see the light of their torches. Where? Over behind their shacks. See them flickering? Oh. Yes, I see them now. What is the devil? It's enough to make your blood run cold. That poor girl, if she's alive, must be out of her mind. Let's get a little closer. And keep your eyes open. They move like ghosts in the darkness. You can't hear them until they're on top of you. I certainly never expected to be stalking natives when I joined the public health service. I'll tell you that. Let's go. Let's sneak up behind the shacks and see what they're doing. All right. Incidentally, Craig, how many of them do you think there are? About 200. Good Lord. Under ordinary circumstances, they're quiet and peaceful. Oh, I should have known better than to keep Laru on the plantation. All this is his doing. Well, it's too late now to blame anyone. Over this way, Doctor. Crouch down. There. You can see him now. Hold up. They're all kneeling in a circle. Except the one in the middle. Who's he? The Bokor, I guess. The head man. Oh. They stop chanting. Now what? I don't know. Anything can happen. Don't move. It's a new chant. He's asking the questions and answering. I've heard that before. I don't like the sound of it. Look, Doctor, you stay here. I'm going to walk right into that circle. You'd better be careful, Craig. That automatic isn't going to be much help against 200 maniacs. Still, I'm going to tear you to pieces. I doubt it. Anyway, it's worth a chance. Oh, wait, I'd better go with you. No, this isn't your affair. It's mine. In case I do run into trouble, come back to the house as fast as you can and put in a call to the police. Yes, I will. Okay. Wish me luck. Good luck, Craig. <laughs> what was that? It's Sobo. He's crawling up behind us. I wondered what had happened to him. Go back out. Back to here. We've got to find the girl, Sobo, the missing lady. No, 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 no. Booker man make kill chat. That. What did he say? That chant. It's the kill chant. Go back. Sobo bring missy lady. You know where she is? Sobo find. Is she alive? Ask him. Missy lady lives, Sobo. Sobo find. Sobo bring back. Go. All right. Come on, doctor. Back to the house. I tell you, Craig, I don't trust your houseboy. It's been almost an hour since he sent us back here. The drum stopped beating long ago. He's always been trustworthy. He's been with me 15 years. Let's see if that phone works now. Maybe we can get through to port of print. What good will it do? They can't get here in less than an hour. And anyway, the whole police department couldn't tackle 200 of them. Hello? Hello? Ah, there's something wrong with the line. I've got a feeling we'll never see that girl again, Craig. Dead or alive. I want her not to interfere. Why didn't she listen to me? Why didn't she stay where she belongs, back in the state? How would I have enough trouble down here without this? Now, now, don't lose your head, Craig. Take it easy. Raving and ranting isn't going to get us anywhere. I suggest we go out there and look for her again. The drums and the chanting have stopped. Maybe they'll calm down. I'll go out. You get into your car and drive over to the Larimore Plantation. It's about ten miles from here on the road to port of Prince. Get some help. You think there's time for that? Where are you at, foreman? They're both in port of Prince loading a coffee cargo. It would be away tonight of all night. So anyway, I think that's the best plan. You go for help, and I'll see if I can locate Sobo. Wait. I hear someone coming, Craig. Don't open the door. Why not? I'll open it. I've got a gun. <laughs> Who is it? Who's out there? Go on, Missy. I bring Missy Lady back, my... Get the flashlight off the table, Doctor. It's my houseboy. He's got Miss Carlisle. Good Lord. Where is she? Come on. Now you're inside, Sobo. Get you be safe. Flash your light on the steps, Doctor. Yes, I am. Easy, Sobo. Easy. Watch the steps. The drums are beating again. Let them beat. <laughs> All right, carry her in, Sobo, and put her on the couch. Close the door, Doctor. Be sure it's locked. Yes, all right. Put her down, Sobo, carefully. Let me look at her, Craig. In the meantime, get some water. Water, Sobo. We may... You're all right now, Miss Carlyle. 
Just relax. Open my bag, Craig. You'll find some spirit for the moon. Right. There, now. Just relax. There you are. Oh, thank you. Now, just breathe deeply, Miss Carlyle. That's fine. Once more. There we are. Here comes the water. Oh, pour some in the glass. Put it on the table, Sobo. We need you. You feel better now, don't you? Yes. There you are, Doctor. Oh, thank you. Now, drink this, Miss Carlyle. Here, I'll hold your head up. There, now. Just lean back. It was horrible. Simply horrible. I don't think you better talk for a while. I've got to tell you. They put his body in a grave. An open grave. A roof? Yes. What happened when you ran across the road toward the hut? I, I don't know. Suddenly they were surrounding me. I could see their teeth flashing in the darkness. I screamed, and that's all I remember until I woke up. Yes. I was lying on the ground. They were all kneeling around the grave. His body was in it. There was a torch burning, and one of them was chanting. Bokor, make the lamoon ceremony. What's that? Sobo says the man chanting was the Bokor. The one who makes the dead rise and become zombies. Oh, well, I think we've had enough of native superstition tonight, Craig. Let's stick to the facts. How did you get away from them, Miss Carlyle? Oh, no one was watching me. They were all watching the body in the grave. I I crawled off in the darkness, and Sobo found me, brought me back here. Yes, well, it's all over now. You had us worry for a while. I think you'd better try to get some sleep. I, I can't sleep. All I keep seeing is that poor man's body. Don't think about it. But isn't there anything we can do? Isn't there some way of giving him a decent burial? You might as well know what this is all about, Miss Carlyle. LaRue murdered one of the natives. Oh. Murdered him ten days ago. They've been out to get him ever since in their own way. That's why the drums were beating every night. I told you it was their usual ceremony, just so as not to frighten you. But it was more than that. They were seeking revenge. And now they've got it. You mean because he's dead? That's only part of it. They're going through the zombie ritual now. That's what you saw at the open grave. According to their belief, they can bring LaRue back to life. Make him a living corpse who'll obey their orders. Well, then why were they putting his body in a grave? That's part of the ceremony. They bury him until midnight. Then the corpse rises as a zombie. That's right, isn't it, Sobo? Why, it's the most ghastly thing I ever heard of. And the most ridiculous. I wouldn't be too sure about that, Dr. Nelson. How long does the, the person remain a zombie? As long as they want him to. The Bokar, the head man, controls that. They can stop it at will. How? You're asking me questions I can't answer, Doctor. Questions I wouldn't even attempt to answer. But this much I know. There are zombies on this island right now. How they came into being, I don't know. But they're here. I don't believe it. I hope I never have to prove it to you, Doctor. Do these these zombies talk and, and act like human beings? No. It's a, it's a horrible thing to say, but they look dead. Their eyes are hollow and their skin has no color. They walk like people in a dream. Heavy-footed and leaden. When they try to speak, all that comes out is weird mouthings. It isn't very pleasant, I can assure you. And that's what they're going to do with LaRue? I suppose so. Why? Revenge. As I told you, he not only killed one of them, but he drove them unmercifully. Once he's a zombie, they'll drive him, make him sweat. He'll become their slave. Do anything they order. You know that's nonsense, Craig. I'm not so sure, Doctor. Have you ever seen a zombie a living corpse? Only once. And I never want to see another. You mean there are actually people who've been raised from the dead? Of course not. You can take it from me as a physician that death is final. Absolutely final. Perhaps throughout the rest of the world. But not in Haiti. Now listen, Craig. All you men seem to do is frighten this girl. I think perhaps the best thing, Miss Carlyle, would be for you to drive back into Port-au-Prince with me. Just midnight. We'll be there at one thirty. How about it? I... I don't know. It's a good idea. Chances are nothing's going to happen, but... I'll just go Step on porch. He says he heard steps on the porch. Don't be alarmed. I don't hear anything. Be the Step. Where's the flashlight? I have it here in my pocket. Wait. Don't move. What's that? Sobo's right. Someone is on the porch. You stand over there with a the flash, Doctor. Right. Get back, Sobo. I'll open the door. No, no, no. no. Stand back, I said. Please, listen. Take him into a bedroom and come back here. Hurry. Yes, come, Miss Carlyle. Oh, please, please, don't open the door. Get out of here, Doctor. Come, my dear. Come on. Hey, 
There's nothing to be afraid of. Somebody, somebody. I know, but we'll take care of him. Dr. Nelson. Yes, yes, I'm coming. Stand back, Sobo. That's it. Just call out right now, Craig. Good. Now, stand behind me a little to the left and keep that flashlight on the door. You're not serious about it being a zombie, are you, Craig? Whatever it is, it didn't sound human. All set now? Yes. All right. I'm going to open the door. Keep that light steady, Doctor. The door is locked, you know. I locked it when we came I in. I know. Craig, perhaps it might be better to... Don't worry, there are six bullets in this automatic. That should be enough. Get ready now. Here goes. There's nobody out there. Careful, Craig. is empty. Are you sure? Positive. Come on there with that flashlight. You too, Sobo. We heard heavy footsteps, didn't we? And that weird moaning? Yes, but there's no one here now. Flashlight around. That's it. See anything? No. Not a thing. Well, there may be some footprints in the driveway. Let's check. It's hard to tell at night. There's a good clear print. Well, that could be mine when I got out of the car. Matter of fact, it is. I suggest, Craig, that we lock up and remain in the house until daylight. No sense taking chances. Probably the best idea. What I don't understand is... Good Lord, that's Miss Carlisle. Come on, Bravo, follow me. What room is she in? She's at the end of the hall. What happened? The window. He was standing at the window. Who was standing at the window, Miss Carlisle? No. No, no. Yes. I've never seen anything so horrible. You're sure it wasn't your imagination? Oh, no, no, I saw his face. It was like a death mask. His lips were blue and his skin was ghostly white. Good Lord. Bravo. You stay here with Miss Carlisle. The doctor and I are going out front. If you see or hear anything, yell. Come on, Sammy. Please don't go far. We won't. Come on, doctor. What do you make of it, Craig? I don't know what to make of it. Do you think she really saw someone at the window? Wouldn't be a bit surprised. Watch those porch steps. I noticed one of them's a little rickety. What do you propose to do, Craig? Take a look around. Stick close and keep that light swinging. That's fine. I really think we'd be much better off if we locked all the windows. Hold up. What is it? I thought I heard someone moving up ahead. Swing your light slowly to the left, across the road. Easy. Easy. Hold it. Lord in heaven, it's a man staring at us. It's Lolo. He's running away. Keep your light on him. Lolo! Lolo! Stop for our shoot! <laughs> you missed him. He's ducking in the hut. His own hut. We've got him now. The two front windows and the door are the only exit. Come on. Right. All right. It's far enough. You take the gun, doctor. I'll go back to some rags and some oil. Rags and oil? What for? I'm going to set that hut on fire. Craig, are you out of your mind? You can't burn a man alive. What makes you think he's alive? He's got to be alive. We saw him running. You still won't admit that strange things happen here on the island, will you? Strange, yes. All but... right, if you think he's alive, we'll take him alive. Get down low and crawl towards that hut. Keep your light out. Ready? Yes. Yeah. Now the hut's open. When we get close enough, flash a light through. You see, you can't get out any other way. No. The door or the front windows. I'm watching them all. If this 38 doesn't stop him, nothing will. Is this far enough? I think so. I'm ready if you are. Go ahead. Flash the light through the open door. The hut's empty. No, it isn't. He's stretched out on the bed. See him? Oh, yes. What's he doing that for? I don't know. Keep the light on him. Come on. This may be a trap, Craig. Be careful. I'm watching him. Hold the light steady. Steady as I can. Are we going to the hut? Yes. Come right behind me. Hold the light, Craig. Let me get a look at him. Keep it on his face. Miss Carlyle was right. His lips are blue and his skin is ghostly white. Are you sure this man is LaRue, your foreman? Yes. I can't believe it. What do you mean? Is this the man we saw running into the hut? Yes, of course. And you were right. Evidently, strange things do happen on this island. They do? Yes, Craig. This man has been dead for three hours. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. 
down to the depths with a veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of the Shadow People. Elaine, have you been? I mean, have you seen anything else since you spoke to me last? No, I haven't. Ever since Mother died, nothing's happened. Well, I only hope. That... It came from upstairs. Come on. Oh, I don't know what to think. I only hope that... Oh, David. David, if anything's happened to him... I'm... We'll see in a moment. There's a light in this room. You wait here, Elaine. Where's the light? Over to your left. David. What's wrong? Why didn't you leave the light on? Your father's dead, Elaine. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Shadow People. And now for our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Shadow People. Somewhere along the line of your life, you've met them. You have come in contact with The Shadow People. When did we first discuss it? Oh, yes, Brian and Elaine and I. It was in my apartment. There was only one light on in the entire place. Oh! What's wrong? Oh! Elaine, what's the matter? Oh, it's, it, it, it's silly, I know, but I, I, I thought I saw something in that doorway over there. Where? Over there, right over there. Where are you going, David? Over to that archway, just to let you know that nothing's here. Huh. You see, Elaine, nothing's wrong, nothing at all. Are you satisfied that there's no one else here but us? Yes, I... Oh, I'm sorry. I just thought that I... Leave the overhead lights on. I'm sorry. I thought that... Put them back on, David, please. All right, Elaine. Well, what's bothering you, sis? I don't know. It's just that... I don't know. Tell us about it, Elaine. Tell us what's bothering you. You promise that you... You won't laugh at me? Of course not. Brian? Oh, Elaine, I'm your brother. If something's troubling you, uh, I'd like to know about it. All right, then. The reason I was so upset was the fact that I saw someone or something standing in that archway. But Elaine, David showed you that there was no one else in here. When the lights were put on, you saw for yourself if we were alone. I'm not talking about something you you can see in the light, Brian. I'm not talking about a human being. Then what's it all about, Elaine? In the darkness, I, I saw something that can't be seen in a lighted area. And I've seen it several times before. You're sure you're not imagining this, Elaine? Oh, I don't have that good an imagination, Brian. How long have you... Have you seen this thing, Elaine? Well, it... It started about six weeks ago. You were in Detroit on business, Brian. Mom and Dad were on vacation. I was in the house by myself. In the library. There was only one light on. I sat in the chair beneath it, reading. Several times I thought that something was watching me. I felt there was someone in the room with me, standing right in back of me. Every so often, I'd glance back over my shoulder, but there seemed to be nothing there. And then, then I thought I heard someone whispering. I wasn't sure, but when I heard it again, I got up and I, I, I looked all over the house. Oh, I'm not easily frightened, you know that, but, but out in the hallway... It was almost entirely black. Luckily, I was near a light switch. I looked back over my shoulder, and I saw this huge, hulking shape for the first time. And I heard a voice. Or rather, the whisper of a voice. I couldn't distinguish the words, but that dark shape seemed to be moving towards me. My hand was on the light switch, and I turned it on. In a minute, the light flooded the hallway. The shape was gone. There was nothing there. I was alone again. As long as there's light, I know it can't hurt me. I know it can't reach me. You might have imagined it, you know. Of course, that's possible, but I'm sure I didn't. It was so real. So real, that shape in the darkness. It was the very essence of evil itself. <laughs> 
There was an old man I knew of, a Dr. Hesedius. I'd heard that he knew quite a good deal about the supposed supernatural manifestations which had taken place in the world. I went to him to see if he knew anything that might explain the events of the story Elaine had told us. Yes, my good sir. What do you wish? I have an appointment with us, Dr. Cecilius. Oh, yes. Yes, he mentioned something about it. You are Mr. Drake? Yes. If you come inside. Thank you. Dr. Cecilius is in the study. Please come with me. Doctor, a visitor for you. Oh, yes. Bring him in. You may go now. Yes, Doctor. Mr. Drake? Yes. Sit down, please, in that chair over there. Thank you, sir. Now, what is the nature of your visit to me? Well, I understand, Dr. Vesedius, that you have a great knowledge of the supernatural manifestations which have occurred on the earth. Great knowledge, Mr. Drake? No, hardly that. I have only scratched the surface in my years of study. Perhaps I can help you, but again, perhaps I cannot. Well, may I tell you the story? By all means, my good sir. All right. Now, this didn't happen to me, Doctor, but to my fiancée. It seems that about six weeks ago, when she was alone, when the light was on, the dark form disappeared. And that's the story, sir. As much of it as I can remember. Mm-hmm. I see. It's a strange tale you tell. I'm fully aware of that, Dr. Cecilia. You say she seemed to hear whispered voices? Yes, that's what she says. I see. A moment, please. I have a book in my file. Oh, yes. Here it is. This is the one. Yes, Perhaps I may be able to help you after all. Let me see. This is a very ancient book, Mr. Drake. I seem to remember... Yes. Here is an account of a happening such as you relate. And we shall live on the earth... And they shall not see us. Yes, it has been foretold by the ruler of the darkness. They who live by day... Retire to sleep by night shall never know that we walk with them, that we watch them, that we wait for our chance. Only in the night will they see us, for in the daylight we are not seen. Only in the night, when the darkness grows together and the forms of the shadow people are shaped from the blackness, they will know us. Then they will know that we are their companions, for we are the shadow people. I knew I had read something similar to the story you have told me, Mr. Drake. Dr. Acilius, what can we do? Well, give me a little time. Let me see if I can find any more references to these uh, people of the darkness. One more thing, Mr. Drake. Be sure that your fiancé is never left alone at night. Be sure that there is some living thing, animal or human, which accompanies her every second of the night. For she is in danger, Mr. Drake. A terrible danger. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Shadow People. That night, the night of the day I had seen Cecilius, Elaine's mother died. She died in her sleep. When she failed to appear for breakfast, Elaine's father went upstairs to see what was wrong. When he entered her room, he discovered that she was dead. The family doctor couldn't explain it, for Elaine's mother had been in perfect health. A few weeks later, I was out of the house spending a weekend with them. I glanced at the clock in the mantel, and it showed 11. I can't understand why Brian hasn't returned from town. Well, he said he had some extra work to catch up on. He told me this morning that he might be late. Well, 11 o'clock, I'm going upstairs. 
Glad you came out, David. Good seeing you again. It's a pleasure to be here, sir. Well, don't stay up too late. See you both in the morning. All right. Good night, Dad. Good night, Mr. Davis. He isn't the same, David. Ever since Mother died, he hasn't been the same. I didn't realize that until the night. He's changed. I only hope that he'll start living again. Ever since she died, it seems that a part of him died with her. Elaine, have you been... I mean, have you seen anything else since you spoke to me last? No, I haven't. Ever since Mother died, nothing's happened. Well, I only hope... That... What's that? Came from upstairs. Come on. You don't think... I don't know what to think. I only hope that... David. David, if anything's happened to us... We'll see you in a moment. There's no light in this room. You wait here, Elaine. Where's the light? Over to your left. Why didn't you leave the light on? Your father's dead, Elaine. <laughs> I had walked into the darkened bedroom. On the bed was Elaine's father. It didn't take a second look for me to note that he was dead. I switched off the light and walked back into the hallway to tell Elaine what happened. And then from the room there had come an eerie, quiet laughter... In the darkness of that room was some unknown evil power. The voice itself was unearthly. There was no substance to it. It sounded as if... as if it came from the darkness itself. No. No, I don't believe you. It's the truth, Elaine. There's nothing more I can do. We'll have to notify the police. Tell me it's not the truth, David. Tell me it's not true. I'm sorry, Elaine. I wish I could. Your father's dead. After the burial, Dr. Hesselius got in touch with me. He said that he wanted to meet both Elaine and Brian, that he wanted to talk to the three of us. Accordingly, a few nights later, he came out to their house. Stavis, will you tell me just when you saw the first manifestation? The night Brian was in Detroit. Now, Miss Davis, you have even seen this apparition in the company of other people, is that correct? Yes. The night at David's apartment. All right. Now I'll tell you what I think. You are in deadly danger, Miss Davis. These beings want to claim you. So far, they have had no success. Only in the darkness do they have power. Little by little, step by step, they have been removing the obstacles in their way to reaching you. First your mother, and then your father, Miss Davis. Both died in the same fashion. In the darkness, death struck at them. Now tell me, do you feel their presence here in this room as I talk to you? Yes. Turn out the lights, Brian. Stand by the switch, if you please, Brian. If anything happens, turn the lights back on. All right. Dr. Vesilius, I don't... Do you want me to continue working with you? Yes, sir. All right, then. Brian, turn off the lights. Yes, doctor. The room now is in darkness, Miss Davis. Do you feel or see anything? No, I... Yes. Yes, I do. Do you see anything? Yes. Doctor, I don't... Be quiet, you fool. I know what I'm doing. In front of me. The darkness gathering together into a huge, terrible... Not only do you see us, Miss Davis, but everyone else in the room also will see the vague shapes forming themselves in the blackness. We do not want you, Dr. Cecilius. The girl we want. We advise you to drop this case. You'll only bring down the wrath of the shadow people upon your head. The girl. We want the girl. Do not stop us. Let us take her now. Turn on the light. They're gone. Miss Davis, are you all right? Yes. Yes, I am. Just as she said. The darkness. I, I saw it form into something, too. So did I. What are we going to do, Dr. Hesselius? At the present moment, I don't know. But it's much I do know. You must leave this house immediately. You must try to get out of their reach. I don't know if that is possible. I hope it is. I shall have to return to my home. I must learn if there is some manner by which we can defeat these 
creature, sir. For the moment, leave this house. Dispose of it in any manner you may see fit, but leave this house. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Shadow People. We spent the night in my apartment, the three of us. The following day, Brian and Elaine made arrangements to dispose of the house. In the afternoon, Dr. Vesilius called me and asked that I come to see him. David, I'm glad you're here. Anything new, Doctor? Yes and no. You realize, of course, that this spiritual manifestation is not new, that it has gone on for centuries. No, I wasn't aware of that. It's true, David. De Maupassant wrote uh, what was supposedly a fiction story about the manifestation, David. He called it uh, the Orla. However, according to the information here on my desk, it was taken from an actual case history. Of course, he embroidered the story... Added a few touches to something he didn't realize actually existed. But have you found anything with which we can fight them? Everything depends upon an answer I received from a colleague of mine in Paris, Dr. Henri Renault. I dispatched a telegram to him last night. Well, why hasn't he answered by now? There are certain things that must be done. It will take a few days, I'm afraid. We have to wait, David. There's nothing else we can do. <laughs> In the next few days, the house was sold, and Brian and Elaine moved into a newer, more modern home a few miles from my apartment. Cecilia said it might take a few days for them to build up their power. I spent the night at the new house. The lights were left on, and I watched for any unusual occurrence. In the daytime, I'd return to my apartment and get some sleep. About four days after Elaine and Brian moved into the new house, I was at home when Cecilia phoned me. Hello? David? Yes, Dr. Cecilius? I hate to tell you this, David. What's the matter? What's wrong? They were a step ahead of me, David. I just received word that Renault died or was killed at the very moment I sent the telegram to him. Step by step, they had outwitted us. For they had anticipated every move we'd make. Even Dr. Cecilius was at a loss as to what to do. He agreed to meet me at the Davis house. What did you want to say us about, Dr. Cecilius? Did you find out anything more? I'm sorry to say that I haven't. At the moment, I'm at a complete loss. I don't know what to do. But what did you want to see us about this evening? Merely to check, to see if anything else has happened. Miss Davis, have you seen or heard anything? Not in the house. Only in my dreams. Your dreams? Yes. When I go to sleep at night... In my dreams, in the darkness, I see them. And it's grown worse, much worse. I was hoping that it would not have progressed so far. There has been no disturbance in this house, but now they disturb your sleep, Miss Davis. Now, you must stay awake for as long as you can. I want the three of you to move into my house. Perhaps that will give you more protection. That night, we moved over to Vesilius' house. Perhaps Elaine would have more protection there. From there, we might be able to devise some plan of action, some way to beat those beings. For a few days, things were quiet. The shadow people seemed to have withdrawn. For a while, I thought that we might have succeeded in thwarting their purpose. Elaine no longer complained of troubled sleep. But that condition lasted for a few days only. About ten days later... They made themselves known and felt again. That night, we were in the study. When suddenly, Cecilius whirled around and... Elaine, what are you looking at? Outside the house. I threw the light waves off. I see them. She's right, Dr. Cecilius. I can see them, too. What should we do, Doctor? Nothing. What do you mean, nothing? There's nothing we can do. We can't just... We can't do anything, Brian. Don't you understand that they have us at their mercy? Greatest man in my field was Henri Renault. If he could do nothing against them... What do you think we can do? He's right, Brian. There's nothing we can do. As long as the house remains lighted, just so long will they remain outside. If the lights were to... 
That sound. Oh, my father was killed. The same sound. We heard the same sound. The light. What's happened to the oh, light? All right. Be quiet, please. I thought of this emergency. A candle. That's right, Miss Davis. As long as this burns, this one candle will be safe. For they cannot advance into the light. They are limited by the darkness. As long as the candle burns, they will have to remain outside of this room. <laughs> Around you, in every room of the house, in the darkness outside, we are around you. This time you shall not escape. This time we will claim you. Take it easy, Brian. I, I can't stand it. I'm getting out of here. Brian, come back. Don't be a fool. I'm going after him. Stay here. We just can't let him he go. He won't have a chance. I doubt if you... <laughs> Miss Davis, I'm afraid that your brother is dead. <laughs> The wind, Doctor. Listen to the wind. I know. Yes, Doctor. Listen to the wind. You must realize by now that the three of you haven't a chance. You must know in your minds that we can destroy you at any moment we desire. But, Dr. Hesselius, you may still save your own life. Let the others go. Give them to us. No. No, you will have to take all of us. Shall we destroy your light? Shall we move in on you now? <laughs> as you will. Do as you will. <laughs> Characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. search of the finest of its kind, we bring you the tops in Spine Chillers. The Creaking Door. The 
manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Filter King cigarettes take pleasure in presenting The Creaking Door. Caretaker warns. Oh, I've heard about blokes like you. Read about grey floppies. I never thought I'd come across one. Yeah, I've sent for the cops, young man. Don't you try no rough stuff. I'm a match for you any day. But you don't understand. Hey. I tried to save his life and now it's too late. Hey, don't you give me that. This fellow was given a decent Christian burial. You desecrated. Desecrated, you say? Isn't it desecration to bury a man while he's still alive? Yeah, hey, hey, what you talking about? You don't think people go around being buried alive these days, do you? I don't know what to make of you. Hey. I watched you this afternoon. I, I thought you looked a bit uh, peculiar. I knew what you was doing at a pauper's burial. You shouldn't have had a pauper's burial. You shouldn't have been buried at all. I could have saved you. Hey, you better think up a good story. Something told me that you was up to no good. No, no, no. Don't you try to rush stuff. I've already warned you. I watched you. The police are on their way. Breaking open a coffin like that. Eh? I knew you was up to something, but I never thought... It's because... Hey. Because I let him get buried alive and I was ashamed. Let him get buried alive for a measly 50 pounds. Now he's dead. Hey, you come out of a loony bin or something... Now that I've had a bit of look at you, you, you don't look like no grave robber. I'm not. Listen. What's he to you, this fellow we buried today, eh? Nothing. Except I'm responsible for his death. I touched him. He, he's cold. Cold as dead. He, he's only been in the ground a few hours. They don't stay cold like that. Sometimes we get an exhumation order. We have to dig him up, see? You'd be surprised how warm they get. He is dead, isn't he? I mean, I brought this piece of mirror with me. There's no breath. Look. <laughs> I don't have to look. He's been in the municipal wall for two days. He's given a pauper's burial. Now then, what's it all about, young man? I want to go home. He was dead all right when they buried him. But not when the ambulance took him to the morgue. You see, I know. You know? Or oh, is he a relative of yours? I never knew he existed until two days ago. I've been tramping the streets looking for work. I didn't want to go home. If you could call that one room bed sitter, let her now occupy a home. It was still ringing in my ears the things she shouted at me as I left her. I've come to the end of my tether. I've pawned everything. Look, look, even the wedding ring you slipped on my finger in the church. What did he say? And all thy worldly goods. <laughs> That's a laugh. You were going to share all your worldly goods, were you? Well, if you don't get some money or a job, I'm walking out on you, do you hear? I'm walking out on you and I'll go and live with my sister. At least I'll get some warmth and three square meals a day. Oh, don't say that, Lil. Was it my fault that I fell sick? That I'm not allowed to work in the factory anymore? I've tried, Lil. I really have. Everywhere I go, they look at me and say, no vacancies. Not my fault either. I warn you, Joe Harris. I can't take much more of this. I know, honey, I know. I'll get something today. Really, I will. I promise. <laughs> It was a promise I couldn't keep. Finding the payment. 
watching the dislike and fear in the eyes of the well fed as they said, no thank you. Fear that one day they might become like me. And then I saw him. I was cut into a duke's lane. Nothing on either side except a huge big wall. He was a short, fat little man. Our steps were loud in the quiet part of there. soon enough up. What does the guard do in a case like this? Beat it, you fool. Beat it with the first decent money you've had in months. Somebody will find him. Run! Leo. Joe! Joe, you've got some money! That's right, Leo. Two five-pound notes, thirty-one pound notes, and the rest in ten bum notes. It all adds up, adds up very nicely. Fifty quid in all. Oh, Joe, honey. Hi. How did you get this money? You didn't go and do anything silly, did you? Such as what? Rob a bank? I wouldn't know how to start. But how did you get it? You'll never believe it. Remember I told you that when I was in the sanatorium, there was a fellow there with the same lung trouble named Ted Brown? Yes. Well, uh, I lent him a quid. You lent him a quid? Well, I was... Well, I was still drawing my wages, wasn't I? We didn't know that the doctor wouldn't let me go back to the factory. It wasn't so bad then. All right, all right, Mother. What about this Ted Brown? Well, I'll meet him in the street, see? Says he'd been looking for me everywhere. Wanted to repay me the quid. Go on. Well, we goes into a pub to have a drink. Uh, there was a bookie there, and Ted said he'd had a hot tip for the double. Hit one nil, fifty smackers. Oh, Joe. Fifty smackers. Oh, I love you. Lil went to get some groceries and a couple of bottles of beer. I sat on the bed and had a further look at the wallet. Having taken the money out, I thought it would be empty. There were two pockets, both with plastic windows. The first held a card which said, Harold Maxted, 26 Fairley Street, Hornsey. And then I looked at the second plastic window. There were strange words printed on a white card. It said, I am not dead. I'm subject to a form of cataleptic illness which may appear to cause death. If I'm found, notify Dr. Alfred Miller, Hornsey, 6641. Oh. No, it can't be. Not dead. Cataleptic. What have I done? What have I done? They'll think he's... Oh, no. Telephone her. I must telephone her. But, Leo, she'll wonder where I've gone. I've... I've given all my money. Yeah, all right. Oh, thank you for the Here, suck these bottles from me, will you? Joe? What is it? What time is it, darling? I don't know. The pub was just opening. Just after six, I should say. Why? Give me ten bob to get me change. I need some silver. I have to telephone. I won't be long, though. What is it? Well, I've, I've just got to telephone someone. You're not going gambling, are you? You haven't got the buck. You're not betting on tomorrow's races or anything like that, are you, Joe? There are all those bills to be paid. I know, love, I know. No, I'm not gambling, but I need it, please. I'll be back in a little while. It, it's just that... Please, Lil. All right. Here you are. Joe! It's all right, love. Too late with the phone call. Would they bury this poor guy Max said, not knowing he was a cataleptic, thinking he was dead? <laughs> this is the model of the doctor's consulting room where he's passing out. Uh, 
can I speak to Dr. Miller, please? Dr. Miller's gone abroad. Well, he's been away for the last six weeks. Abroad? Oh, no. Have you taken over his practice, sir? No, I'm not a medical man. But if you're in need of a doctor, there must be plenty. Oh, no, no, isn't that... You don't know which hospital Dr. Miller was at? I'm afraid I can't help you. I must go. My wife's shouting. The dinner's on the table. I'm sorry. Thank you. And then another thought seared my brain. A hole in the ground. A long wooden box and the man being buried. Being buried alive. And a shovel. Heaping earth on the wooden boards. There must be a match to them in the telephone directory. There was. Fourteen maxteds. Everyone alive and bad tempered. No, I have little relatives who suffer from a cat and lip to kill us. Put a plenty of other maxteds in the book, try them. I have. You're Mr. Zachariah Maxted. You're the last on the list. Well, I can't help you. I go along to the police and say, Look, I stole the man's wallet. Somebody might be shoving him in six foot of earth. What do I do? I decided to sleep on it. Sleep? <laughs> That's a laugh. Oh, this very the line. Love you, Lou. Love you. Please. Pinching wine. They're putting me in a wooden box. And it's your fault, Joe Addis. I'm struggling for breath. They're going to bury me. Bury me deep. But not deep enough, Joe. Get me out of this or I'll make you suffer here on earth and in the beyond. about it pretty soon. Otherwise, the poor, unfortunate, cataleptic gentleman will be stiff with the cold. But let us see what he does do. Dave, I didn't know what to do. It was less than six hours since I saw that chap Paul. Maybe he's still there. Maybe if I go back to Duke's Lane, he'll still be lying there. Sorry, honey, I didn't want to wake you up. It's the night. Where are you going? I won't be long. No, Joe, you're not going anywhere. I thought you'd been acting strange. Oh, Joe, I know I've nagged you and threatened you, but it was only because you were getting so down, so beaten. I love you, Joe. I don't want you to be doing anything that will put you in prison. Uh, it isn't that at all. Well, what is it? All right, Lou, I'll, I'll tell you. And then you'll see why I have to go. So I told her. Told her the whole story of how I robbed a man I thought was dead. A corpse would have no use for the 50 quid in his wallet. So you see, I've got to find him. Or find out where they've taken him. But don't think he's dead, oh, Joe. Joe. Somebody will have found him by now. He's probably lying in bed fast asleep. People who have these sort of fits do recover. No, they don't. After I'd found all the maxes I could, I went into the Hornsby Library and I looked it up. Unless they get assistance, they can stay that way for days. By then, they'll... They'll bury him. And you know what that makes me? A murderer. I'm letting a man die for 50 quid. Oh, no, Joe. Why don't you phone the police station? Why don't you phone the Hornsby police station? Tell them the... Oh, no, Joe. You... Oh, no, you can't do that. They'll call you a thief and put you away. Look, I'm getting dressed. I'm coming with you. Where did you say it was? Do you say? Joe, let's pray still there. Well, that might be worse. He might have died for lack of attention. Let's pray someone saw him and took him to hospital and they realised he wasn't... wasn't dead. He's a copper. Uh, it's been nippy this time of the morning, isn't it? 
You're off night work. I am? What? Yeah, that's right. Oh, there was a little commotion in, in Duke's Lane a few hours ago, so, so my friend Phyllis told me. Uh, something happened in Duke's Lane. Oh, yes, yes. Just before I came on duty. Postman saw a bloke lying in the lane here. Dropped dead. Dead? They sure he's dead. So the police surgeon said. Why? Know anything about it? No. No, we don't know anything about it. It was just that... Well, we wondered if it was anybody we knew, that's all. Oh. Well, I believe they've identified him, all right. If you nip round to the station, they may be able to tell you. Oh, I don't think it's anybody we know. Oh, come on, lad. Too cold to stand here chatting. Let's go off to bed. You too, married? Yes. <laughs> he should have been in bed ages ago. Or rather, good morning. Let's go to the police station. Then. No, Joe, no. You have to explain about the wallet. Besides, this policeman doesn't really know. Please come home. But Lil... It's no good, Joe. We're going home. Come on. <laughs> Coffee, Joe. No, thanks. Well, it's no good. We've got to go to the police. We're committing murder. It's two days now. I didn't sleep a wink all night last night. Kept having nightmares. Hearing Maxted's voice pounding in my brain. Pounding my brain. Telling me to save him before it's too late. You're the only one that can save me, yes? They're burying me this afternoon. They're putting me in a coffin and they're going to cover me with it. If you allow this to happen to me, you're a murderer, Joe Harris. A murderer, do you hear? You'll be punished. 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 He kept saying I'd be punished. But you said yourself it's only a nightmare. All right, don't you go. I will. I'll say that I know... What was his name? Maxted. Harold Maxton. I'll say, I know him and he's a cataleptic. That's it. I'll go there right away. Excuse me. Oh, no. Aren't you the young lady I saw down Duke's Lane the other night? Yes, that's right. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. You know we were talking about someone who dropped dead that afternoon. Well, were you able to identify him? Yes, we were able to identify him, all right. Why? He's a cataleptic. He's not really dead, you know. Oh, don't be funny. I've got the card here. They're burying him this afternoon. He's in the Ornsey mortuary. Cardiac failure. This is the release for the body for him to be buried. Signed by the police surgeon, Dr. Herbert Spencer. He may have been a cataleptic. I don't know about that. But he died of heart failure. Being buried in a pauper's grave at Ornsey Cemetery, three o'clock this afternoon. Did die of heart failure, indeed. <laughs> Not dead. Oh, well, but... maybe I'm being a bit silly. Thank you, Constable. The death certificate was signed by the police surgeon. Oh, what did that copper know about cataleptics? Had the doctor known he was a cataleptic? I'm going to stop the burial. You can't, Joe, you can't. Won't you tell the police about that wallet? Where are you going, Joe? I don't know. Get drunk. I don't know anything anymore. Even my glass of beer went so in my mouth. I bought it with blood money. The blood that Harold makes it. I left the pub and walked. So they were burying him in a pauper's grave, were they? I didn't ask my feet to move towards the cemetery. It seemed as though they didn't belong to me. They were burying him as I got there. The minister, the grave digger, and an old man. Obviously the caretaker, plus a police sergeant. I wanted to shout, don't. Don't put him in that grave. He's not a corpse, he's alive. Couldn't. Those three stripes on a copper sleeve seem to represent a number of years I might get for stealing and for withholding information. I ran from the cemetery as though I were running from the vengeance of Maxted himself. Hello, Jack. They buried him, Miller. I saw them do it. A cheap wooden coffin. <laughs> oh, maybe it's a good thing the coffin was a cheap one. Maybe the death watch people got it in. Maybe there are holes in it. Maybe the poor swine will be able to breathe. <laughs> Fifty measly nicker. Fifty rotten pounds. And I've turned myself into a murderer. You will have a you too. They say you were part of the conspiracy. What have I done to you? What have I done to us? Nothing, Joe. All right, so you pinched his wallet when we were both starving. No one can have you up for, for murder. Well, it's beside the point now, isn't it, Lil? 
He's down there struggling for breath, isn't he? He won't be struggling for long. I don't know anything about cataleptics, but you can't be nailed inside a coffin underneath six foot of earth for long. <sighs> Look out the window, Lily. It's got dark already. It's winter, Joe. I know the grave, Bill. I'm going back. Joe. You're not going to stop me, Bill. I'm going back and I'm going to get him out of that grave. Please, Lily, I've got to. I'll come with you. Oh, no, no. I couldn't bear that. I've got to do this on my own. Suppose, suppose he's too heavy for you. You're not strong, Joe. It's a pauper's grave, Lil. They didn't take much trouble with him. Why, a pauper? There's all that money in his wallet. That makes it worse, doesn't he? Maybe they couldn't raise his relatives. What with his doctor gone away and everything. Here, Lil, get me that hammer out of the drawer. It's got that thing at the end for taking nails out. And, and that piece of mirror. All right. Here you are. You're right. But you know what you're doing. It's the only way, Lil. The only way. Uh, here I am, isn't it? It's too late. He's dead, all right. Blow me, young man. I wouldn't be in your shoes, not for nothing. Hey, just a minute. Uh, what do you say this bloke's name is? Maxted. Harold Maxted. Oh, no, it's not. Huh? Uh, this bloke's name is Sidney Fraser. Are you sure it's the same bloke? Positive. No, it's the same bloke. His accusing face follows me around, sleeping and waking. Oh, you young man, you come and have a look at me. We don't give him much of a tombstone, these paupers. There you are. Sidney Fraser. Born February the 6th, 1920. Died December 4th, 1967. Well, I've told you everything. They've given him the wrong name. Uh, well, you better tell that to the police constable. Oh, I'm sorry about this, young man. I warned you. Uh, I thought I was too old to tackle you on my own. When you started opening that grave, I ran to the cemetery office and phoned the police. Oh, well, it's almost a relief in a way. Hello. What's going on here? Oh, it's you again. Your missus was in the police station this morning with some nonsense about... Huh? You can have a grave, are you? Oh, there's something fishy going on. When I told my sergeant that your wife came in and said we were burying someone who was a cataleptic and not dead, he nearly strangled me. So I should have taken full particulars. So I ought to charge you both with causing a public nuisance. This fellow, Sidney Fraser, has had heart trouble for years. Huh? Sometimes an ordinary hospital had the pleasure of his company... More often than not, it was a prison hospital. Our police sergeant warned him that he hadn't got long to live. And your wife comes in with a cock and bull story about being him alive. As if we didn't know him. <laughs> Sidney Fraser. In his day, he was the finest pickpocket in Hornsey. Pickpocket? Uh, well, only the other day we had a complaint from Mr. Maxted that someone had stolen his wallet. <laughs> Bloke tossed him at a bus stop and then started running. <laughs> from his description, we knew it was Sid. <laughs> He picked Master's pocket. He wasn't a cataleptic. He was a pickpocket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You better pull yourself together. Uh, what are you doing here, and why is this grave open? Oh, constable. Our young friend here got a bit mixed up. I opened the grave to show him he was mistaken. Why did you ring the police saying there was a suspicious character lurking in the cemetery? Well, seems I was mistaken, that's all, constable. In fact, we were both mistaken. Weren't we, young man? Hey. <laughs> Big pocket. <laughs> Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> should have told Joe Harris that lifting wallets from cataleptic gentlemen is a most grave offense. In fact, it is likely to incur the most stiff penalty. <laughs> This 
is your host back again. Just a reminder of our rendezvous next week. Where are we going? Through the creaking door. Of course. <laughs> The manufacturers of State Express 3-5's Filter King cigarettes invite you to listen next Saturday at 9 o'clock when they will again present The Creaking Door. Theater of the Air. Now, the Hermit. Before you open it, we're not going to Blue Acres this weekend. We haven't had one weekend to ourselves since we were married. Oh, oh, Paul, it is Papa. I knew it. No, you don't understand. Here. Your father's seriously ill. Suggest you come at once. Dr. Lorry. Papa, Papa. Oh, now, take it easy, Marlene. He's never been ill a day in his life. Your father's getting along in years, darling. You can't expect him not to have some bad days. But Dr. Lorry says seriously ill... And he's usually terribly conservative. We must start at once. Oh, please understand me. I love my husband, Paul, very much. But up until the time I married, I had never left my father's side. We'd been inseparable. Ever since that dreadful morning, when as a little girl of eight years, my papa had taken me on his lap. And after kissing me tenderly and brushing the curls back from my forehead, he had said, Little doll, your papa has something very sad to tell you. But you must be very brave, my darling. Your mother has left us. She has written this note to inform us. To Terence and Marlene, life here at Blue Acres has grown intolerable for me. You're a little child, Marlene, and therefore I cannot explain some things to you. But Terence will know why I'm leaving. My little girl, try to think kindly of your mother. I would take you with me if I could, but that is impossible just now. Your father is a wealthy man, and he can give you fine things. I know at Blue Acres you will grow up to be a lady of whom I shall always be proud. And a daughter whom I will love forever. Do not cry, my little doll. Had your mother loved you, she would never have left you. From this day forward, there will be no mention of her name in this house. To us, she is dead. It was some years later that I learned that my beautiful mother had left Papa and me and had run away with Philip Court. A chap the town people said was a worthless dauber in paint. Nothing was ever heard of my mother or him 
after they left the wake. Nor did my father, Terence Lane, ever mention her name. He devoted his life to me. I had private tutors that came to Blue Acres to instruct me. The very best. Papa imported a master of the piano to teach me. We remained aloof from the world. The only woman in the household beside myself was Mrs. Eaton. Father always did the cleaning of the house. For Blue Acres is filled with priceless treasures. And when I would laugh at him dusting, he would always remark... Can't let her clumsy fingers touch this vase. It's worth a thousand dollars if it's worth a penny. The years moved on, and I lived in a world of my father's creation. Until this last summer when I was 21 years old. One glorious summer night when the moon made golden patterns on the terraced lawns of Blue Acres. And the waters of the colored fountains planted in the ground shot a million rainbow lights into the night. When the French doors of the music room were opened wide to let the cool night air enter in. I sat at the piano playing the works of one of my favorite composers, Debussy. not fond of Debussy, and as soon as I began playing, he got up from his chair and went to his study. But the haunting melancholy of Debussy suited me. It was a background to my dreaming, and the somehow lonely feeling of my heart that was growing stronger as the years wore on, with only Papa for my companion. I went on playing. Suddenly, I was aware of the presence of another in the room. I felt it strongly even before I turned around. Oh, please go on. It's beautiful. Suited to a night like this. Please. I'm sorry, but I don't Oh, don't, don't believe... be sorry. I'm the one who owes you an apology for my intrusion. I'm Paul Wilde. I'm spending my vacation at the Truesdales who live down the road a ways. Oh, yes. They told me there was a princess living at Blue Acres. But they didn't do you justice, young lady. No princess was ever quite so fair or lovely as you. Please, Mr. Wilde. The Tuesdales also added that a dragon named Terence Lane guards the Princess Marlene with his life. That was very unjust. Really? Well, then, if you're not zealously guarded, how about taking a stroll with me? The night is wonderful. And if you're good... I'll reach up and pick you a necklace of stars to wear. I'm sorry, Mr. Wilde. You won't go? It's late. And Papa would object? No. Well, then, with your kind permission, I'll call tomorrow afternoon to gain his consent for a date tomorrow night. Do I have your permission? Well, yes. Fine. Then do something for me now, will you? If I can. Play something for me as I walk away. Shall we have something light and joyous this time? Something more in tune with the happiness in store for you and me. I'll be listening for our theme song. Paul, Paul Wilde. Only those deeply in love can understand what I mean when I say it was adoration on sight. I knew that from that second until eternity, there would be none other for me than Paul. And true to his word, he was at the Wakers the next afternoon, asking Father's consent for an evening with me. I didn't hear their conversation, but I did hear from Papa later. My dear, I'm an old man, wise in the ways of the world. I've spent my entire life protecting you from the vulgar of this world. Worthless. Had I protected your mother more carefully, there never would have been the scandal in this house caused by her treacherous act. Because I have already called into the city. This Paul Wilde is nothing but a simple clerk with poor wages. Is there never to be anyone for me? Of course, when the time comes. But this is not the time. 
had never disobeyed my father. But I did so that night. I sent Paul a note, and we met at midnight in the gardens of the lake. My Marley. Say it again, Paul. It sounds so wonderful. I've never had anyone but Papa speak my name with love. My Marlene, I have a lifetime of love to give you. A heart bursting with love for you. Do you love me, my darling? Oh, yes, Pa. Say it. I love you. Oh, I love you. And now say this. I love you enough to leave Blue Acres and marry you, Pa. I love you enough to leave. Oh, Pa, I can't. I can't do that to Papa. Must you give up your life to him? No, but to leave him as Mother did. Then will you let me go out of your life? No. No. There were other surreptitious meetings. There were arguments, persuasions, protestations. But in the end, love won out. Paul and I ran away and were married. I will never forget the following day when Paul and I returned to Faith's father. What is done cannot be undone. Papa, you forgive me. Yes, I forgive you. Oh, Papa. Paul, isn't he wonderful? You are the love of my life. And if Paul realizes this, he will not keep you absent from me for any long periods of time. Of course not, Papa. Blue Acres will continue to be our home. But I hadn't reckoned with Paul when I made the statement. He would not quit work and live at Blue Acres off Papa's bounty, as he called it. So for the time being, we'd been spending weekends at Blue Acres. At this moment, I felt a little resentful that Paul had taken me away from Papa. We arrived at Blue Acres and Mrs. Eaton opened the door to us, just as John was breaking over Blue Acres. Oh, at last you've arrived. Come in. Papa, your father's a very sick man. What is it, Mrs. Eaton? I think, Miss Marlene, you should let Dr. Laurie explain. Oh, here. Yeah. I'll take the luggage upstairs. I'll go to the father. You'll find him in his study. Doctor had a bed set up in there where it's easier for me to care for him. Besides, he seems more content there. Hasn't Dr. Laurie gotten a nurse for Papa? We tried it, but he wouldn't have one. We'd better knock on the door. Doctor's in there with him now. Come in. Papa, I ran across the room to my father's bed. I looked down at him, and then in dismay at Dr. Laurie. For my father's face was a horrible sight, twisted and pulled out of shape. And his eyes, his burning eyes, they were staring at me wildly. I reached out for his hand, cried out to him, Papa! I... I... What is it, Dr. Laurie? Stroke. I... Oh, Papa, don't worry. Dr. Loy will get you well again. Can you hear my voice? I'm not quite sure this morning, but I think so. He does know who you are. Uh, come outside with me, Marlene. I want to talk to you. I'm going in the drawing room, Papa, to talk to Dr. Loy. I'll be right back, and then I won't leave. I won't leave until you're well again. Come in the drawing room, Doctor. I should never have left him. Fiddlesticks. You did the right thing. But my marriage has brought this on. He loved me so, and I love him. He's been lost with me, gone. Marlene, I, um... Dr. Laurie, his eyes... Yes, my dear. I was just about to talk to you of this. What is it? I wish I knew. Your father is suffering from some terrible fear that I'm inclined to think has nothing to do with his fear of dying. Has he said anything about it? He can't speak. Only the guttural sound you heard. He can't write. He can't lift his hands. Oh, how dreadful. What that fear is, I don't know. I've watched with him nights, and it appears that whatever causes his wild fear is worse then. Poor Papa. As soon as office hours are over this evening, I'll drive out here to Blue Acres. Perhaps between the two of us, we'll be able to discover what causes his distress and be able to help him. <laughs> It 
filled my heart with sorrow to see my father suffering such pain and discomfort. And the look in his eyes, the mad, wild look, was almost more than I could bear. At last, night came. I rejoiced when I heard Mrs. Eaton usher Dr. Laurie in. He and I sat by father's bed while the heavy minutes ticked past. There seemed to be no change in his condition. But as night wore on and it was fast reaching midnight, there was a change in his eyes. The fear in them was so marked that I trembled from it. Dr. Lorry said... Do you see? His eyes. Yes. It's as if he sees something we don't see. Yes. It was so. His eyes seemed to be riveted on the door to his study. And it was then that I thought I heard a low moan. What was that? I don't know. It didn't come from Father. No. But look at him now. Now Father's eyes were trained in closer to his bed. <laughs> he was struggling, attempting to lift his hand. <laughs> it was very plain to me, and I cried out. <laughs> Doctor... There's some unseen thing standing over Papa's bed. That is the way I diagnose it. There is. Something unseen to us, but clearly seen by your father. And look, the bedclothes are moving, but he's not touching them. What is it? Dr. Lorry, what is it? Please, dear, try to control your nerves. Shall I have Mrs. Eaton make you some tea? It'll help soothe you. I'll be right back, darling. Only take a second. Paul went into the kitchen. I sat trying to get a hold of myself. It was only a few minutes after he'd left the room. Once again, I was aware of the same sound I had heard in Father's room. The sound that had made his eyes turn mad with the terror of it. Was I, too, losing my mind? What was the answer to this strange phenomenon? A sound that to my ears was exactly like that of a woman moaning. At first it was close to me in the music room. And then it grew fainter, but still distinct. And though it's difficult to believe, there was a second when I felt as if something had brushed past my chair, had touched my shoulder. I cried out for Paul. Paul! Paul! What is it? I'm right here. Paul, listen. Do you hear a strange sound? What sort of a sound? A sound like a woman moaning. No. I heard it distinctly. You listen. Hey, you drink this tea and forget about such things. Please, Paul, quiet. Now, do you hear? By George. You do hear it. Some unusual sound. 
Where is it coming from? I don't know. There it is again. Yeah. So it seems to be coming from these walls of the music room. That's it. Or from out on the terrace. Oh, it's nearer than that. Here. In this wall behind the piano. Here. Yeah. Uh, Why are you feeling the walls? This panel here. Look. It's... Why, it's the panel that opens. I've lived here all my life and I never knew of it before. An inner room in here. And you can hear the moaning from here much closer. Marlene, get the candle from the piano. I'm going to look around in here. Yes. Here, Paul. Yeah, this passage in here must lead to another room in the house. I'm coming with you. And the moaning we heard was from someone in the adjoining room from here. Paul, wait. Here, look. What is it? This enormous chest. Listen. Quick, there's someone inside this chest. I believe you're right. Hurry, they'll smother to death. Yeah, it's locked. Locked? Someone's been pushed into this chest and it's been locked against them. Hurry, can't you break it open? I'm going to try. That'll lock his giving now. Not one skeleton, Paul. Two. Two. I'm going to take this chest into Terence Lane's room. When I question him and show him what we've found in his secret hiding place, no doubt we'll have the answer to our tragedy and our riddle. When confronted with the chest and the skeletons of human beings found in it, when asked questions by Dr. Lorry that Papa could answer by a nod of his head, we found the solution to the mystery of Blue Acre. Yes, the skeletons were those of Philip Court. And my mother. My father had killed them before they ever got away from the house. The night mother intended to leave him. Dr. Lorry filled in many blank spaces in the life of my mother and father. Your father was an insanely jealous man, Marlene. He would allow her no friends. He even went to the city alone and bought her gowns for her. He would allow no one to look upon her. He hated me because I attended her at your birth. Oh. I was surprised when he allowed you to get away from him and marry Paul. But I've figured that out now. What do you mean, Doctor? I found a large quantity of arsenic in his desk. Great heaven. I'm sure it was his intention to do away with you, Paul. Then, once again, he could have Marlene to himself. Take me away, Paul. Paul and I left Blue Acres next morning. Terence Lane, my father, is still living. Mrs. Eaton cares for him. I haven't been out since that horrible night when the moaning of my mother's spirit led me to her grave. But we will go out this weekend if he's still living. Paul says I can never be happy unless I forgive him. Besides, the eyes of my father show madness in the evening after darkness gathers. So we know he is tortured enough. Each night he must see the spirit of my mother standing over his bed, accusing him of his crime of double murder.
pleasant dreams. <laughs> mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? Your hand is shaking. Surely you're not afraid of me. Uh, perhaps it would steady you to hear a little story that was just told to me. The story of a strange ship that sails the seven seas with no crew save death and no passengers except the dead. I call the story The Ghost Ship. My story, The Ghost Ship, begins in a badly battered lifeboat, pitching and tossing on the surface of the South Atlantic. Three men wearily bail out the water which the breaking waves constantly pour into the boat. A fourth man, burly and broad-shouldered, is at the tiller. All right, bailer men, bailer. The water's gaining on us. What's the use of bailing? We'll never make land. Why don't we admit we're done for and get it over with? Stow that, bosun. We may sight a ship any minute. You've been saying that every day for a week, man. Captain, Captain! Yeah, what is it, Cook? Hey, Tank, it's a ship. You snow it's here. They're to port. All right, look sharp, man. Oh, I don't see anything. Just another false alarm. No, no, it's not. Captain Arce, you're... Uh, it's a small steamer heading this way. Yeah. Yeah, I can make her out now. She's heading straight for us. It's a ship, all right. But she looks mighty funny. Look how low she is in the water. See the way she steers. She does kind of stagger back and forth. Maybe her steering gear broke. And there's no smoke from her funnels either. If you ask me, she's a derelict. Well, maybe she is. Even a derelict is better than this lifeboat. The wind's carrying her across our courts. And we're going to board her. Half an hour later, the lifeboat rubbed against the side of the strange ship. The four hungry, weary men clambered aboard her and found themselves greeted only by the uncanny silence of a deserted ship. See? What did I tell you? This is a derelict, a blooming derelict. Yeah, she's a derelict, all right. Look at her ironwork, covered with rust. I'd say she's been drifting about for a good many months. Suppose there'd be no grub or water aboard her. That's what worries me. Now, that's what we're going to find out right now. Cook and I'll search the starboard side of the ship. You other two search the port side. Look lively now. We'll meet in the chart room in 30 minutes. All right, Bosun, what did you find? Uh, we didn't find nothing. Not a single solitary thing. That's all right, Captain. Of course, we're so low in the water that all the holes in the cabins below deck are half flooded. But we searched everything else, and we didn't find a thing. Well, Cook and I had better luck. We found the galley dry and plenty of canned grub in it. I left Cook rustling up some chow. He'll be bringing us a hot meal any minute now. Hot food, doggone. That's what I was wanting to hear. What I want to know is why was this freighter abandoned? That's it. Huh? What? This is the mermaid girl. What? Yes. There's a name on the logbook. See the ghost ship. Do you hear me? We come aboard a ghost ship. We've got to get off her or we'll die. Bosun, get hold of yourself, well, will you? it's true. This is the mermaid girl, and every seaman in the world knows about it. Well, sir, I don't. Captain, what is this here mermaid girl business about? Well, the story of the mermaid girl is a curious one. Two years ago, she had her hell stove in in a hurricane, but she's loaded with lumber and cork, which is why she never sunk. Well, the first night out after the storm, one of the crew disappeared. The next night, two more men went, and two more the night after. I'm telling this, folks. It's true, every word of it. It's true, the men disappeared. The rest of the crew mutinied and abandoned ship. Only one lifeboat with five men in it ever made port. They're the ones who spread the story. And ever since then, the mermaid girl's been drifting. 
A ghost ship with death at the helm. I tell you, we've got to get off it, or we'll die too. Captain! Captain! That's a cook. <laughs> Quick, outside, something's happened to him. <laughs> Captain, look, uh, there on the deck, a tray, dishes and food. Cook was bringing us grub, and now he's... He's vanished. <laughs> Say, Doctor, do you know you've been on the air for 25 weeks now? Evidently, uh, people like your radio show. That makes me very happy. And I thank them uh, from the bottom of my cold-blooded heart. Coming from you, Doctor, that's really warm sentiment. And while we're about it, the makers of Adam Hats would like to thank the many men who have recognized the superiority of Adam Hats this season. Gentlemen, you've been keeping our thousands of stores and authorized dealers mighty busy. And no wonder. Wide varieties in 100% correct styles, combined with finest quality materials and craftsmanship, make Adam Hats America's outstanding hat value. The well-dressed man particularly appreciates the wide choice of shapes and shades available at their Adam Hat store. Tomorrow, step into the Adam Hat store nearest you and ask to see the new line of Adam Hats, priced sensibly from three forty-five to ten dollars. Now, Doctor Weird, on with the show. <laughs> And now to continue my story, The Ghost Ship. It is night, and in the inky darkness, half submerged, the derelict steamship Mermaid Girl drifts onward across the wave-tossed surface of the South Atlantic. Huddled in the chart room, with two flickering lanterns for light, the three shipwrecked survivors discuss the strange disappearance of the cook, the fourth member of their group. I tell you, the spook got him! Oh, the devil or whatever it is that's put a curse on this ship. That takes more than a spook to make a grown man vanish without a trace, most of huh. the sea's different from the land. There's devils that haunt the ocean no land lover can know about. You've heard of the flying Dutchman, haven't you, Tex? Uh-huh. I reckon I have. What about her? For a hundred years or more, manned by phantoms, she's been sailing the seven seas, full rigged and always running with the storm dead astern. The devils of the sea put a curse on her. And so the Flying Dutchman will sail on forever. The Flying Dutchman is just a sailor superstition, Bosun. You know it. And I suppose this ship we're on now is just a superstition, too. And the fact that she's been drifting for two years with no end at her realm. I tell you, we've got to get off her or else we'll die. We can't get off her. Our lifeboat swamped when we came aboard. So stow that kind of talk, Bosun. That's what I say, too. I don't believe in spooks or devils. Fact is, I got me a notion to go down to the galley right now and rustle up some grub. You want the same thing that happened to the cook to happen to you? Oh, nothing happened to me. Captain, you got an extra revolver in your pocket? Yeah. Well, now, just you let me take it and I'll face Santa thing to get me some grub. Well, it's three days since we had food, and I'm too hungry to wait for morning. All right, here's the extra gun. It has three shells in it. And take this lantern, but look sharp. I'll do that, Captain. And I'll bring back whatever I can carry. Good. And if I meet any spooks, I'll bring them back, too. You shouldn't have let him go, Captain. He'll be all right with a light and a gun. We don't need food. You'll see, Captain. This ship's a ghost ship. And... Listen. Come on, we gotta go to his... No, rest. Captain, it's too late. It's got him, whatever it is that's haunting this ship. And if we got out there now, it'll get us, too. <laughs> All night, the two men huddled in the chart room, the doors bolted, the memory of Texas screams ringing in their ears. In the morning, with a fog covering the sea, they cautiously emerged and searched the ship, the captain keeping his revolver always ready. And they found... Nothing. That's what we found, Captain. Nothing but a smashed lantern on the empty gun line on the deck where Texas dropped them. Well, frankly, I think Tex and the cook went out of their heads and jumped overboard. There's absolutely nothing on this ship that could have harmed them. But there is. Only it's something you can't see unless it wants you to see it. Ah, oh, that's ridiculous. Bosun, listen to me. I tell you... Captain, that... wait. What is it? Listen. What is it, job? It's a foghorn. There's a steamship someplace in the fog off the starboard of us. Get in this way. But you'll never see us. Look how fast the fog's thickening. Yeah, yeah, we got to work fast. There's a hand-operated foghorn up in the bow of this vessel. Get up forward and start sounding it. I'll hunt for distress rockets. 
We've got to attract attention before that ship gets too far away. Aye, aye, sir. I'll signal the SOS with the arm, sir. Good man. Oh, she's passing the stern of us. Blast this fog. If it hadn't thickened up so fast, we'd have been sighted. Captain! Captain! Yeah, what is it, Boston? Captain, he shot me! He's dragging me to all the old captain! Help! Help! I'm coming, Boston! 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 Boston, where are you? Captain! Captain! Down here! In the hole! Help me! In the hole? Boston! What's happened? Haunting this ship. I can see it, Boston. Just under the water. I'm going to try and shoot it. All right, that'll take that. And that. And that. It's a. Ah, my gun's empty. I've got a. A tentacle. A giant tentacle around my legs. I can't get loose. It's. Pull me down into the hole, too. If I can only... I can't. Uh, uh, help. Help. No wonder the shipwrecked sailors who boarded the mermaid girl could find nothing. The devil who haunted her was an underwater devil whose presence they couldn't guess. And so the mermaid girl still drifts on across the seven seas with death in the shape of a giant octopus, her captain, and dead men, her only crew. Oh, perhaps someday... Oh, you have to go now. But I do hope you'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery, the house of Dr. Weir. Mm-hmm.